Introduction to The Green Mirror. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Simon Evers. The Green Mirror by Hugh Walpole. Introduction. To Dorothy, who first introduced me to Catherine. There's the feather bed element here, brother. Ugh, and not only that. There's an attraction here. Here you have the end of the world, an anchorage, a quiet haven, the navel of the earth, the three fishes that are the foundation of the world, the essence of pancakes, of savoury fish pies, of the evening samovar, of soft sighs and warm shawls and hot stoves to sleep on, as snug as though you were dead, and yet you're alive, the advantages of both at once. Dostoevsky. My dear Dorothy, as I think you know, this book was finished in the month of August 1914. I did not look at it again until I revised it during my convalescence after an illness in the autumn of 1915. We are now in a world very different from that with which this story deals, and it must, I am afraid, appear slow in development and uneventful in movement, belonging, in style and method and subject, to a day that seems to us already old-fashioned. But I will frankly confess that I have too warm a personal affection for Catherine, Philip, Henry, and Millicent, to be able to destroy utterly the signs and traditions of their existence. Nor can I feel my book to be quite old-fashioned, when the love of England, which I have tried to make the text of it, has in many of us survived so triumphantly changes and catastrophes and victories that have shaken into ruin almost every other faith we held. Let this be my excuse for giving you, with my constant affection, this uneventful story. Yours always, Hugh Walpole, Petrograd, May the 11th, 1917. End of the introduction. Book One, Chapter One of The Green Mirror by Hugh Walpole. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Book One, The Raid. Chapter One, The Ceremony. One. The fog had swallowed up the house, and the house had submitted. So thick was this fog that the towers of Westminster Abbey, the river, and the fat complacency of the church in the middle of the square, even the three plane trees in front of the old gate and the heavy old-fashioned porch, had all vanished together, leaving in their place the rattle of a cab, the barking of a dog, isolated sounds that ascended plaintively from a lost a submerged world. The house had indeed in its time seen many fogs, for it had known its first one in the days of Queen Anne, and even then it had yielded, without surprise and without curiosity, to its tyranny. On the brightest of days this was a solemn, unenterprising, unimaginative building, standing four square to all the winds, its windows planted stolidly, securely, its vigorous propriety well suited to its safe, unagitated surroundings. Its faded red brick had weathered many London storms, and would weather many more. That old, quiet square with its uneven stones, its church and its plane trees, had the abbey, the houses of Parliament, the river, for its guardians. The skies might fall, the Thames burst into a flaming fire. Rundle Square would not stir from its tranquillity. The old house, number five, Rundle Square, had for its most charming feature its entrance. First came an old iron gate, guarded on either side by weather-beaten stone pillars. Then a cobbled path, with little green lawns to right and left of it, ran to the door, whose stolidity was crowned with an old porch of dim red brick. This was unusual enough for London, but there the gate, the little garden, the porch, had stood for some hundreds of years, and that progress that had already its throttling fingers about London's neck had as yet left Rundell Square to its staid propriety. Westminster abides, like a little cathedral town, at the heart of London. One is led to it through Whitehall, through Victoria Street, through Belgravia, over Westminster Bridge, with preparatory caution. The thunder of London sinks as the traveller approaches, dying gradually as though the spirit of the town warned you with his finger at his lip. To the roar of the traffic there succeeds the solemn striking of Big Ben, the chiming of the Abbey Bells. 
So narrow and winding are many of the little streets that such traffic as penetrates them proceeds slowly, cautiously, almost sleepily. There are old buildings and grass squares, many clergymen, schoolboys in black gowns and battered top hats, and at the corners one may see policemen, motionless, somnolent, stationed, one supposes, to threaten disturbance or agitation. There is, it seems, no impulse here to pile many more events upon the lap of the day than the poor thing can decently hold. Behind the windows of Westminster life is passing, surely with easy tranquillity. The very doorbells are many of them, old and comfortable, unsuited to any frantic ringing that does not sound, through every hour, the whirring clang of workmen flinging with eager haste into the reluctant air hideous and contemptuous buildings. Dust does not rise in blinding clouds from the tortured corpses of old and happy houses. Those who live here live long. Number 5 Rundle Square, then, had its destiny in pleasant places. Upon a fine summer evening the old red brick with its windows staring complacently upon a comfortable world showed a fine colour. Its very chimneys were square and solid, its eaves and water-pipes regular and mathematical. Whatever horrid catastrophe might convulse the rest of London, Number 5 would suffer no hurt. The god of propriety, the strongest of all the gods, had it beneath his care. Now, behind the fog, it waited, as it had waited so often before, with certain assurance, for its release. 2. Inside the house at about half-past four, upon this afternoon of November the 8th, in the year 1902, young Henry Trenchard was sitting alone. He was straining his eyes over a book that interested him so deeply that he could not leave it in order to switch on the electric light. His long nose stuck into the book's very heart, and his eyelashes almost brushed the paper. The drawing-room where he was had caught some of the fog and kept it, and Henry Trenchard's only light was the fading glow of a red cavernous fire. Henry Trenchard, now nineteen years of age, had known in all those nineteen years no change in that old drawing-room. As an ugly and tiresome baby, he had wailed before the sombre indifference of that same old stiff green wallpaper, a little brighter then, perhaps, had sprawled upon the same old green carpet, had begged to be allowed to play with the same collection of little scent-bottles and stones and rings and miniatures that lay now in the same decent symmetry in the same narrow glass-topped table over by the window. It was by shape and design a heavy room, slipping into its true spirit with the London dusk, the London fog, the London lamp-lit winter afternoon, seeming awkward, stiff, almost affronted before the sunshine and summer weather. One or two trenchards, two soldiers and a bishop, were there in heavy old gold frames. Two ponderous glass-fronted bookcases guarded from any frivolous touch high, stiff-backed volumes of Gibbons and Richardson and Hooker. There were some old watercolours of faded green lawns, dim rocks and seas with neglected boats upon the sand, all these painted in the stiff precision of the thirties and the forties, smoked and fogged a little in their thin black frames. Upon one round table, indeed, there was a concession to the modern spirit in the latest numbers of the Cornhill and Blackwood magazines, the Quarterly Review and the Hibbert Journal. The chairs in the room were for the most part stiff with gilt backs and more a don't-you-dare-to-sit-down-upon-me eye, but two armchairs near the fire of old green leather were comfortable enough, and upon one of these Henry was now sitting. Above the wide stone fireplace was a large old gold mirror, a mirror that took into its expanse the whole of the room, so that, standing before it with your back to the door, you could see everything that happened behind you. The mirror was old, and gave to the view that it embraced some old comfortable touch, so that everything within it was soft and still and at rest. Now, in the gloom and shadow, the reflection was green and dark, with the only point of colour the fading fire. Before it, a massive gold clock with the figures of the three graces, stiff and angular at its summit, ticked away as though it were the voice of a very old gentleman telling an interminable story. It served, indeed, for the voice of the mirror itself. Henry was reading a novel that showed upon its back Mudie's bright yellow label. He was reading, as the clock struck half-past four, these words. 
I sat on the stump of a tree at his feet, and below us stretched the land, the great expanse of the forests, sombre under the sunshine, rolling like a sea, with glints of winding rivers, the grey spots of villages, and here and there a clearing like an islet of light amongst the dark waves of a continuous treetops. A brooding gloom lay over this vast and monotonous landscape. The light fell on it as if into an abyss. The land devoured the sunshine. Only far off along the coast, the empty ocean, smooth and polished within the faint bays, seemed to rise up to the sky in a wall of steel. And there I was with him, high on the sunshine on the top of that historic hill. The striking of the clock brought him away from the book with a jerk. So deep had he been sunk in it that he looked now about the dusty room with a startled, uncertain gaze. The familiar place settled once more about him, and with a little sigh he sank back into the chair. His thin, bony legs stuck out in front of him. One trouser leg was hitched up, and his sock, falling down over his boot, left bare part of his calf. His boots had not been laced tightly, and the tongues had slipped inside, showing his sock. He was a long, thin youth, his hair untidy, his black tie up at the back of his collar. One white and rather ragged cuff had slipped down over his wrist. The other was invisible. His eyes were grey and weak. He had a long, pointed nose with two freckles on the very end of it. But his mouth was kindly, although too large and indeterminate. His cheeks were thin and showed high cheekbones. His chin was pronounced enough to be strong, but nevertheless helped him very little. He was untidy and ungainly, but not entirely unattractive. His growth was at the stage when nature had not made up its mind as to the next, the final, move. That may, after all, be something very pleasant. His eyes now were dreamy and soft because he was thinking of the book. No book, perhaps in all his life before, had moved him so deeply, and he was very often moved, but as a rule by cheap and sentimental emotions. He knew that he was cheap, he knew that he was sentimental. He very often hated and despised himself. He could see the forests rolling like a sea. It was as though he himself had been perched upon that high, bright hill, and he was exalted, he felt, with that same exultation. The space, the freedom, the liberty, the picture of a world wherein anything might happen, where heroes, fugitives, scoundrels, cowards, conquerors, all alike might win their salvation. Room for everyone, no one to pull one up, no one to make one ashamed of what one says and does. No crowd watching one's every movement. Adventure for the wishing and courage to make them. He looked about the room and hated it. The old shabby hemmed-in thing. He hated this life to which he was condemned. He hated himself, his world, his uninspiring future. My God, I must do something. I will do something. But suppose I can't? His head fell again. Suppose he were out in that other world, there in the heart of those dark forests. Suppose that he found that he did no better there than here. That would be indeed the most terrible thing of all. He gazed up into the mirror, saw in it the reflection of the room, the green walls, the green carpet, the old faded green place like moss covering dead ground. Soft, damp, dark, and beyond, outside the mirror, the world of the forests, the great expanse of forests, and, beyond the ocean smooth and polished, rising up to the sky in a wall of steel. His people, his family, his many, many relations, his world, he thought, were all inside the mirror, all embedded in that green, soft, silent enclosure. He saw, stretching from one end of England to the other, in all provincial towns, in neat little houses with neat little gardens, in cathedral cities with their sequestered closes, in villages with the deep green lanes leading up to the rectory gardens, in old country houses hemmed in by wide-stretching fields, in little lost places by the sea. All these persons, happily, peacefully, sunk up to their very necks in the green moss. Within the mirror, this. Outside the mirror, the rolling forests guarded by the shining wall of sea. His own family passed before him. His grandfather, his great-aunt Sarah, his mother and his father, Aunt Aggie and Aunt Betty, Uncle Tim, Millicent, 
Catherine. He paused then. The book slipped away and fell onto the floor. Catherine. Dear Catherine. He did not care what she was. And then, swept by a fresh wave of feelings, springing up, stretching his arms, facing the room, he did not care what any of them were. He was the idiot, the discontented, ungrateful idiot. He loved them all. He wouldn't change one of them. He wouldn't be in any other family in all the world. The door opened. In came old Rocket, the staff and prop of the family, to turn up the lights, to poke up a fire. In a minute, tea would come in. "'Why, Mr. Henry, no fire, nor lights?' He shuffled to the windows, pulling the great heavy curtains across them, his knees cracking very slowly. He bent down, picked up the book, and laid it carefully on the table next to the Hibbert journal. "'I hope you've not been reading, Mr. Henry, in this bad light,' he said. 3. Later, between nine and half-past, Henry was sitting with his father and his uncle, smoking and drinking after dinner. Tonight was an evening of ceremony, the family ceremony of the year. Therefore, although the meal had been an extremely festive one, with many flowers, a perfect mountain of fruit in the huge silver bowl in the centre of the table, and the most sacred of all ports, produced on this occasion and Christmas Day, nevertheless only the family had been present. No distant relations even, certainly no friends. This was Grandfather Trenchard's birthday. The ladies vanished. There remained only Henry, his father, and Uncle Tim. Henry was sitting there, very self-conscious over his glass of port. He was always self-conscious when Uncle Tim was present. Uncle Tim was a fonder, and was large-limbed and absent-minded like Henry's father. Uncle Tim had a wild head of grey hair, a badly kept grey beard, and clothed his long, loose figure in long, loose garments. He was here today and gone tomorrow, preferred the country to the town, and had a little house down in Glebeshire, where he led an untidy bachelor existence, whose motive impulses were birds and flowers. Henry was very fond of Uncle Tim. He liked his untidiness, his careless geniality, his freedom, and his happiness. Henry's father, George Trenchard, was splendid. That, thought Henry, was the only possible word. And the boy, surveying other persons' fathers, wondered why Catherine, Millicent, and himself should have been chosen of out all the world to be so favoured. George Trenchard, at this time about sixty years of age, was over six feet in height and broad in proportion. He was growing too stout. His hair was grey and the top of his head bald. His eyes were brown and absent-minded, his mouth large with a lurking humour in its curves. His cheeks were fat and round, and there was the beginning of a double chin. He walked always in a rambling, rolling kind of way, like a sea captain on shore, still balancing himself to the swing of his vessel, his hands deep sunk in his trouser pockets. Henry had been privileged sometimes to see him when, absorbed in the evolution of an essay or the chapter of some book, he is, of course, one of our foremost authorities on the early nineteenth-century period of English literature, especially Hazlitt and De Quincey. He rolled up and down his study, with his head back, his hand sunk in his pockets, whistling a little tune. Very wonderful, he seemed, to Henry then. He was the most completely careless of optimists, refused to be brought down to any stern fact whatever, hated any strong emotion or stringent relations with anyone treated his wife and children as the most delightful accidents against whom he had most happily tumbled. His kindness of heart was equalled only by the lightning speed with which he forgot the benefits that he had conferred and the persons upon whom he had conferred them. Like a happy bird, he went carolling through life. Alone of all living beings, his daughter Catherine had bound him to her with cords. For the rest, he loved and forgot them all. Now, on this family occasion of his father's birthday, his father was eighty-seven today, he was absolutely happy. He was proud of his family when any definite occasion such as this compelled him to think of it. He considered that it had all been a very jolly, pleasant dinner, that there would certainly follow a very jolly, pleasant evening. He liked especially to have his brother, Timothy, with him. He loved them all, bless their hearts. 
he felt, as he assured them, not a day more than twenty. "'How do you really think father is, George?' asked Timothy. "'Sound as a bell,' said Henry's father. I'm "'Getting deaf, of course. Must expect that. But it's my belief that the harder his hearing, the brighter his eyes. Never knew anyone so sharp. Nothing escapes him, upon my soul.' Well, said George Trenchard, I think it's a most satisfactory thing that here we should all be again, healthy, happy, sound as so many bells, lively as cricket, not a happier family in England. Don't say that, George, said Uncle Tim, most unlucky. Nonsense, said George Trenchard, brushing Uncle Tim aside like a fly. Nonsense, we're a happy family, a healthy family, and a united family. I drink my gratitude to the god of family life whoever he is. He finished his glass of port. Here, Timothy, have another glass. It's a port in a million, so it is. But Uncle Tim shook his head. It's all very well, George, but you'll have to break up soon. The girls will be marrying, Catherine and Millicent. Rot, said George. Millie's still at school. She's coming home very soon, very shortly, I believe. And besides, you can't keep a family together as you used to. You can't. No one cares about the home at all nowadays. These youngsters will find that out soon enough. You'll be deserting the nest immediately, Henry, my friend, won't you? This sudden appeal, of course, confused Henry terribly. He choked over his wine, coloured crimson, stammered out, No, Uncle Tim, of course, of, of course not. George Trenchard looked at his son with approval. That's right. Stick to your old father while you can. The matter with you, Tim, is that you live outside the world and don't know what's going on. The matter with you, George, is, his brother, speaking slowly and carefully, replied, that you haven't the ghost of an idea of what the modern world's like. Not the ghost. Up in the clouds you are, and so's your whole family, my sister and all. But the young ones won't be up in the clouds always, not a bit of it. They'll come down one day, and then you'll see what you will see. "'And what'll that be?' said George Trenchard, laughing a little scornfully. "'Why, you and Harriet doing Darby and Joan over the dying fire, "'and no one else within a hundred miles of you, "'except a servant who's waiting for your clothes and sleeve-links.' <laughs> "'Henry, listen to that,' said his father, still laughing. "'See what an ungrateful fellow you're going to be in a year or two. "'Henry blushed, swallowed in his throat, smiled idiotically. They were all, he thought, laughing at him, but the effect was very pleasant and genial. Moreover, he was interested. He was, of course, one of the young ones, and it was his future that was under discussion. His mind hovered over the book that he'd been reading that afternoon. Uncle Tim's words had very much the same effect upon Henry's mind that that book's words had had, although from a different angle, so to speak. Henry's eyes lingered about a little silver dish that contained sugared cherries. He liked immensely sugared cherries. Encouraged by the genial atmosphere, he stretched out his hand, took two cherries, and swallowed them, but in his agitation so swiftly that he did not taste them at all. Then he drank two glasses of port. He had never before drunk so much wine. He was conscious now that he must not, under any circumstances, drink any more. He was aware that he must control very closely his tongue. He told himself that the room was not in reality so golden and glowing a place as it now seemed to him, that it was only the same old dining-room with which he had had all his life been familiar. He convinced himself, by a steady gaze, that the great silver dish, with the red and purple and golden fruit part upon it, was only a silver dish, was not a deep bowl whose sides, like silver walls, stretched up right into the dim electric clusters of electric light hanging from the ceiling. He might convince himself of these facts. He might, with a great effort, steady the room that very, very slightly swayed about him. What he could not deny was that life was gorgeous, that this was an evening of all the evenings, that he adored his father, his uncle, and all the family to such a height and depth of devotion that, were he not exceedingly careful, he would burst into tears burst into tears he must not, because then would the stud in his shirt most assuredly abandon its restraints and shame him for ever before Uncle Tim. At this moment his father gave the command to move. Henry rose 
very carefully from his seat, steadied himself at the table for an instant, then very, very gravely, with his eye upon his shirt stud, followed his uncle from the room. 4. He retained, throughout the rest of the eventful evening, the slightly exaggerated vision of the world. It was not that, as he followed his father and uncle into the drawing-room, he did not know what he would see. He would find them sitting there, grandfather in his chair, his feet on a stool, his bony hands pressed upon his thin knees with that fierce protesting pressure that represented so much in his grandfather. There would be also his great-aunt Sarah, with her high pyramid of white hair, her long black ear-trumpet, and her hard, sharp little eyes like faded blue pebbles. There would be his mother, square and broad and placid, with her hands folded on her lap. There would be Aunt Aggie, with her pouting, fat little face, her cheeks quivering a little as she moved her head, her eyes searching about the room, nervously, uneasily, and there would be Aunt Betty, neat and tiny, with a little trembling smile, and her quiet air of having something very important to do, of which no one else in the family had the ghost of an idea. Oh, he knew them all so well, that they appeared to him now to be part of himself, and to exist only as his ideas of the world and life and his own destiny. They could not now do anything that would ever surprise or disconcert him. He knew their ideas, their schemes, their partialities, their disgusts, and he would not, so he thought now with the fire of light burning so brightly within him, have them changed. No, not in any tiniest atom of an alteration. He knew that they would sit there, all of them, and talk quietly about nothing, and then, when the gold clock was approaching half-past nine, they would slip away, save only his grandfather and Aunt Sarah, and would slip up to their rooms, and then they would slip down again with their parcels in their hands, and at half-past nine the ceremony would take place. So it had been for years and years, and so it would continue to be until Grandfather's death, and after that Henry's father would take his place, and then one day, perhaps, it would be the turn of Henry himself. He paused for a moment and looked at the room. Catherine was not there. She was always, until the very last moment, doing something to Grandfather's present, tying it up in some especial ribbon, writing something on the paper wrapping, making it in some way more perfect. He knew that, as he came in, his mother would look up and smile and say, "'Well, Henry,' and then would resume her placidity, that Uncle Tom would sit down beside Aunt Betty and begin very gently to chafe her, which would please her immensely, and that Aunt Sarah would cry, "'What did you say, Timothy?' and that then he would shout down her ear-trumpet with a good-humoured smile peeping down from his beard, as though he were thinking, one must humour the old lady, you know. All these things occurred. Henry himself sat in a low chair by the fire and looked at his father, who was walking up and down the other end of the room, his hand deep in his pockets, his head back. Then he looked at his two aunts and wondered, as he had wondered so many times before, that they were not the sisters of his mother instead of his father. They were so small and fragile to be the sisters of such large-limbed, rough-and-tumble men as his father and Uncle Timothy. They would have so naturally taken their position in the world as the sisters of his mother. Aunt Aggie, who thought that no one was paying her very much attention, said, "'I can't think why Catherine wouldn't let me get that silk for her at Liberty's this afternoon. I could have gone up Regent Street so easily. It wouldn't have been very much trouble. Not very much.' But Catherine always must do everything for herself. Mrs. Trenchard said, It was very kind of you, Aggie dear, to think of it. I'm sure it was very kind. And Aunt Betty said, Catherine would appreciate your thinking of her. I wonder with the fog that any of you went out at all, said Uncle Tim. I'm sure I was as nearly killed as nothing, just coming back from the Strand. Aunt Aggie moved her hands on her lap looked at them suspiciously to see whether they meant what they said, and then sighed. And to Henry this all seemed to-night wonderful, magical, possessed of some thrilling, passionate quality. His heart was beating with furious, leaping bounds, his eyes were misty with sentimental happiness. He thought that this was life that he was realising now for the first time. It was not. It was two glasses of port. 
He looked at his grandfather and thought of the wonderful old man that he was. His grandfather was very small and very thin, and so delicate was the colour of his white hair, his face and his hands, that the light seemed to shine through him, as though he had been made of glass. He was a silent old man, and everything about him was of a fine, precious quality. His black shoes with the silver buckles, the gold signet ring on his finger, the black cord with the gold eyeglasses that lay across his shirt-front. When he spoke, it was with a thin, silvery voice like a bell. He did not seem, as he sat there, to be thinking about any of them, or to be caring for anything that they might do. His thoughts, perhaps, were shining and silver and precious, like the rest of him, but no one knew, because he said so little. Aunt Betty, with a glance at the clock, rose and slipped from the room. The moment had arrived. 5. Very soon, and indeed just as the clock, as though it was summoning them all back, struck the half-hour, there they all were again. They stood in a group by the door, and each one had, in his or her hand, his or her present. Grandfather, as silent as an ivory figure, sat in his chair, with Aunt Sarah in her chair beside him, and in front of him was a table, cleared of anything that was set upon it, its mahogany shining in the firelight. All the Trenchard soldiers and the Trenchard bishop looked down with solemn approval upon the scene. "'Come on, Henry, my boy, time to begin,' said his father. Henry, because he was the youngest, stepped forward, his present in his hand. His parcel was very ill-tied, and the paper was creased and badly folded. He was greatly ashamed as he laid it upon the table. Blushing, he made his little speech, his lips together, speaking like an awkward schoolboy. "'We're all very glad, Grandfather, that we're all, most of us, here to, to congratulate you on your birthday. We hope that you'll enjoy your birthday, and that, that there'll be lots more for you to enjoy.' "'Bravo, Henry,' came from the back of the room. Henry stepped back, still blushing. Then Grandfather Trenchard, with trembling hands, slowly undid the parcel, and revealed a purple leather blotting-book with silver edges. "'Thank you, my boy. Very good of you. Thank you.' Then came Catherine. Catherine was neither very tall nor very short, neither fat nor thin. She had some of the grave placidity of her mother, and in her eyes and mouth some of the humour of her father. She moved quietly and easily, very self-possessed. She bore herself as though she had many more important things to think about than anything that concerned herself. Her hair and her eyes were dark brown, and now as she went with her present, her smile was as quiet and unselfconscious as everything else about her. "'Dear Grandfather,' she said, "'I wish you many, many happy returns.' And then she stepped back. Her present was an old gold snuff-box. "'Thank you, my dear,' he said. "'Very charming. Thank you, my dear.' Then came Aunt Aggie, her eyes nervous and a little resentful, as though she had been treated rather hardly, but was making the best of difficult circumstances. "'I'm afraid you won't like this, father,' she said. "'I felt that you wouldn't when I got it. "'But I did my best. "'It's a silly thing to give you, I'm afraid.' She watched, as the old man, very slowly, undid the parcel. She had given him a china inkstand. It has been as though she had said, "'Anything more foolish to give an old man who ought to be thinking about the grave "'than a china inkstand, I can't imagine.' Perhaps her father had felt something of this in her voice. He answered her a little sharply. "'Thank ye, my dear Addy. Thank ye.' Very different Aunt Betty. She came forward like a cheerful and happy sparrow, her head just on one side, as though she wished to perceive the complete effect of everything that was going on. "'My present is handkerchiefs, father. I worked the initials myself. I hope you will like them.' And then she bent forward and took his hand in hers and held it for a moment. As he looked across at her, a little wave of colour crept up behind the white mask of his cheek. "'Dear Betty, my dear, thank ye, thank ye.' Then followed Mrs. Trenchard, moving like some fragment of the old house that contained her, a fragment anxious to testify its allegiance to the head of the family, but anxious, as one must always remember with Mrs. Trenchard, with no very agitated anxiety. Her slow smile, her solid square figure, that should have been fat, but was only broad, her calm, soft eyes, 
cow's eyes. From these characteristics, many years of childbearing and the company of a dreamy husband had not torn her. Would something ever tear her? Yes, there was something. In her slow, soft voice she said, Father, dear, many happy returns of the day. Many happy returns. This is a silk muffler. I hope you'll like it, father, dear. It's a muffler. They surveyed one another calmly across the shining table. Mrs. Trenchard was a fonder, but the fonders were kin by breeding and tradition to the Trenchards. The same green pastures, the same rich, packed counties, the same mild skies and flowering springs had seen the development of their convictions about the world and their place in it. The Fonders, the Trenchards. It is as though you said Tweedledum and Tweedledee. Mrs. Trenchard looked at her father-in-law and smiled, then moved away. Then came the men. Uncle Tim had a case of silver brushes to present, and he mumbled something in his beard about them. George Trenchard had some old glass. He flung back his head and laughed, gripped his father by the hand, shouted something down Aunt Sarah's trumpet. Aunt Sarah herself had given, at an earlier hour, her offering because she was so deaf and her brother's voice so feeble that on earlier occasions her presentation, protracted and embarrassing, had affected the whole evening. She sat there now like an ancient Bodicea, looking down grimly upon the presents, as though they were so many spoils won by a raid. It was time for the old man to make a speech. It was, "'Thank ye, thank ye, very good of you all, very. It's pleasant, all of us together, very pleasant. I never felt better in my life, and I hope you're all the same. Thank ye, my dears, thank ye.' The ceremony was thus concluded. Instantly they were all standing about, laughing, talking. Soon they would all be in the hall, and then they would separate. George and Timothy and Bob to talk, perhaps, until early hours in the morning. Here is old Rocket to wheel Grandfather's chair along to his bedroom. "'Well, Father, here's Rocket come for you.' "'All right, my dear, I'm ready.' But Rocket had not come for his master. Rocket, perplexity, dismay upon his countenance, was plainly at a loss. And for Rocket to be at a loss. "'Hello, Rocket, what is it?' "'There's a gentleman, sir. Apologies profoundly for the lateness of the hour. Wouldn't disturb you, but the fog, his card.' Six. Until he passes away to join the glorious company of Trenchard to await him, will young Henry Trenchard remember everything that then occurred? Exactly he will remember it, and to its tiniest detail. It was past ten o'clock, and never in the memory of any one present had the ceremony before been invaded. Astonishing impertinence on the part of someone. Astonishing bravery also, did he only realise it. "'It's the fog, you know,' said Henry's mother. "'What's the matter?' screamed Aunt Sarah. "'Somebody lost in the fog.' "'Somebody what?' "'Lost in the fog.' "'In the what?' "'In the fog.' "'Oh, how did you say?' "'Fog.' George Trenchard then returned, bringing with him a man. The man stood in the doorway, confused, as indeed it was any right for him to be, blushing, holding his bowler hat nervously in his hand, smiling that smile with which one seeks to propitiate strangers. "'I say, of all things,' cried George Trenchard, "'what do you think, all of you? Of all the coincidences, this is Mr. Mark. You know, mother dear,' this to Mrs. Trenchard, who was waiting calmly for orders, "'Son of Rodney Mark, I've so often told you of. "'Here's his son arrived in London yesterday after years abroad. "'Out to-night, lost his way in the fog, stopped at first here to inquire. "'Find it of all remarkable things ours, where he was coming to call to-morrow. "'Did you ever?' "'I really must apologise," began Mr. Mark, smiling at everyone. "'Oh, no, you mustn't,' broke in George Trenchard. "'Must he, mother? He's got to stop the night. Of course he has. "'We've got as much room as you like.' Yeah, let me introduce you. Mr. Mark was led around. He was most certainly, as Aunt Betty remarked afterwards upstairs, very quiet and pleasant and easy about it all. He apologised again to Mrs. Trenchard, hadn't meant to stop more than a moment. So struck by the coincidence, his father had always said first thing he must do in London. 
Rocket was summoned. Mr. Mark will stop here tonight. Certainly, of course, anything in the world. Grandfather was wheeled away. The ladies in the hall hoped that they would see Mr. Mark in the morning, and Mr. Mark hoped that he would see them. Good night. Good night. Come along now, cried George Trenchard, taking his guest's arm. "'Come along and have a smoke and a drink, and tell us what you've been doing all these years. "'Why, the last time I saw you—' "'Mrs. Trenchard, unmoved by this ripple upon the Trenchard waters, "'stopped for a moment before leaving the drawing-room, and called Henry. "'Henry, dear, is this your book?' "'She held up the volume with the yellow Mudie's label. "'Yes, mother. "'I hope it's a nice book for you, dear.' "'A very nice book, mother.' "'Well, I'm sure you're old enough to know for yourself now.' "'Good night, mother. "'Good night, dear.' Henry, with the book under his arm, went up to bed. End of Book One, Chapter One Book One, Chapter Two of The Green Mirror by Hugh Walpole This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers Book One, Chapter Two The Winter Afternoon Extracts from a letter written by Philip Mark to Mr. Paul Alexis in Moscow Because, beyond question, it was the oddest chance that I should come straight out of the fog into the very house that I wanted. That, mind you, was a week ago, and I'm still here. You've never seen a London fog. I defy you to imagine either the choking, stifling nastiness of it or the comfortable, happy indifference of English people under it. I couldn't have struck, if I tried for a year, anything more eloquent of the whole position. My position, I mean, and theirs, and the probable result of our being up against one another. This will be a long letter, because here I am, quite unaccountably excited, unaccountably, I say, because it's all as quiet as the grave. After midnight, an old clock ticking out there on the stairs. Lancia's dignity and impudence on the wall over my bed, and that old faded wallpaper that you only see in the bedrooms of the upper middles in England, who have lived for centuries and centuries in the same old house. Much too excited to sleep. Simply, I suppose, because all kinds of things are beginning to reassert themselves on me. Things that haven't stirred since I was eighteen. Things that Anna and Moscow had so effectually laid to rest. All those years as a boy I had just this wallpaper, just this ticking clock, just these faded volumes of Ivanhoe, Kenilworth, The Scarlet Letter, and Lytton's Night and Morning, that I see huddled together in the window. Ah, Paul, you've never known what all that means, the comfort, the safety, the muffled cosiness, the gradual decline of old familiar things from shabbiness to shabbiness, the candles and pony traps and apple lofts, and going to country dances in old jolting cabs with the buttons hopping off your new white gloves as you go. It's all back on me to-night. It's been crowding in upon me all the week. The trenchards are bathed, soaked, saturated with it all. They are it. Now I'll tell you all about them, as I've seen them so far. Trenchard himself is fat, jolly, self-centred, writes about the lake poets, and lives all the morning with Lamb, Hazlitt and De Quincey, all the afternoon with the world as seen by himself, and all the evening with himself as seen by the world. He's selfish and happy, absent-minded, and as far from all reality as any man could possibly be. He likes me, I think, because I understand his sense of humour, the surest key to the heart of a selfish man. About Mrs. Trenchard I'm not nearly so sure. I've been too long out of England to understand her all in a minute. You'd say right off that she's stupider than anyone you'd ever met, and then afterwards you'd be less and less certain. Tremendously full of family— she was a fonder, muddled, with no power over words at all, so that she can never say what she means, outwardly of an extremely amiable simplicity, inwardly, I am sure, as obstinate as a limpet, not a shadow of humour. Heaven only knows what she's thinking about, really. She never lets you see. I don't think she likes me. There are only two children at home, Henry and Catherine. Henry's at the awkward age. Gauche, shy, sentimental, rude, frightfully excitable from the public school conviction that he must never show excitement about anything, full of theories, enthusiasms, judgments which he casts aside one after the other as fast as he can get rid of them, 
the very crisis of his development, might be splendid or no good at all, according as things happen to him. He's interested in me, but isn't sure of me. Then there's Catherine. Catherine is the clue to the house. No Catherine, and you know the family. But then Catherine is not easy to know. She is more friendly than any of them, and she is farther away. Very quiet, with all the calm security of someone who knows that there are many important things to be done, and that you will never be allowed, however insistent you may be, to interfere with those things. The family depends entirely upon her, and she lives for the family. Nor is she so limited as that might seem to make her. She keeps, I am sure, a great many things down, lest they should interfere. But they are all there, these things. Meanwhile, she is cheerful, friendly, busy, very, very quiet, and distant, miles. Does she like me? I don't know. She listens to all that I have to say. She has imagination and humour, and sometimes when I think that I have impressed her by what I have said, I look up and catch a glimpse of her smiling eyes, as though she thought me, in spite of all my wisdom, the most awful fool. The family do more than depend upon her. They adore her. There is no kind of doubt. They adore her. She alone in all the world awakes her father's selfish heart, stirs her mother's sluggish imagination, reassures her brother's terrified soul. They love her for the things that she does for them. They are all, save perhaps Henry, selfish in their affection. But then so are the rest of us, are we not? You, Paul, and I, at any rate. And all this time I have said nothing to you about the guardians of the house's honour. Already they view me with intense suspicion. There are two of them, both very old. An aged, aged man, bitter and sharp and shining like a glass figure, and his sister, as aged as he. They are, both of them, deaf, and the only things truly alive about them are their eyes. But with these they watch everything, and above all they watch me. They distrust me profoundly, their eyes never leave me. They allow me to make no advances to them, they cannot imagine why I have been admitted. They will, I am sure, take steps to turn me out very soon. It is as though I were a spy in a hostile country. And yet they all press me to stay, all of them. They seem to like to have me. What I have to tell them interests them, and they are pleased too to be hospitable in a large and comfortable manner. Trenchard was deeply attached to my father, and speaks of him to me with an emotion surprising in so selfish a man. They like me to stay, and yet, Paul, with it all, I tell you that I am strangely frightened. Of what? Of whom? I have no idea. Isn't it simply that the change from Russia, and perhaps also Anna, is so abrupt that it is startling? Anna and Miss Trenchard, there's a contrast for you. And I'm at the mercy, you know, of anyone. You've always said it, and it is so, most unhappily. Tell Anna from me that I am writing because I couldn't, of course, explain to her, as I do to you, the way that these old, dead, long-forgotten things are springing up again in me. She would never understand. But we were both agreed, she as strongly as I, that this was the right thing, the only thing. You know that I would not hurt a fly if I could help it. No, tell her that I won't write. I'll keep to my word. Not a line from either of us, till time has made it safe, easy. And Stepan will be good to her. He's the best fellow in the world, although so often I hated him. For his sake, as well as for all the others, I will not write. Meanwhile, it is really true enough that I am frightened for perhaps the first time in my life. Suspicion was the keynote of young Henry Trenchard at this time. He was so unsure of himself that he must needs be unsure of everyone else. He was, of course, suspicious of Philip Mark. He was suspicious, and he also admired him. On the day after Mark had sat up writing his letter, half the night because he was excited, on the afternoon of that day they were sitting in the green, dim drawing-room waiting for tea. Mark was opposite Henry, and Henry, back in the shadow, as he liked to sit, huddled up but with his long legs shooting out in front of him as though they belonged to another body, watched him attentively, critically, inquisitively. Mark sat with a little pool of electric light about him, and talked politely to Mrs. Trenchard, who, knitting a long red woollen affair that trailed like a serpent onto the green carpet, said now and then such things as, 
"'It must be very different from England, or I must say I should find that very unpleasant.' Breaking in also to say, "'Forgive me a moment. Henry, that bell didn't ring, did it?' Or, "'Just a little more on the fire, Henry, please. That big lump, please.' Then turning patiently to Mark and saying, "'I beg your pardon, Mr. Mark, you said?' Henry, having at this time a passion for neatness and orderly arrangements, admired Mark's appearance. Mark was short, thick-set, and very dark. A closely clipped black moustache and black hair cut short made him look like an officer, Henry thought. His thick, muscular legs proved him a rider, his mouth and ears were small, and over him from head to foot was the air of one who might have to be off on a dangerous expedition at any moment, and would moreover know exactly what to do having been on many other dangerous expeditions before. Only his eyes disproved the man of action. They were dreamy, introspective, wavering eyes, eyes that were much younger than the rest of him, and eyes, too, that might be emotional, sentimental, impetuous, foolish, and careless. Henry, being very young, did not notice his eyes. Mark was thirty, and looked it. His eyes were the eyes of a boy of twenty, from Henry, his dark, neat clothes, his compact and resourceful air, compelled envy and admiration. Yes, and alarm. For Henry was now entirely and utterly concerned with himself, and every fresh incident, every new arrival, was instantly set up before him, so that he might see how he himself looked in the light of it. Never before, within Henry's memory, had any one, not a relation, not even the friend of a relation, been admitted so intimately into the heart of the house. Never before, within Henry's memory, had any one, not a relation, not even the friend of a relation, been admitted so intimately into the heart of the house. And it seemed to Henry that now already a new standard was being set up, and that perhaps the family, by the light of this dashing figure, who knew Russia like an open book and could be relied upon at the most dangerous crisis, might regard himself, Henry, as something more crudely shabby and incompetent than ever. Moreover, he was not sure that Mark himself did not laugh at him. Beyond all this, there was the sense that Mark had, in a way, invaded the place. It was true that the family had, after that first eventful evening, pressed him to stay, but it oppressed him as though it had upon itself felt pressure, as though its breath had been caught by the impact of some new force, and before it could recover from its surprise, Behold, the force was there, inside the room, with the doors closed behind it. "'It's hardly decent for him to stay on like this,' thought Henry. "'And yet, after all, we asked him. And he is jolly.' Jolly was something that only Henry's father and Uncle Tim of the Trenchard family could be said to be, and its quality was therefore both enlivening and alarming. "'Mother won't like it if he's too jolly,' thought Henry. "'I'm not sure if she likes it now.' Henry had, upon this afternoon, an extra cause for anxiety. A friend of his, a friend of whom he was especially proud, was coming to tea. This friend's name was Seymour, and he was a cheerful young man who had written several novels and was considered promising. The Trenchards had a very slight knowledge of that world known as the arts, and they had, with the exception of Henry, a very healthy distrust of artists as a race. But young Seymour was another affair. He was a gentleman, with many relations who knew Trenchards and Faunders. His novels were proper in sentiment, and based always upon certain agreeable moral axioms, as, for instance, it is better to be good than to be bad, and courage is the greatest thing, and let us not despise others, they may have more to say for themselves than we know. It was wonderful, Mrs. Trenchard thought, that anyone so young should have discovered these things. Moreover, he was cheerful, would talk at any length about anything, and was full of self-assurance. He was fat, and would soon be fatter. He was nice to everyone on principle, because one doesn't know how much a careless word may harm others. Above all, he was jolly. He proclaimed life splendid, wished he could live to a thousand, thought that to be a novelist was the luckiest thing in the world. Some people said that what he really meant was, to be Seymour was the luckiest thing in the world but everyone has their enemies. Henry was nervous about this afternoon because he felt, and he could not have given his reasons, that Mark and Seymour would not get on. He knew that if Mark disliked Seymour, he, Henry, would dislike Mark. Mark would be criticising the Trenchard taste, a dangerous thing to do. 
and perhaps, after all, he was not sure, he looked across the dark intervening shadow into the light where Mark was sitting. The fellow did look conceited, supercilious. No one in the world had the right to be so definitely at his ease. There came in then Rocket and a maid with the tea, Catherine, and finally Aunt Aggie with Harvey Seymour. "'I found Mr. Seymour in the hall,' she said, looking discontentedly about her and shivering a little. "'Standing in the hall!' Seymour was greeted, and soon his cheerful laugh filled the room. He was introduced to Mark. He was busy over tea. "'Sugar? Milk?' "'Nice sharp twang in the air there is. Jolly weather. I walked all the way from Knightsbridge. Delightful. Cake? Bread and butter? Hello, Henry. You ought to have walked with me. Never enjoyed anything so much in my life.' Mrs. Trenchard's broad, impassive face was lighted with approval as a lantern is lit. She liked afternoon tea, and her drawing-room, and young cheerful Seymour, and the books behind the bookcase, and the ticking of the clock. A cosy winter's afternoon in London. What could be pleasanter? She sighed a comfortable, contented sigh. Mark was seized, as he sat there, with a drowsy torpor. The fire seemed to draw from the room all sense that, like memories, waited there for some compelling, friendly warmth. The room was close with more than the Trenchard protection against the winter's day. It was packed with a conscious pressure of all the things that the Trenchards had ever done in that room, and Mrs. Trenchard sat motionless, placid, receiving these old things, encouraging them, and distributing them. Mark was aware that if he encouraged his drowsiness, he would very shortly acquiesce in and submit to he knew not what, and the necessity for battling against his acquiescence irritated him so that it was almost as though everyone in the room was subtly taking him captive, and he would be lost before he was aware. Catherine, alone, quiet, full of repose, saying very little, did not disturb him. It was exactly as though all the other people present were wishing him to break into argument and contradiction, because then they could spring upon him. His attention was, of course, directed by Seymour's opinions, and he knew before he heard them that he would disagree violently with them all. They came, like the distant firing of guns, across the muffled drowsiness of the room. "'I assure you, Mrs. Trenchard, I assure you, assure you, you wouldn't believe—well, of course I've heard people say so, but I can't help disagreeing with them. One may know very little about writing oneself, I don't pretend I've got far, and yet have very distinct ideas as to how the thing should be done. There's good work and bad, you know.' There's no getting over it. But, my dear Henry, dear old chap, I assure you, but it's a question of form. You take my word, a man's nothing without a sense of form. Form, form. Yes, of course, the French are the people. Now, the Russians, Tolstoy, Dostoevsky. Dostoevsky, Mrs. Trenchard. Well, people spell him different ways. You should read War and Peace. Never read War and Peace. Ah, you should. And Crime and Punishment. But compare Crime and Punishment with La Maison Dillier. Maupatron. The Russians aren't in it. But what can you expect from a country like that? I assure you. Quite irresistibly, as though everyone in the room had said, There now, you've simply got to come in now. Mark was drawn forward. He heard through the sleepy, clogged and scented air his own voice. But there are all sorts of novels, aren't there? Just as there are all sorts of people. I don't see why everything should be after the same pattern. He was violently conscious then of Seymour's chin, that turned slowly, irresistibly, as the prow of a ship is turned, toward him. A very remarkable chin for its size and strength, jutting up and out, surprising too after the chubby amiability of the rest of his face. At the same moment it seemed to Mark that all the other chins in the room turned towards him with stern emphasis. A sharp little dialogue followed then. Seymour was eager, cheerful, and good-humoured, patronising too, perhaps, if one is sensitive to such things. Quite so, of course, of course. But you will admit, won't you, that style matters, that the way a thing's done, the way things are arranged, you know, count? I don't know anything about writing novels. I only know about reading them. The literary, polished novel is one sort of thing, I suppose. But there's also the novel with plenty of real people and real things in it. If a novel's too literary, a plain man like myself doesn't find it real at all. I prefer something careless and casual, like life itself, with plenty of people whom you get to know. 
Seymour bent towards him, his chubby face like a very full bud, ready to burst with the eagerness of his amiable superiority. "'But you can't say that your Russians are real people. Come now. Take Dostoevsky. Take him for a minute. Look at them. Look at les frères Karamazov. All as mad as hatters, all of them, and no method at all. Just chucked on anyhow. After all, literature is something.' "'Yes, that's just what I complain of,' said Mark, feeling as though he were inside a ring of eager onlookers who were all cheering his opponent. "'You fellows all think literature's the only thing. It's entirely unimportant beside real life. If your book is like real life, why, then it's interesting. If it's like literature, it's no good at all except to a critic or two. "'And I suppose,' cried Seymour scornfully, his chin rising higher and higher, that you'd say Dostoevsky's like real life? It is, said Mark quietly, if you know Russia. Well, I've never been there, Seymour admitted. But I've got a friend who has. He says that Russian fiction's nothing like the real thing at all. That Russia's just like anywhere else. Nonsense, and Mark's voice was shaking. Your friend, rot! He recovered himself. That's utterly untrue, he said. "'I assure you,' Seymour began. Then Mark forgot himself, his surroundings, his audience. "'Oh, go to blazes!' he cried. "'What do you know about it? "'You say yourself you've never been there. "'I've lived in Moscow for years.' There was then a tremendous silence. Mrs. Trenchard, Aunt Aggie, Henry, all looked at Seymour as though they said, "'Please, please don't mind. "'It shall never happen again.' Catherine looked at Mark. During that moment's silence, the winter afternoon, with its frost and clear skies, its fresh colour and happy intimacies, seemed to beat about the house. In Mark, the irritation that he had felt ever since Seymour's sentence seemed now to explode within him like the bursting of some thundercloud. He was for a moment deluged, almost drowned by his impotent desire to make some scene, in short, to fight, anything that would break the hot, stuffy closeness of the air and let in the sharp crispness of the outer world. But the episode was at an end. Catherine closed it with, "'Tell Mr. Seymour some of those things that you were telling us last night, about Moscow and Russian life.' Mrs. Trenchard's eyes, having concluded their work of consoling Seymour, fastened themselves upon Mark, watching like eyes behind closed windows, strangely in addition to their conviction that some outrage had been committed, there was also a suspicion of fear, but they were the mild, glazed eyes of a stupid, although kindly, woman. Mark, that evening, going up to dress for dinner, thought to himself, "'I really can't stay here any longer. It isn't decent. Besides, they don't like me.' He found, half in the dusk, half in the moonlight of the landing window, Catherine, looking for an instant before she went to her room at the dark Abbey Towers, the sky with the stars frosted over, it seemed, by the coldness of the night, at the moon, faintly orange and crisp against the night blue. He stopped. "'I'm sorry,' he said abruptly, looking into her eyes, very soft and mild, but always with that lingering humour behind their mildness. "'I'm afraid I was rude to that fellow this afternoon.' "'Yes,' she said, turning to him, but with her eyes still on the black towers. "'You were.' but it would have no effect on Mr. Seymour. He felt, as he stood there, that he wished to explain that he was not naturally so unpolished a barbarian. Russia, he began, hesitating and looking at her almost appealingly, is a sore point with me. You can't tell, unless you live there, how it grows upon you, holds you, and at last begs you to stand up for it whenever it may be attacked. And he didn't know, really he didn't, "'You're taking it much too seriously,' she said, laughing at him, he felt. "'No one thought that he did know. "'But Mother likes him, and he's Henry's friend. "'And we all stick together as a family.' "'I'm afraid your mother thought me abominable,' he said, "'looking up at her and looking away again. "'Mother's old-fashioned,' Catherine answered. "'So am I, so are we all. "'We're an old-fashioned family. "'We never had anyone like you to stay with us before.' "'It's abominable that I should stay on like this. I'll go to-morrow. "'No, don't do that. Father loves having you. We all like you. 
only were a little afraid of your ways. She moved down the passage. We're very good for you, I expect, and I'm sure you're very good for us. She suddenly turned back towards him, and, dropping her voice quite solemnly, said to him, The great thing about us is that we're fond of one another. That makes it all the harder for anyone from outside. I'll tell you one thing, he said, carrying on her note of confidence. I like people to like me. I'm very foolish about it. It's the chief thing I want. I like people to like me, too, Catherine answered, raising her voice and moving now definitely away from him. Why shouldn't one? she ended. Don't you be afraid, Mr. Mark. It's all right. He dressed hurriedly and came down to the drawing-room with some thought at the back of his mind that he would, throughout the evening, be the most charming person possible. He found, however, at once a check. Under a full blaze of light, Grandfather Trenchard and Great Aunt Sarah were sitting, waiting for the others. The old man, his silver buckles and white hair gleaming, sat perched high in his chair, one hand raised before the fire, behind it the firelight shining as behind a faint screen. Aunt Sarah, very stiff, upright and slim, was the priestess before the Trenchard Temple. They, both of them, gazed into the fire. They did not turn their heads as Mark entered. They watched his entry in the mirror. He shouted, "'Good evening!' but they did not hear him. He sat down, began a sentence. "'Really a sharp touch in the air!' then abandoned it, seizing Blackwood as a weapon of defence. Behind his paper he knew that her eyes were upon him. He felt them peering into Blackwood's cover. They pierced the pages. They struck him in the face. There was complete silence in the room. The place was thick with burning eyes. They were reflected, he felt, in the mirror, again and again. How they hate me, he thought. End of Book One Chapter Two Book One, Chapter Three of The Green Mirror by Hugh Walpole. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Book One, Chapter Three Catherine. Catherine Trenchard's very earliest sense of morality had been that there were God, the Trenchards, and the Devil. That the Devil wished very much to win the Trenchards over to his side, but that God assured the Trenchards that if only they behaved well, he would not let them go. And for this, Troy had burnt, Carthage been razed to the ground, proud kings driven from their thrones and humbled to the dust, plague, pestilence and famine had wrought their worst. The Trenchards were indeed a tremendous family, and it was little wonder that the heavenly powers should fight for their alliance. In the county of Glebeshire, where Catherine had spent all her early years, Trenchards ran like spiders' webs up and down the lanes and villages. In Polchester, the cathedral city, there were Canon Trenchard and his family, old Colonel Trenchard, late of the Indian Army, the Trenchards of Paul Hayes and the Trenchards of Rothin Place, all these in one small town. There were Trenchards at Rasselas, and Trenchards, poor and rather unworthy Trenchards, at Clinton St Mary. There was one Trenchard, a truculent and gout-ridden bachelor, at Polwint, all of these in the immediate neighbourhood of Catherine's home. Of course, they were important to God. In that old house in the village of Garth in Roselands, where Catherine had been born, an old house up to its very chin in deep green fields, an old house wedded hundreds of years ago to the Trenchard spirit, nor likely now ever to be divorced from it, Catherine had learnt to adore with her body, her soul and her spirit, Glebeshire and everything that belonged to that fair county, but to adore it also because it was so completely, so devoutly, the Trenchard heritage. So full were her early prayers of petitions for successive Trenchards. God bless Father, Mother, Henry, Millie, Vincent, Uncle Tin, Uncle Robert, Auntie Agnes, Auntie Betty, Cousin Wadger, Cousin Wilfred, Cousin Alice, etc., etc., that did it ever come to a petition for someone unhappily not a Trenchard, the prayer was offered with a little hesitating apology. For a long while Catherine thought that when missionaries were sent to gather in the heathen, they were going out on the divine mission of driving all strangers into the Trenchard fold. Not to be a Trenchard. And here I would remark with all possible emphasis that Catherine was never taught that it was a fine and a mighty thing to be a Trenchard. 
No trench art had ever, since time began, considered his position any more than the stars, the moon, and the sun considered theirs. If you were a trenchard, you did not think about it at all. The whole trenchard world, with all its ramifications, its great men and its small men, its dignitaries, its houses, its castles, its pleasure resorts, its foreign baths, its theatres, its shootings, its churches, its policies, its foods and drinks, its patriotism and charities, its seas, its lakes and rivers, its morality, its angers, its pleasures, its regrets, its god and its devil. The whole Trenchard world was a thing intact, preserved, ancient, immovable. It took its stand on its history, its family affection, its country places, its loyal conservatism, its obstinacy and its stupidity. Utterly unlike such a family as the Beminsters, with their preposterous old duchess, now so happily dead, it had no need whatever for any self-assertion, any struggle with anything, any fear of invasion. From without, nothing could attack its impregnability. From within? Well, perhaps presently. But no Trenchard was aware of that. A young Beminster learned from the instant of its breaking the egg that it must at once set about showing the world that it was a Beminster. A young Trenchard never considered for a single second that he was supposed to show anyone anything. He was. That was enough. The Trenchards had never been conceited people. Conceit implied too definite a recognition of other people's position and abilities. To be conceited, you must think yourself abler, more interesting, richer, handsomer than someone else. And no Trenchard ever realised anyone else. From the security of their mirror they looked out upon the world. Only from inside the house could the mirror be broken. Surely, then, they were secure. Catherine was always a very modest little girl, but her modesty had never led to any awkward shyness or embarrassment. She simply did not consider herself at all. She had been, in the early days, a funny little figure, dumpy, with serious brown eyes and a quiet voice. She was never in the way, better at home than at parties, she never struck strangers, as did her younger sister Millicent, who would be brilliant when she grew up. Catherine would never be brilliant. She had from the first a capacity for doing things for the family without attracting attention. And what more can selfish people desire? She was soon busy and occupied, necessary to the whole house. She very seldom laughed, but her eyes twinkled, and she was excellent company did anyone care for her opinion. Only Uncle Tim of them all realised her intelligence. For the rest of the family she was slow, but a dear. It was in her capacity of a dear that she finally stood to all of them. They adored because they knew that they never disappointed her. Although they had none of them, save Henry, any concern as to their especial failings or weaknesses, it was nevertheless comforting to know that they might put anything upon Catherine, behave to her always in the way that was easiest to them, and that she would always think them splendid. They would not in public places put Catherine forward as a fine trenchard. Millicent would be a fine trenchard one day. But at home, in their cosy fortified security, there was no one like Catherine. Catherine was perfect to them all. Not that she did not sometimes have her tempers, her impatiences, her moods. They were puzzled when she was short with them, when she would not respond to their invitations for compliments, when she seemed to have some horrible doubt as to whether the Trenchard world was, after all, the only one. But they waited for the mood to pass, and it passed very swiftly. It is noteworthy, however, that never, in spite of their devotion to her, did they, during these crises, attempt to help or console her. She stood alone, and at the back of their love there was always some shadow of fear. Very happy had her early years been, the house at Garth, rambling, untidy, intimate, with the croquet lawn in front of it, the little wild wood at the right of it, the high sheltering green fields at the left of it, the old church tower above the little wood, the primroses and cuckoos, the owls and moonlit nights, the hot summer days with the hum of the reaping machine, the taste of crushed strawberries, the dim, sleepy voices from the village street. This was a world. The old house had never changed. As she had grown, it had dwindled, perhaps, but ever, as the years passed, had enclosed more securely the passion of her heart. She saw herself standing in the dim passage that led to her bedroom, 
a tiny, stumpy figure. She could hear the voice of Miss Mayer, the governess. "'Now, Catherine, come along, please. Millie's in bed.' She could smell the tallow of the candle, could hear the owl's hoot from the dark window, could smell apples and roses somewhere, could remember how intensely she had caught that moment and held it and carried it for ever and ever away with her. Yes, that was a world. And beyond the house there was the country. Every lane and wood and hill did she know. Those thick, deep, scented lanes that any Glebeshire in all the world can provide. The road to Raphael, running at first with only a moment's peep now and again of the sea, then plunging with dramatic fling suddenly down into the heart of the valley. There was Raphael, Raphael the only cove in all the world. How, as the dog-cart bumped down that precipice, had her heart been in her mouth? How magical the square harbour, the black peak, the little wall of whitewashed cottages, after that defeated danger! There were all the other places, St. Lo and Polwint, Polchester with the cathedral, and the orchards and the cobbled streets, Grain Woods and Grain Castle, Rothin Woods, Roche St. Mary, more with the sea-dunes and the mists and rabbits, the Loro River and the fishing-boats of Palint. World of perfect beauty and simplicity, days stained with the high glory of romance. And this was Trenchard country. London, coming to her afterwards, had at first been hated, only gradually accepted. She grew slowly fond of the old Westminster house, but the crowds about her confused and perplexed her. She was aware now that, perhaps, there were those in the world who cared nothing for the trenchyards. She flew from such confusion the more intensely into her devotion to her own people. It was as though, at the very first peep of the world, she had said to herself, No, that is not my place. They have no need of me, nor I of them. They would change me. I do not wish to be changed. She was aware of her own duty the more strongly, because her younger sister Millicent had taken always the opposite outlook. Millicent, pretty, slender, witty, attractive, had always found home, even Garth and its glories, a little slow. The family had always understood that it was natural for Millicent to find them slow. No pains had been spared over Millicent's development. She had just finished her education in Paris and was coming back to London. Always future plans now were discussed with a view to finding amusement for Millicent. Millie will be here then. I wonder whether Millie will like him. He better accept it. Millie will like to go. Beyond all the family, Catherine loved Millicent. It had begun when Millie had been very small and Catherine had mothered her. It had continued when Millie, growing older, had plunged into scrapes and demanded succour out of them again. It had continued when Catherine and Millie had developed under a cloud of governesses, Millie brilliant and idle, Catherine plodding and unenterprising. It had continued when Millie, two years ago, had gone to Paris, had written amusing, affectionate letters, had told, Darling Katie, that there was no one, no one, no one, anywhere in all the world to touch her. Mademoiselle Roger was a pig, Mademoiselle Lefrain, who taught music, an angel, etc., etc. Now Millicent was coming home. Catherine was aware that from none of the family did she receive more genuine affection than from Henry, and yet, strangely, she was often irritated with Henry. She wished that he were more tidy, less rude to strangers, less impulsive, more of a comfort and less of an anxiety to his mother and father. She was severe sometimes to Henry, and then was sorry afterwards. She could do anything with him, and wished, therefore, that he had more backbone. Of them all she understood her mother the best. She was very like her mother in many ways. She understood that inability to put things into words, that mild conviction that everything was all right, a conviction to be attained only by shutting your eyes very tight. She understood, too, as no other member of the family understood, that Mrs. Trenchard's devotion to her children was a passion as fierce, as unresting, as profound, and possibly as devastating as any religion, any superstition, any obsession. It was an obsession. It had in it all the glories, the dangers, the relentless ruthlessness of an overwhelming idée fixe, that idée fixe which is at every human being's heart, and that, often undiscovered, unsuspected, transforms the world. 
Catherine knew this. For her father she had the comradeship of a playfellow. She could not take her father very seriously. He did not wish that she should. She loved him always, and he loved her in his off moments, when he was not thinking of himself and his early nineteenth century. If he had any time that he could spare from himself, it was given to her. She thought it quite natural that his spare time should be slender. And, of them all, no one inquired as to her own heart, her thoughts, her wonders, her alarms and suspicions, her happiness, her desires. She would not, if she could help it, inquire herself about these things. But sometimes she was aware that life would not for ever leave her alone. She had one friend who was not a Trenchard, and only one. That was Lady Seddon, who had been before her marriage a Beminster and granddaughter of the old Duchess of Rex. Rachel Beminster had married Roddy Seddon. Shortly after their marriage he had been flung from his horse, and from that time had been always upon his back. It would always be so with him. They had one child, a boy of two, and they lived in a little house in Regent's Park. That friendship had been of Rachel Seddon's making. She had driven herself in upon Catherine, and, offering her baby as a reward, had lured Catherine into her company. But even to her Catherine had not surrendered herself. Rachel Seddon was a Beminster, and although the Beminster power was now broken, about that family there lingered traditions of greatness and autocratic splendour. Neither Rachel nor Roddy Seddon was autocratic, but Catherine would not trust herself entirely to them. It was as though she was afraid that by doing so she would be disloyal to her own people. This, then, was Catherine's world. Upon the morning of the November day when Millicent was to make, upon London, her triumphal descent from Paris, Catherine found herself, suddenly, in the middle of Wigmore Street, uneasy. Wigmore Street was mild, pleasantly lit with a low and dim November sun, humming with a little stir and scatter of voices and traffic, opening and shutting its doors, watching a drove of clouds, like shredded paper, sail through the faint blue sky above it. Catherine stopped for an instant to consider this strange uneasiness. She looked about her, thought, and decided that she would go and see Rachel Seddon. Crossing a little finger of the park, she stopped again. The treaded clouds were dancing now amongst the bare stiff branches of the trees, and a grey mist, climbing over the expanse of green, spread like thin gauze from end to end of the rising ground. A little soughing wind seemed to creep about her feet. She stopped again and stood there, a solitary figure. For perhaps the first time in her life she considered herself. She knew, as she stood there, that she had for several days been aware of this uneasiness. It was as though someone had been knocking at her door for admittance. She had heard the knocking, but had refused to move, saying to herself that soon the sound would cease. But it had not ceased. It was more clamorous than before. She was frightened. Why? Was it Milly's return? She knew that it was not that. Standing there in the still park, she seemed to hear something say to her, You are to be caught up. Life is coming to you. You cannot avoid it. You are caught. She might have cried to the sky, the trees, the little pools of dead and sodden leaves, What is it? What is it? Do you hear anything? A scent of rotting leaves and damp mist brought by the little wind invaded her. The pale sun struck through the moist air and smiled down a globe of gold upon her. There came to her that moment of revelation that tells human beings that, fine as they may think themselves, full of courage and independent of all men, life, if it exert but the softest pressure, may be too strong for them. The armies of God, with their certain purpose, are revealed for a brief instant entrenched amongst the clouds. If we crush you, what matters it to us? She hurried on her way, longing for the sound of friendly voices, and when she found Rachel Seddon with her son in the nursery, the fire, the warm colours, the absurd rocking horse, armies of glittering soldiers encamped upon the red carpet, the buzz of a sewing machine in the next room, above all Michael Seddon's golden head and Rachel's dark one, she could have cried aloud her relief. Rachel, tall and slender, dark eyes and hair from a Russian mother, restless, impetuous, flinging her hands out in some gesture, catching her boy suddenly and kissing him, 
breaking off in the heart of one sentence to begin another, was a strange contrast to Catherine's repose. Soon Catherine was on the floor, and Michael, who loved her, had his arms about her neck. That's how she ought always to be, thought Rachel, looking down at her. How could anyone ever say that she was plain? Roddy thinks her so. He should see her now. Catherine looked up. Rachel, she said, I was frightened just now in the park. I don't know why. I almost ran here. I'm desperately ashamed of myself. You? Frightened? Yes, I thought someone was coming out from behind a tree to slip a bag over my head. I... Oh, I don't know what I thought. Then she would say no more. She played with Michael and tried to tell him a story. Here she was, as she had often been before, unsuccessful. She was too serious over the business, would not risk improbabilities, and wanted to emphasise the moral. She was not sufficiently absurd. Gravely, her eyes sought for a decent ending. She looked up and found that Michael had left her and was moving his soldiers. The sun, slanting in, struck lines of silver and gold from their armour across the floor. As she got up and stood there, patting herself to see whether she were tidy, her laughing eyes caught Rachel. "'There, you see, I'm no good at that. No imagination. Father's always said so.' "'Katie,' Rachel said, catching her soft, warm, almost chubby hand, "'there's nothing the matter, is there?' "'The matter? No, what should there be?' It's so odd of you to say what you did just now, and I think, um, I don't know, you're different today. No, I'm not. Catherine looked at her. It was the damp park, all the bare trees, and nobody about. But it's so unlike you to think of damp parks and bare trees. Well, perhaps it was because Millie's coming back from Paris this afternoon. I should be terrified of her. So smart she'll be. Give her my love and bring her here as soon as she'll come. She'll amuse Roddy. She paused, searching in Catherine's brown eyes. "'Katie, if there's ever anything, anything, I can help you in, or advise you, or do for you, you know, don't you, you always will be so independent. You don't tell me things. Remember, I've had my times, worse times than you guess.' Catherine kissed her. "'It's all right, Rachel. There's nothing the matter, except that—no, nothing at all. Good-bye, dear.' Don't come down. I'll bring Milly over. She was gone. Rachel watched her demure, careful progress until she was caught and hidden by the trees. There had been a little truth in her words when she told Rachel that she dreaded Milly's arrival. If she had ever, in the regular routine of her happy and busy life, looked forward to any event as dramatic or a crisis, that moment had always been Milly's return from Paris. Milly had been happy and affectionate at home, but nevertheless a critic. She had never quite seen life from inside the Trenchard mirror, nor had she quite seen it from the vision of family affection. She loved them all, but she found them slow, unadventurous, behind the times. That was the awful thing. Behind the times. A terrible accusation. If Milly had felt that two years ago, how vehemently would she feel it now? And Catherine knew that as she considered this criticism of Milly's, she was angry and indignant and warm, with an urgent, passionate desire to protect her mother from any criticism whatever. Behind the times, indeed. Milly had better not... And then she remembered the depth of her love for Milly. Nothing should interfere with that. She was in her bedroom after luncheon, considering these things, when there was a tap on the door, and Aunt Betty entered. In her peep round the door to see whether she might come in, in the friendly, hopeful, reassuring butterfly of a smile that hovered about her lips, in the little stir of her clothes as she moved as though every article of attire was assuring her that it was still there, and was very happy to be there too, there was the whole of her history written. It might be said that she had no history, but to such an assertion, did she hear it, she would offer an indignant denial, could she be indignant about anything. She had been perfectly admirably happy for fifty-six years, and that, after all, is to have a history to some purpose. She had nothing whatever to be happy about. She had no money at all, and had never had any. She had, for a great number of years, been compelled to live upon her brother's charity, and she was the most independent soul alive. 
In strict truth she had, of her own, thirty pounds a year, and the things that she did with those thirty pounds are outside and beyond any calculation. "'There's always my money, George,' she would say, when her brother had gloomy forebodings about investments. She lived, in fact, a minute, engrossing, adventurous, flaming life of her own. And the flame, the colour, the fire, were drawn from her own unconquerable soul. In her bedroom, faded wallpaper, faded carpet, faded chairs, because no one ever thought of her needs, she had certain possessions, a cedarwood box, a row of books, a watercolour sketch, photographs of the family, Catherine three and a half, Vincent eight years old, Millicent ten years, etc., etc., a model of the Albert Memorial done in pink wax, a brass tray from India, some mother-of-pearl shells, two china cats given to her one Christmas day by a very young Catherine. Those possessions were her world. She felt that within that bedroom everything was her own. She would allow no other pictures on the wall, no books not hers in the bookcase. One day, when she had some of the thirty pounds to play with, she would cover the chairs with beautiful cretonne, and she would buy a rug. So she had said for the last twenty years. She withdrew when life was tiresome, when her sister Aggie was difficult, when there were quarrels in the family, she hated quarrels, into this world of her own, and would suddenly break out in the midst of a conversation with, I might have the bed there, or there isn't really room for another chair if I had one, and then would make a little noise like a top. Hmm, hmm, hmm. In defiance of her serenity she could assume a terrible rage and indignation were any member of the family attacked. Her brother George and Catherine she loved best. She did not, although she would never acknowledge it, care greatly for Henry. Milly she admired and feared. She had only to think of Catherine, and her eyes would fill with tears. She was a very fount of sentiment. She had suffered much from her sister Agnes, but she had learnt now the art of withdrawal so perfectly that she could escape at any time without her sister being aware of it. "'You aren't listening, Elizabeth,' Agnes would cry suspiciously. "'Yes, dear Aggie, I am. I don't think things as bad as you say. For instance—' And a wonderful recovery would reassure suspicion. The real core of her life was Catherine and Catherine's future. There was to be one day for Catherine a most splendid suitor, a lord, perhaps, a great politician, a great churchman, she did not know, but someone who would realise first Catherine's perfection, secondly the honour of being made a trenchard, thirdly the necessity of spending all his life in the noble work of making Catherine happy. I shall miss her, we shall all miss her, but we mustn't be selfish, hmm? Hmm? She'll have one to stay, perhaps. Very often she came peeping into Catherine's room, as she came to-day. She would take Catherine into her confidence. She would offer her opinion about the events of the hour. She took her stand in the middle of the room, giving little excited pecks at one of her fingers, the one that suffered most from her needle when she sewed, a finger scarred now by a million little stabs. So she stood now, and Catherine, sitting on the edge of her bed, looked up at her. "'I came in, my dear, because you hardly ate any luncheon. I watched you. Hardly any at all.' Oh, "'That's all right, Aunt Betty. I wasn't hungry.' "'I don't like your not eating. Hmm? Hmm? "'No, I don't. Mother always used to say, "'Don't eat, can't beat. Of military forces, you know, dear, or anything that had a hard task to perform.' She looked about her with an aimless and rather nervous smile, which meant that she had something to say, but was afraid of it. "'Katie, dear, do you know—' this with an air of intense importance. "'I don't think I'll show Milly my room. Not just at first, at any rate.' "'Oh, but you must. She'll be longing to see it.' "'Well, but will she, do you think?' "'Oh, no, she won't. Not after Paris. Paris is so grand. Perhaps later I will show it to her. I mean, when she's more accustomed to the old life.' But even now it was plain that she had not delivered her purpose. It was imprisoned like a mouse in a very woolly, moth-eaten trap. Soon there will be a click, and out it will come. Her wandering, soft, kindly eyes looked gravely upon Catherine. "'My dear, I wish you'd eaten something. Only a little mince and two of those cheese biscuits. Katie, dear, did you hear what Mr. Mark said at luncheon about leaving us?' "'Yes, Aunt Betty.' 
He said he'd got somewhere from next Monday. Poor young man. Not so young now, either. But he seems lonely. I'm glad we were able to be kind to him at first. Katie, I have an idea. Impossible to give any picture of the eagerness with which now her eyes were lit, and her small body strung on a tiptoe of excitement. I have an idea. I think he and Milly, I think he might be just the man for Milly. Adventurous, exciting, knowing so much about Russia, and after Paris she'll want someone like that. Catherine turned slowly away from her aunt, gazing vaguely, absent-mindedly, as though she had not been thinking of the old lady's words. "'Oh, no, Aunt Betty, I don't think so. What an old matchmaker you are! I love to see people happy, and I like him. I think it's a pity he's going on Monday. He's been here a fortnight now. I like him. He's polite to me, and when a young man is polite to an old woman like me, that says a lot. Mm -hmm. Yes, it does. But your mother doesn't like him. I wonder why not. But she doesn't. I always know when your mother doesn't like anybody. Milly will. I know she will. But I don't think I'll show her my things. Not at first. Not right after Paris. Perhaps it would be better to wait a little. Catherine went and sat in front of her mirror. She touched the things on her dressing-table. I'll go now, dear. I can't bear to think of you only having had that mince. My will be on you at dinner, mind. She peeped out of the door, looked about her with her bright little eyes, then whisked away. Catherine sat before her glass, gazing, but not at herself. She did not know whose face it was that stared back at her. Minnie's entrance that afternoon was very fine. There were there to receive her her grandfather, her great-aunt, in white boa, her father, her mother, Henry, Catherine, Aunt Betty and Aggie, Philip Mark, Esquire. She stood in the doorway of the drawing-room, radiant with health, good spirits, and happiness at being home again. All trenchards always are. Like Catherine in the humour of her eyes, otherwise not at all. Tall, dark, slim, in black and white, a little black hat with a blue feather, a hat that was over one ear. She had her grandfather's air of clear, finely cut distinction, but so alive, so vibrating with health was she, that her entrance extinguished the family awaiting her as you blow out a candle. Her cheeks were flushed, her black eyes sparkled, her arms were outstretched to all of them. "'Here I am,' she seemed to say. "'I'm sure you've forgotten in all this time how delightful I am, and indeed I'm ever so much more delightful than I was before I went away. In any case, here I am, ready to love you all, and there's no family in the world I'd be gladder to be a member of than this.' Her sharp, merry, inquisitive eyes sought them all out, sought out the old room with all the things in it, exactly as she had always known them, and then the people, one after the other, all of them exactly as she had always known them. She was introduced to Philip Mark. Her eyes lingered up him for an instant, mischievously, almost interrogatively. To him she seemed to say, "'What on earth are you doing inside here? How did you ever get in? And what are you here for?' She seemed to say to him, "'You and I, we know more than these others here, but just because of that we're not half so nice.' "'Well, Henry,' she said, and he felt that she was laughing at him, and blushed. He knew that his socks were hanging loosely. He had lost one of his suspenders. "'Well, Milly,' he answered, and thought how beautiful she was. It was one of the Trenchard axioms that anyone who crossed the English Channel conferred a favour. It was nice of them to go, as though one visited a hospital or asked a poor relation to stay. Paris must have been glad to have had Milly. It must have been very gay for Paris. And that not because Milly was very wonderful, but simply because Paris wasn't English. "'It must be nice to be home again, Milly dear,' said Mrs. Trenchard comfortably. Milly laughed, and for a moment her eyes flashed across at Philip Mark, but he was looking at Catherine. She looked round upon them all, then, as though she were wondering how, after all, things were going to be now that she had come home, for good, now that it would be always and always. Well, perhaps not always. She looked again at Philip Mark, and liked him. She surrendered herself, then, to the dip and splash and sparkle of the family waters of affection. They deluged and overwhelmed her. 
Her old grandfather and the great aunt sat silently there, watching, with their bird-like eyes, everything, but even upon their grim features there were furrowed smiles. And the crossing was really all right? The trees in the park were blowing, rather. And so, Milly dear, I said you'd go, I promised for you, but you could get out of it as easily as anything. You must have been sorry, as it was the last time, but you'll be able to go back later on and see them. And her father. Well, they've had her long enough, and now it's our turn for a bit. She's been spoiled there. She won't get any spoiling here. He roared with laughter, flinging his head back, coming over and catching Milly's head between his hands, laughing above her own laughing eyes. Henry watched them, his father cynically, his sister devotedly. He was always embarrassed by the family demonstrations, and he felt it the more embarrassing now because there was a stranger in their midst. Philip was just the man to think this all odd. But Henry was anxious about the family behaviour simply because he was devoted to the family, not at all because he thought himself superior to it. Then Milly tore herself away from them all. She looked at Catherine. "'I'm going up to my room. Katie, come up and help me.' i better come and help you, dear,' said Mrs. Trenchard. "'There's sure to be a mess.' But Minnie shook her head with a slight gesture of impatience. "'No, no, mother. Katie and I will manage.' "'Hilda will do everything if—' "'No, I want to show Katie things.' They went. When the two girls were alone in the bedroom and the door was closed, Milly flung her arms round Catherine and kissed her again and again. They stood there in the silence, wrapped in one another's arms. "'Katie, darling, if you only knew all this time how I've longed for you. Sometimes I thought, I must, I must see her. That's you. I'd run away. I'd do anything. I don't think anything matters now that I've got you again. And I've so much to tell you.' They sat down on the bed, Milly vibrating with the excitement of her wonderful experiences. Catherine quiet, but with one hand pressing Milly's, and her eyes staring into distance. Suddenly Milly stopped. "'Katie, dear, who's this man?' "'What man?' "'The nice-looking man I saw downstairs.' "'Oh, he's a Mr. Mark, son of a great friend of father's. He's lived in Russia, Moscow, for years. He came in by mistake one night in a fog and found that ours was the house he was coming to next day. Then father asked him to stay.' "'Do you like him?' "'Yes, he's very nice. He looks nice.' Minnie went on again with her reminiscences. Catherine, saying only a word now and then, listened. Then, exactly as though she had caught some unexpected sound, Minnie broke off again. "'Katie! Katie!' "'Yes?' "'You're different. Something's happened to you.' "'My dear, nothing, of course.' "'Yes, something has. Something, Katie.' And here Milly flung her arms again about her sister and stared into her eyes. "'You're in love with someone.' But Catherine laughed. "'That's Paris, Milly, dear. Paris, Paris.' "'It isn't. It's you. There is someone, Katie, darling. Tell me. You've always told me everything. Who is he? Tell me.' Catherine drew herself away from Milly's embrace, then turned round, looked at her sister. Then she caught her and kissed her with a sudden urgent passion. "'There's no one. Of course there's no one. I'm the old maid of the family. You know me long ago decided that I'm not—' She broke off, laughed, got up from the bed. She looked at Milly as though she were setting, subduing some thoughts in her mind. "'I'm just the same, Milly. You're different, of course.' At a sudden sound both the girls looked up. Their mother stood in the doorway, with her placidity, her mild affection. She looked about the room. "'I had to come, my dears, to see how you were getting on.' She moved forward slowly towards them. End of Book One, Chapter Three Book One, Chapter Four of The Green Mirror by Hugh Walpole This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers Book One, Chapter Four, The Forest Part of a letter that Philip Mark wrote to his friend. I couldn't stay any longer. They'd had me there a fortnight, and then one of the daughters came home from being finished in Paris, so that they've really no room for strangers. I've moved here, not very far away, three furnished rooms in an upper part in a small street off Victoria Street. 
It's quiet, with an amazing quietness, considering its closeness to all the rattle. The Roman Catholic Cathedral is just round the corner. Hideous to look at, but it's nice inside. There's a low little pub opposite that reminds me comfortably of one of our beloved Tractier. You see, I'm sentimental about Moscow already. More so every day. I've so much to tell you, and yet it comes down to one very simple thing. i found, I believe, already the very soul I set out to find. Set out with yours and Anna's blessing, remember. You mayn't tell her yet. It's too soon, and it may so easily come to nothing. But I do believe that if I'd searched England through and through for many years, I could never have found anyone so... so exactly what I need. You must have guessed in that very first letter that it had even then begun. It began from the instance that I saw her. It seems to me now to be as deeply seated in me as my own soul itself. But you know that at the root of everything is my own distrust in myself. Perhaps if I had never gone to Russia, I should have had more confidence. But that country, as I see it now, stirs always through the hearts of its lovers, questions about everything in heaven or earth, and then tells one at the end that nothing matters. And the Englishman that is in me has always fought that distrust, has called it sentimental, feeble, and then again I've caught back the superstition and the wonder. In Russia one's so close to God and the devil. In England there is business and common sense. Between the two I'm pretty useless. If you had once seen Catherine, you'd know why she seems to me a refuge from all that I've been fighting with Anna for so long. She's clear and true as steel. So quiet, so sure, so much better and finer than myself, that I feel I'm the most selfish hound in the world to dream of attaching her to me. Mind you, I don't know at present that she's interested. She's so young and ignorant in so many ways, with all her calm common sense, that I'm terrified of alarming her, and if she doesn't care for me, I'll never disturb her, never. But if she should, well, then I believe that I can make her happy. I know myself by now. I left my Moscow self behind me, just as Anna said that I must. There's nothing stranger than the way that Anna foretold it all. That night when she showed me that I must go, she drew a picture of the kind of woman whom I must find. She had never been to England. She had only in all her life seen one or two English women. But she knew. She knew absolutely. It is as though she had seen Catherine in her dreams. But I'm talking with absurd assurance. Putting Catherine entirely aside, there is all the family to deal with. Trenchard himself likes me. Mrs. Trenchard hates me. That's not a bit too strong, and the strange thing is that there's no reason at all for it that I can see, nor have we been, either of us, from the beginning, anything but most friendly to one another. If she suspected that I was in love with Catherine, I might understand it, but that's impossible. There's been nothing, I swear, to give anyone the slightest suspicion. She detects, I think, something foreign and strange in me. Russia, of course, she views with the deepest suspicion, and it would amuse you to hear her ideas of that country. Nothing, although she has never been near to it, nor read anything but silly romances about it, could shake her convictions. Because I don't support them, she knows me for a liar. She is always calm and friendly to me, but her intense dislike comes through it all. And yet I really like her. She is so firm and placid and determined. She adores her family. She will fight for them to the last feather and claw. She's so sure and so certain about everything, and yet I believe that in her heart she is always afraid of something. It is out of that fear, I am sure, that her hatred of me comes. For the others, the only one who troubled about me was the boy, and he is the strangest creature. He'd like me to give him all my experiences. He hasn't the slightest notion of them, but he's morbidly impatient of his own inexperience, and the way his family are shutting him out of everything— and yet he's trenchard enough to disapprove violently of that wider experience if it came to him. He'd like me, for instance, to take him out and show him purple restaurants, ladies in big hats, and so on. If he did so, he'd feel terribly out of it, and then hate me. He's a jumble of the crudest, most impossible, and yet rather touching ideas, enthusiasms, indignations, virtues, would-be vices. He adores his sister. About that, at least, he is firm. And if I were to harm her or make her unhappy, I suppose it's foolish of me to go on like this. I'm indulging myself. I can talk to no one. So you, just as I used to in those first days such years ago, when I didn't know a word of Russian, came and sat by the hour in your flat, talked bad French to your wife, 
and found all the sympathy I wanted in your kind, fat face, even though we could only exchange a word or two in the worst German. How good you were to me, then! How I must have bored you! There's no one here willing to be bored like that. To an Englishman, time is money. None of that blissful ignoring of the rising and setting of sun, moon, and stars that for so many years I have enjoyed. The morning and the evening were the first day. There's no Russian god who said that. I found some old friends. Millet, Thackeray, you'll remember. They were in Moscow two years ago. But with them it is, Dinner eight o'clock sharp, old man. Got an engagement at nine-thirty. So, I'm lonely. I give the world to see your fat body in the doorway and hear your voice rise into that shrill Russian scream of pleasure at seeing me. You should sit down. You should have some tea, although I've no samovar to boil the water in. And I talk about Catherine, 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 until all was blue. And you say, Harosho, Harosho. And it would be six in the morning before we knew. God help us all. I mustn't talk about it. It all comes to this in the end, as to whether a man can, by determination and resolve of his own will, wipe out utterly the old life and become a new man. All those Russian years, Anna, Paul, Paul's death, all the thought, the view, the vision of life, the philosophy that Russia gave me, those things have got to disappear. They never existed. I've got again what, all those years, you all said that I wanted, the right to be once again an English citizen, with everything, morals and all, cut and dried. I can say like old Vladimir after his year in Canada, I've never seen so many clean people in my life. I've got what I wanted, and I mustn't, I mustn't look back. I believe I can carry it all through if I can get Catherine, get her and keep her and separate her from the family. She's got to belong to me and not to the Crenchards. Moscow, the Trenchards. Oh, <laughs> Paul, there's a comedy there, and a tragedy too, perhaps. I'm an ass, but I'm frightened. I think I'm doing the finest things, and when they're done, they turn out the rottenest. Supposing I become a Trenchard myself? Think of that night when Paul died. Afterwards we went up to the Kremlin, you remember. How quiet it was, and how entirely I seemed to have died with Paul, and then how quickly life was the same again. But at any rate, Moscow cared for me, and told me that it cared. London cares nothing, not even for the Trenchards. Think of me, Paul, as often as you can. Think of that afternoon in the restaurant when you first showed me how to drink vodka, and I told you in appalling German that Byron and Wilde weren't as good as you thought them. Think of me, old man. I believe I'm in for a terrible business. If Catherine loves me, the family will fight me. If she doesn't love me, nothing else now seems to matter. And with it all, I'm as lonely as I were a foreigner who didn't know a word of English and hadn't a friend. I've got my icon up on the right corner. Near it is a print of Queen Victoria receiving news of her accession to the throne of England. Philip Mark sat day by day in his ugly sitting-room, and thought of Catherine Chenchard. It was nearly a fortnight now since he had come to these rooms. He had not, during that time, seen Catherine. He had called once at the Trenchard's house. He had spent then half an hour alone with Mrs. Trenchard and Aunt Aggie. In these fourteen days she had grown from an unattractive thought into a compelling, driving impulse. Because his rooms were unattractive, and because he was sick for Moscow, although he would not admit that. Therefore he had turned to the thought of her to comfort him. Now he was a slave to the combination of it. He must see her. He must speak to her. He must have something to remember. He must not speak to her. He must not see her, lest he should be foolish and ruin all his friendship with her by frightening her. And meanwhile, in these long, long evenings, the lamp from the street below trembled and trembled on his wall, as though London, like some hostile policeman, were keeping its eye upon him, and warned him not to go too far. The history of Philip Mark, its past, its present and its future, is to be found clearly written in the character of his mother. His mother had been a woman of great force, resolve and determination. She had, in complete subjection, those who composed her world. She was kind, as the skilful executioner is kind, who severs a head with one neat blow. Her good-humoured husband, her friendly, sentimental, idealistic son, submitted utterly, without question, to her kindness. 
She had died when Philip was twenty-one, and instantly Philip and his father had discovered, to their immense surprise, their immense relief. Philip's father had married at once a young clergyman's daughter of no character at all, and was compelled to divorce her four years later. Philip, to show his new and splendid independence, had discovered an opening in a cloth business in Moscow. He went there, and so remained, until in his thirtieth year the death of his father had presented him with fifteen hundred pounds a year. Always, through all the Russian time, it had been his dream that he would one day be an English landowner, with a house and a wood, fields and children, white gates and a curving drive. He had come home now to realise his ambition. The central motive of Philip's existence was that he always desired, very seriously, sometimes desperately, to be all these things that the elements in his character would always prevent him from being. For instance, awaking at his mother's death from her relentless domination, he resolved that he would never be influenced by anyone again. Five minutes after this determination, he was influenced by the doctor who had attended his mother, the lawyer who read her will, and the clergyman who buried her. It had seemed to him, as he grew up in England, that the finest thing in the world was to be, when he was sixteen, like St. Francis of Assisi, when he was nineteen, like Shelley, when he was twenty-one, like Tolstoy, and the worst thing in the world was to be a commonplace English squire. He went to Russia, and at once concluded that there was nothing like the solid, sensible, beef-eating English squire for helping on the world, and that, as I have said, as soon as he was rich enough, he would settle down in England with his estate, his hunters, and his weekly spectator. Meanwhile, he was influenced more and more by Russia and the Russians. He did not really desire to be strong, sober, moral, industrious, strong-minded, but only kindly, affectionate, tolerant, with every one man for his friend. He found in Russia that the only thing demanded of him was that he should love his brother. He made an immense number of friends, lived with a Russian girl, Anna Petrovna Semyonov, she danced in the Moscow Imperial Ballet, for three years, and had by her a son who died. At the end of that time his father's death gave him the opportunity of doing what he had always declared to every Russian was the ambition of his life, to settle in England as an English landowner. Anna was fond of him now, but not at all in love with him. They were the best friends in the world. She believed very seriously that the greatest thing for him would be to find a nice English girl whom he could love, marry, and make the mother of his children. Philip had, during these Russian years, grown stronger in character, and still was determined that the worst thing in the world was to be under anyone's domination. He was, however, under the power of anyone who showed him affection. His outlook was now vehemently idealistic, romantic, and sentimental, although in the cloth business he was hard-headed, cynical, and methodical. Did a human being care for him, and he would do anything for him? Under the influence of anyone's affection, the world became so rosy to him that he lost all count of time, common sense, and digestion. Anna was really fond of him, although often enough she was desperately bored with him. She had always mothered him, but thought now that an English girl would mother him better. She sent him home. He was very young for his thirty years, but then from the age of anyone who has lived in Russia for long, he may take away always twenty years. He was resolved now to be the most English of all English, to be strong, hard-headed, a little cynical, unsentimental. He had, of course, fallen in love with the first English girl whom he met. Meanwhile, he did not entirely assist his cynical hard-headedness by writing long, introspective letters to his Russian friend. However, to support his resolute independence, he had always in front of him on his writing table a photograph of his mother. It shall never be like that again, he would say to himself, looking fixedly at the rather faded picture of a lady of iron-grey hair and a strong bosom clad in shining black silk. Won't it, my son, said his mother, looking back at him with a steely twinkle somewhere in her eye. Won't it? Meanwhile, there was no place in London where, at three in the morning, he might drink with his friends and discover that all the world loved him. He was very lonely in London, and wanted Catherine more desperately with every tick of the ormolu clock on the marble mantelpiece. But he would not go to see her. One glance at his mother's photograph was enough to settle that. No, 
he would not. Then he met her. Upon a lonely November afternoon he walked along the embankment, past Lambeth Bridge, into the melancholy deserted silences of Pimlico. He turned back, out of the little grey streets, onto the river again, and stood for a while, looking back over the broad, still sheet of the river, almost white in colour, but streaked with black lines of shadow that trembled and wavered, as though they were rods about to whip the water into storm. The sky was grey, and all the buildings clustered against it were grey, but slowly, as though some unseen ham were tearing the sky like tissue paper, a faint red background was stealing into the picture, and even a little faint gold that came from God knows where flitted in and out upon the face of the river. Heavy black barges lay like ancient prehistoric beasts in the slime left now by the retreating tide. One little tug pushed desperately upstream as though it would force some energy into this dreaming, dying world. A revolutionary striving to stir the dim silences that watched from either bank into protest. The air was sharply cold, and there was a smell of smoke somewhere, also of tar and cabbage and mud. The red light pushed and pushed its way upwards. The silence emphasised, with rather a pleasing melancholy, Philip's loneliness. It seemed, down here, as though London were a dead city, and he only alive in it. Catherine, too, was alive somewhere. He looked and as in one's dreams absurdity tumbles upon the heels of absurdity, he saw her walking alone, coming, as yet without any recognition in her eyes, towards him. The world was dead, and he was dead, and Catherine let it stay so then. No, the world was alive. She had recognised him. She had smiled. The air was suddenly warm and pulsating with stir and sound. As she came up to him, he could think of nothing but the strange difference that his fortnight's absorption in her had made for him. His being with her now was as though he had arrived at some long-desired mecca after a desperate journey of dust and strain and peril. As he greeted her he felt, a fortnight ago we'd only just met, but now we've known each other for years and years and years, but perhaps she does not know that yet. But he knew, as she gave him her hand, that she felt a little awkwardness simply because she was so glad to see him, and she had never been awkward with him before. "'You've been hiding from us,' she said. Her cheeks were flaming because she had walked fast, because the air was frosty, because she was glad to see him. Her coat and muff were a little old-fashioned and not very becoming to her. All the more did he praise the beautiful kindliness of her eyes. "'I'm in love with you,' he wanted to say to her. "'Do you care that I am?' He turned at her side, and they faced together the reddening sky. The whole city lay in absolute silence about them, as though they were caught together into a ball of grey evening cloud. "'I haven't hidden,' he said, smiling. "'I came and called, but you were not there.' "'I heard,' she answered. "'Aunt Aggie said you were very agreeable and amusing. "'I hope you're happy in your rooms.' "'They're all right.' "'We miss you.' Father's always beginning to tell you something, and then finding that you're gone. Henry. Your mother. Ah, you were quite wrong about mother. You thought that she disliked you. You care too much, by the way, whether people like you or no. But mother's hard, perhaps, to get to know. You shocked and disturbed her a little, but she didn't dislike you. Although he had asserted so definitely that Mrs. Trenchard hated him, he had reassured himself in his own heart that she rather liked him. Now, when he saw, in spite of Catherine's words, that she really had disliked him, he felt a little shock of dismay. "'You may say what you like,' he said. "'I know. No, you don't understand. Mother is so absorbed by all of us. There are a great many of us, you know, that it takes a long time for her to realise anyone from outside. You were so much from outside. She was just beginning to realise you when you went away. We are all so much to her.' In a family as big as ours, there are always so many things. Of course, he said, I know. As to myself, it's natural enough. At present I miss Moscow, but that'll be all right soon. She came a little closer to him, and her eyes were so kindly that he looked down upon the ground, lest his own eyes should betray him. Look here, come to us whenever you like. 
"'Why all this time have you kept away? "'Wasn't it what you were always telling us about your friends in Moscow, "'that the houses were open to everyone always? "'You must miss that. "'Don't be lonely, whatever you do. "'There are ever so many of us, and some of us are sure to be in.' Uh, "'I will,' he said, stammering. "'I, I will.' "'Henry's always asking questions about Russia now. "'You've had a great effect upon him, "'and he wants you to tell him ever so much more. "'Then there's Milly. "'She hasn't seen you at all yet. "'You'll like her so much. "'There's Vincent coming back from Eton. "'Don't be lonely or homesick. "'I know how miserable it is.' "'They were in the square by the church outside her house. "'Above the grey solid building "'the sky had been torn into streaming clouds "'of red and gold.' He took her hand and held it, and suddenly, as she felt his pressure, the colour flooded her face. She strove to beat it down. She could not. She tried to draw her hand away, but her own body, as though it knew better than she, defied her. She tried to speak. No words would come. She tried to tell him with her eyes that she was indifferent, but her glance at him showed such triumph in his gaze that she began to tremble. Then he released her hand. She said nothing, only with quick steps hurried into the house. He stood there until she had disappeared, then he turned round towards his rooms. He strode down Victoria Street in such a flame of exultation as can flare this world into splendour only once or twice in a lifetime. It was the hour when the lights come out, and it seemed to him that he himself flung far, here, there, for all the world to catch now high into a lamp-post, now low beneath some basement window, now like a cracker upon some distant trees, now high, high into the very evening blue itself. The pavement, the broad street, the high mysterious buildings caught and passed the flame from one to another. An ancient newspaper man, ragged in a faded tail-coat, was shouting, "'Finals! Finals! All the finals!' But to Philip's ear he was saying, "'She cares for you! She cares for you!' "'Praise God! What a world it is!' He stumbled up the dark stairs of his house, past the door from whose crevices there stole always the scent of panchuli, past the door higher up, whence came, creeping up his stairs, the suggestion of beef and cabbage, into his own dark lodging. His sitting-room had its windows still open and its blinds still up. The lamp in the street below flung its squares of white light upon his walls, papers on his table were blowing in the evening breeze, and the noise of the town climbed up, looked in through the open windows, fell away again, climbed up again in an eternal indifferent urgency. He was aware that a man stood by the window, a wavering shadow was spread against the lighted wall. Philip stopped in the doorway. Hello, he said. Who's there? A figure came forward. Philip, to whom all the world was to-night a fantasy, stared for a moment at the large, bearded form without recognising it, wild and unreal as it seemed in the dim room. The man chuckled. "'Well, young man, I've come to call. I got here two minutes before you.' It was Uncle Tim, Mrs. Trenchard's brother, Timothy Fonder, Esquire. "'I beg your pardon,' said Philip. "'The room was dark, and, and as a matter of fact, I was thinking of something rather hard as I came in. Wait a minute. You shall have some light, tea, and a cigarette in a moment.' "'No, thanks.' Uncle Tim went back to the window again. "'No tea, no cigarette. I hate the first. The second's poisonous. I've got a pipe here, and don't light up. The room's rather pleasant like this. I expect it's hideous when one can see it.' Philip was astonished. He had liked Tim Fonder, but had decided that Tim Fonder was indifferent to him. Quite indifferent. For what had he come here? Sent by the family? Yes, he liked Uncle Tim he did not want him or anyone else in the world there just then. He desired to sit by the open window, alone, to think about Catherine, to worship Catherine. They both sat down, Fonder on the window seat, Philip nearby. The noise of the town was distant enough to make a pleasant rumbling accompaniment to their voices. The little dark public-house opposite, with its beery eye, a dim hanging lamp in the doorway, watched them. "'Well, how are you?' said Fonder. "'Lonely?' "'It was at first, said Philip, who found it immensely difficult to tie his thoughts to his visitor. "'And I hadn't been lonely for so long, not since my first days in Moscow.' "'They were lonely, then?' 
Oh, horribly. My first two months there were the worst hours in all my life. I wanted to learn Russian, so I kept away from English people. A Russian's difficult to pick up at first. Fonda made one of the rumbling noises in his throat that always testified to his interest. I like what you said over there at my sister's, he waved his hand, about Russia and about everything. I listened, although perhaps you didn't think it. I hope you're going to stick to it, young man. Stick to what? Your ideas about things. Everything's been for the best. There's a great time coming, and the trenchards are damn fools. But I never. Oh, yes, you did. You implied it. Nobody minded, of course, because the trenchards know so well that they're not. They don't bother what people think, bless them. Besides, you don't understand them in the least. Nor won't ever, I expect. But, said Philip, I, I really never thought for a moment. Don't be so afraid of hurting people's feelings. I liked your confidence. I liked your optimism. I just came this afternoon to see whether a fortnight alone had damped it a little. Philip hesitated. It would be very pleasant to say that no amount of personal trouble could alter his point of view. It would be very pleasant to say that the drearier his personal life was, the surer he was of his creed. He hesitated, then spoke the truth. As a matter of fact, I'm afraid it was dim for a bit. Russia seemed so far away, and so did England, and I was hanging in mid-air, between. But now everything's all right again. Why now? Because I've paid you a call. Uncle Timothy laughed. Philip looked down at the little public house. I'm very glad you have. But this afternoon it's been the kind of day I've expected London to give me. It seemed to settle me suddenly with a jerk, as though it were pushing me into my place and saying, There, now I've found a seat for you. He was talking, he knew, at random. But he was very conscious of Uncle Timothy, the more conscious, perhaps, because he could not see his face. Then he bent forward in his chair. It was very jolly of you, he said, to come and see me. But tell me frankly why you did. We scarcely spoke to one another whilst I was at your sister's house. I listened to you, though. Years ago I must have been rather like you. How old are you? Thirty. Well, when I was thirty I was an idealist. I was impatient of my family, although I loved them. I thought the world was going to do great things in a year or two. I believed most devoutly in the millennium. I grew older. I was hurt badly. I believed no longer, or thought I didn't. I determined that the only thing in life was to hold oneself absolutely aloof. I've done that ever since. I have forgotten all these years that I'd ever been like you. And then, when I heard once again the same things, the same beliefs... He broke off, lit his pipe, puffed furiously at it, and watched the white clouds sail into the night air. "'Whatever I have felt,' said Philip slowly, "'however I have changed, to-night I know that I am right. To-night I know that all I believed in my most confident hour is true.' The older man bent forward and put his hand on Philip's arm. "'Stick to that. Remember at least that you said it to me. If before I died there have been times. After the Boer War here in England it seemed that things were moving. There was new life, new blood, new curiosity. But then, I don't know, it takes so long to wake people up. You woke me up a little with your talk. You woke them all up, a little.' And if people like my sister and my brother-in-law, whom I love, mind you, wake up, why then it will be painful for them, but glorious for everyone else. Philip was more alarmed than ever. He had not at all wished to wake the trenchards up. He had only wanted them to like him. He was a little irritated and a little bored with Uncle Timothy. If only Mr. and Mrs. Trenchard allowed him to love Catherine, he did not care if they never woke up in all their lives. He felt, too, that he did not really fill the picture of the young, ardent enthusiast. He was bound, he knew, to disappoint Uncle Timothy. He would have liked to have taken him by the hand and said to him, "'Now, if only you will help me to marry Catherine, I will be as optimistic as you like for ever and ever.' But Uncle Tim was cleverer than Philip supposed. "'You're thinking, how tarsome! Here's this old man forcing me into a stained-glass window. Don't think like that.' I know you're an ordinary nice young fellow, just like anyone else. It's your age that's pleasant. 
I have lived very much alone all these years, at a little house I've got down in Glebeshire. You must come and see it. You're sure to stay with my sister there. She's only five minutes away. But I've been so much alone there that I've got into the habit of talking to myself. Philip at once loved Uncle Tim. I'm delighted that you came. If you'll let me be a friend of yours, I shall be most awfully proud. It was only that I didn't want you to expect too much of me. One gets into the way in Russia saying that things are going to be splendid because they're so bad. And really there they do want things to be better. And often I do think that there's going to be, one day, a new world. And many people now think about it and hope for it. Perhaps they always did. Uncle Timothy got up. That's all right, my son. We'll be friends. Come and see me. London's a bit of a forest. One can't make out always quite what's going on. You'll get to know all of us, and like us, I hope. Come and see me. Yes? Of course I will. I've got a dirty little room in Westminster, 14 Barton Street. I go down to Glebeshire for Christmas, thank God. Good night. He clumped away down the stairs. He stayed a very short time, and Philip felt vaguely that, in some way or another, Uncle Tim had been disappointed in him. For what had he come? What had he wanted? Had the family sent him? Was the family watching him? That sense that Philip had had during the early days in London suddenly returned. He felt, in the dark room, in the dark street, that the Trenchards were watching him. From the old man down to Henry they were watching him, waiting to see what he would do. Did Uncle Tim think that he loved Catherine? Had he come to discover that? Although it was early, the room was very cold and very dark. Philip knew that for an instant he was so afraid that he dared not look behind him. London's a forest. And Catherine. At the thought of her he rose, defied all the trenchards in the world, lit his lamp and pulled down the blinds. The smell of Uncle Tim's tobacco was very strong in the room. End of Book One, Chapter Four Book One, Chapter Five of The Green Mirror by Hugh Walpole. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Book One, Chapter Five The Finest Thing. When a stranger surveys the life of a family, it is very certain that the really determining factor in the development of that group of persons will escape his notice. For instance, in surveying the trench yard, Philip had disregarded Aunt Aggie. As this is a record of the history of a family, and not only of individuals, Aunt Aggie must be seriously considered. It was the first ominous mistake that Philip made that he did not seriously consider her. Agnes Trenchard, when quite a young girl, had been pretty in a soft and rounded manner. Two offers of marriage had been made to her, but she had refused these because she had a great sense of her destiny. From her first thinking moment she had considered herself very seriously. She had very high ideals. The finest thing in this world was a life of utter unselfishness, a life of noble devotion and martyred self-interest. She looked about her and could see no signs of such lives. All the more, then, was it clear that she was set apart to give the world such an example. Unfortunately, allied to this appreciation of a fine, self-sacrificing character was a nature self-indulgent, indolent, and suspicious. Could she be unselfish without trouble or loss, then how unselfish she would be? She liked the idea of it immensely. For some years she was pretty, sang a little, and obviously thought more than either of her sisters. People listened then to her creed, and believed in her intentions. She talked often of unselfishness, was always ready to do anything for anybody, and was always prevented or forestalled by less altruistic people. When, after her two offers of marriage, she stepped very quickly into the shape and colours of an old maid, went to live with her sister-in-law and brother, and formed habits, people listened to her less readily. She herself, however, quite unaware that at thirty-five, life for a woman is sexually either over or only just commencing, hoped to continue the illusions of her girlhood. The nobility of unselfishness appealed to her more than ever, but she found that the people around her were always standing in her way. She became, therefore, quite naturally, rather bitter. 
her round figure expressed, in defiance of its rotundity, peevishness. She had to account for her feelings in self-sacrificing altruism, and found it not in her own love of ease and dislike of effort, but completely in other people's selfishness. Had she been permitted, she would have been the finest trenchard alive, and how fine that was only a trenchard could know. But the world was in a conspiracy against her. The world, and especially her sister Elizabeth, whom she despised and bullied, but somewhere in her strange, suspicious crust of a heart, loved. That was, perhaps, the strangest thing about her, that in spite of her ill-humour, discontents and irritations, she really loved the family, and would like to have told it so, were she not continually prevented by its extraordinary habit of being irritating just when she felt most affectionate. She really did love them, and she would go down sometimes in the morning with every intention of saying so, but in five minutes they had destroyed that picture of herself which, during her absence from them, she had painted, for that, of course, she could not forgive them. In the mansion of the human soul there are many chambers. Aunt Aggie's contradictions were numberless. But on broad lines it may be said that her assurance of the injustice of her own fate was balanced only by her conviction of the good luck of everyone else. She hoped, perpetually, that they would all recognise this, namely that their life had treated them with the most wonderful good fortune. Her brother, George Trenchard, for instance, with his careless habits, his indifference to the facts of life, his obvious selfishness, what disasters he would, had he not been incredibly favoured, most surely have encountered. Aunt Aggie was afraid that he did not sufficiently realise this, and so, in order that he might offer up thanks to God, she reminded him, as often as was possible, of his failings. Thus, too, with the others. Even Catherine, for whom she cared deeply, betrayed at times a haughty and uplifted spirit, and frequently forestalled her aunt's intended unselfishness, thus in a way rebuking her aunt, a thing that a niece should never do. With this consciousness of her relation's failings went an insatiable curiosity. Aunt Aggie, because she was the finest character in the family, should be rewarded by the trust and confidence of the family. She must at any rate maintain the illusion that she received it. Did they keep her quiet with little facts and stories that were of no importance, she must make them important in order to support her dignity. She made them very important indeed. A great factor was her religion. She was, like her sister, a most sincere and devout member of the Church of England. She believed in God as revealed to her by relations and clergymen in the day of her baptism. Time and a changing world had done nothing to shake her confidence. But, unlike her sisters, she believed that this God existed chiefly as a friend and supporter of Miss Agnes Trenchard. He had no other duties and purposes, of course, but did not hide from her his especial interest in herself. The knowledge of this gave her great confidence. She was now fifty years of age, and believed that she was still twenty-five. That is not to say that she dressed as a young woman, or encouraged any longer the possibility of romantic affairs. It was simply that the interest and attraction that she offered to the world as a fine and noble character were the same as they had ever been. And if the world did not recognise this, that was because fine and noble characters were few and difficult to discover. One knew this because the Trenchard family offered so seldom an example of one, and the Trenchards were, of course, the finest people in England. She had great power with her relations because she knew so intimately their weaknesses. People on the whole may be said to triumph over those who believe in them and submit to those who don't. The Trenchards, because life was full and time was short, submitted to Aunt Aggie, and granted anything in order that they might not be made uncomfortable. They could not, however, allow her to abuse them, one to another, and would submit to much personal criticism before they permitted treachery. Their mutual affection was a very real factor in their lives. Aunt Aggie herself had her share in it. She possessed, nevertheless, a genius for creating discomfort or for promoting an already unsteady atmosphere. She was at her best when the family was at its worst, because then she could perceive quite clearly her own fine nobility. Philip Mark had made a grave mistake when he disregarded her. She had disliked Philip from the first. She had disapproved of the way that he had burst in upon the family just when she had been at her best in the presentation to her father. 
He had not known that she had been at her best, but then that was his fault. She had been ready to forgive this, however, if, in the days that followed, he had shown that he appreciated her. He had not shown this at all. He had, in fact, quite obviously preferred her sister Elizabeth. He had not listened to her with close attention when she talked to him about the nobility of unselfishness, and he displayed both irritation and immorality in his views of life. She had been shocked by the abruptness with which he rebuked Mr. Seymour, and she thought his influence on Henry was already as bad as it could be. It was, of course, only too characteristic of George that he should encourage the young man. She could see what her father and Aunt Sarah thought of him, and she could only say that she entirely shared their opinion. Philip's visit had upset her, and Milly's return from Paris upset her still more. She had never cared greatly about Milly, who had never shown her any deference or attention, but Milly had until now always been a trenchard. She had come back from Paris only half a trenchard. Aunt Aggie was grievously afraid that troublesome times were in store for them all. It was just at this point that her attention was directed towards Catherine. She always considered that Catherine knew her better than any other member of the family did, which simply meant that Catherine considered her feelings. Lately, however, Catherine had not considered her feelings. She had, on at least two occasions, been deliberately uncivil. Once, Aunt Aggie had suffered from neuralgia, and Catherine had promised to come and read her to sleep, and had forgotten to do so. Next morning, her neuralgia being better, Aunt Aggie said, "'I can't, dear Catherine, imagine myself under similar conditions, acting as you have done. I had a sleepless night. But, of course, you had more important duties.' And Catherine had scarcely apologised. On the second occasion, Aunt Aggie had breakfast. She was always bitter at breakfast, mildly unhappy over her porridge, and violently sarcastic by marmalade time, had remarked with regret that Milly, who was late, had picked up these sad habits abroad. She had never known anyone the finer, whether in character or manners, for living abroad. Here was a little dust flung at the inoffensive person of Philip, now silently asleep in Jermyn Street. At once Catherine was in a flurry. What right had Aunt Aggie to say so? How could she tell? It might be better if one went abroad more, lost some of one's prejudices. Quite a little scene, very unlike Catherine. Aunt Aggie did not forget. Like some scientist or mathematician, happily let loose into some new theory or problem, so now did she consider Catherine. Catherine was different. Catherine was restless and out of temper. She had been so ever since Philip Mark's visit. With her sewing or her book, Aunt Aggie sat in a corner by the drawing-room fire, and watched, and waited. Upon that afternoon that had seen Catherine's meeting with Philip by the river, Aunt Aggie had been compelled to have tea alone. That had been annoying, because it looked as though the gay world was inviting everyone except Aunt Aggie to share in its excitements and pleasures. At last there arrived Mrs. Trenchard and Milly, and finally Catherine. Aunt Aggie had sat in her warm corner, pursuing with her needle the green tail of an unnatural parrot which she was working into a slowly developing cushion cover, and had considered her grievances. It had been a horrible day, cold and gloomy. Aunt Aggie had a chilblain that, like the Watts, always appeared about Christmas, and unlike them, stayed on well into the spring. It had made its appearance, for the first time this season, during the past night. Milly talked a great deal about very little, and Mrs. Trenchard received her remarks with the nonchalant indifference of a croupier raking in the money at Monte Carlo. Catherine sat staring into the fire and saying nothing. Aunt Aggie, watching her, felt quite suddenly as though the firelight had leapt from some crashing coal into a flaring splendour, that something strange and unusual was with them in the room. She was not at all, like her sister Elizabeth, given to romantic and sentimental impressions. She seldom read novels, and cared nothing for the theatre. What she felt now was really unpleasant and uncomfortable, as though she had soap in her eyes, or dropped her collection under the seat during the litany. The room positively glowed, the dim shadows were richly coloured, and in Aunt Aggie's heart was alarm and agitation. She stared about her. She looked about the room and pierced the shadows. She sewed a wrong stitch into the parrot's tail, and then decided that it was Catherine's eyes. She looked at the girl. 
She looked again and again, saw her bending forward a little, her hands pressed together on her lap, her breast rising and falling with the softest suspicion of some agitation. And in her eyes such a light as could come from no fire, no flame from without, but only from the very soul itself. Catherine's good-tempered, humorous eyes, so charged with common sense, affectionate but always mild, unagitated, calm, like her mother's. Now what was one to say? Aunt Aggie said nothing. Her own heart felt for an instant some response. She would have liked to have taken the girl into her arms and kissed her and petted her. In a moment the impulse passed. What was the matter with Catherine? Who was the matter with Catherine? It was almost improper that any one should look like that in a drawing-room that had witnessed so much good manners. Moreover, it was selfish, this terrible absorption. If Catherine began to think of herself, whatever would happen to them all? And there were Milly and her mother, poor things, chattering blindly together. Aunt Aggie felt that the business of watching over this helpless family did indeed devolve upon her. From that moment Catherine, and the things that were possibly happening to Catherine, never left her thoughts. She was happier than she had been for many months. But Catherine, in the days that followed, gave her curiosity no satisfaction. Aunt Aggie dated in future years all the agitation that was so shortly to sweep down upon the Trenchard waters from that afternoon when Catherine's eyes had seemed so strange. But her insistence on that date did not at all mean that it was then that Catherine invited her aunt's confidence. Aunt Aggie was compelled to drive on her mysterious way alone. She was now assured that something was the matter, but the time had not yet arrived when all the family was concerned in it. In any case, to begin with, what was her sister-in-law Harriet Trenchard thinking? No one ever knew what Harriet Trenchard thought, and foolish and hasty observers said that that was because Harriet Trenchard never thought at all. Aggie Trenchard was neither foolish nor hasty. She was afraid of Harriet because, after all these years, she knew nothing about her. She had never penetrated that indifferent stolidity. Harriet had never spoken to her intimately about anything, nor had Harriet once displayed any emotions, whether of surprise or anger, happiness or grief, but Agnes was penetrating enough to fear that brooding quiet. At least Aggie knew her sister-in-law well enough to realise that her children were an ever-present, ever-passionate element in her life. On certain occasions, concerning Milly, Catherine, Henry or Vincent, Aggie had seen that silence for a moment quiver, as a still lake trembles with a sudden shake or roll when the storm is raging across the hills. Especially was Catherine linked to her mother's most intimate hold upon life, even though the words that they exchanged were of the most commonplace. Aunt Aggie knew that, and strangely, obscurely, she was moved at times to sudden impulses of bitter jealousy. Why was it that no one cared for her as Catherine cared for her mother? What was there in Harriet to care for? And yet, nevertheless, Aggie Trenchard loved her sister-in-law. With regard to this present business, Aggie knew with sufficient assurance that Harriet disliked Philip Mark, had disliked him from the first. Had Harriet noticed this change in her daughter, and had she drawn her conclusions? What would Harriet say if— Aunt Aggie added stitches to the green parrot's tail with every comfortable assurance that, in a time or two, there would be plenty of trouble. Ultimately, through it all, it was her jealousy that moved her, and her jealousy that provoked the first outburst. Instantly, without warning, new impulses, new relationships, new motives were working amongst them all, and their world was changed. Upon an afternoon, Aunt Aggie hearing that Henry wished to change a novel at Mudie's library, that very novel that he had been reading on the day of Philip's arrival, offered to take it for him. This was at luncheon, and she felt, because she liked her food and barley water, a sudden impulse towards the ideal unselfishness. She made her offer, and then reflected that it would be very troublesome to go so far as Oxford Street. She therefore allowed Catherine to accept the mission, retaining at the same time her own nobility. She became quite angry. "'Of course,' she said, "'you consider me too old to do anything. To sit in a corner and sew is all I'm good for. Well, well, you'll be older with yourself one day, Catherine, my dear. I should have liked to have helped Henry. However—' She was conscious during the afternoon of some injustice. She had been treated badly. 
At dinner that night Rocket forgot the footstool that was essential to her comfort. She was compelled at last to ask him for it. He had never forgotten it before. They all thought her an old woman who didn't matter. No one troubled now about her. Well, they should see. Great Aunt Sarah was, as often happened to her, rheumatic but spartan in bed. The ladies, when they left the dining-room and closed around the drawing-room fire, were Mrs. Trenchard, Aunt Aggie, Aunt Betty, Catherine, and Milly. Happy and comfortable enough they looked, with the shadowed, dusky room behind them and the blaze in front of them. In the world outside it was a night of intense frost. Here they were reflected in the mirror. Mrs. Trenchard's large gold locket, Henry as a baby inside it, Aggie's plump neck and black silk dress, Aunt Betty's darting, sparkling eyes, Minnie's lovely shoulders, Catherine's rather dumpy ones. There they all were, right inside the mirror, with a reflected fire to make them cosy, and the walls ever so thick and old. The freezing night could not touch them. "'Rocket's getting very old and careless,' said Aggie. Everyone had known that Aunt Aggie was out of temper this evening, and everyone therefore was prepared for a tiresome hour or two. Rocket was a great favourite. Mrs. Trenchard, her arms folded across her bosom, her face the picture of placid content, said, "'Oh, Aggie, do you think so? I don't.' "'No, of course you don't, Harriet,' answered her sister sharply. "'He takes care with you. Of course he does. But if you consider your sister sometimes—' "'My dear Aggie,' Mrs. Trenchard, as she spoke, bent forward and very quietly picked up a bright green silk thread from the carpet. "'Oh, I'm not complaining.' That's a thing I don't believe in. After all, if you think Rocket's perfection, I've no more to say. I want others to be comfortable. For myself, I care nothing. It is for the rest of the family. We're quite comfortable, Aunt Aggie, thank you, said Milly, laughing. I hope you don't think, Harriet, said Aggie, disregarding her niece, that I'm complaining. I— Mrs. Trenchard leant towards her, holding out the thread of green silk. That must be from your silks, Aggie, dear, she said. It's just the colour of your parrot's tail. I couldn't think what it was lying there on the carpet. It was then that Catherine, who had paid no attention to this little conversation, but had followed her own thoughts, said, Oh, how careless of me! I never took Henry's book after all, and I went right up Oxford Street too. This was unfortunate, because it reminded Aunt Aggie of something that she had very nearly forgotten. Of course Catherine had never intended to take the book, she had simply offered to do so because she thought her aunt old, feeble, and incapable. "'Really, Catherine,' said Aunt Aggie, "'you might have let me take it, after all. I may be useless in most ways, and not worth anyone's consideration, but at least I am still able to walk up Oxford Street in safety.' Her aunt's tones were so bitter that Catherine looked across at her in some dismay. Aunt Betty did not assist the affair by saying, "'Why, Aggie, dear, who ever supposed you couldn't?' "'I'm sure you could do anything you want to.' "'Well, perhaps next time,' Aunt Aggie said sharply. "'When I offer some help, someone will listen to me. "'I should not have forgotten the book.' "'I can't think why I did,' said Catherine. "'I remembered it just before I started, and then something happened.' Aunt Aggie looked about her, and thought that this would be a very good opportunity for discovering the real state of Catherine's mind. "'You must take care, Catherine, dear,' she said. You don't seem to me to have been quite yourself lately. I've noticed a number of little things. You're tired, I think. Catherine laughed. Well, why should I be? I've had nothing to make me. It was then that Aunt Aggie caught a look of strange, almost furtive anxiety in Harriet's eyes. Following this, for the swiftest moment, Catherine and her mother exchanged a gleam of affection, of reassurance, of confidence. Ah, thought Aunt Aggie. They're laughing at me. Everyone's laughing at me. My dear Catherine, she snapped, I'm sure I don't know what tired you, but I think you must realise what I mean. You are not your normal self, and if your old aunt may say so, that's a pity. Milly, looking across at her sister, was astonished to see the colour rising in her cheeks. Catherine was annoyed. Catherine minded Aunt Aggie. Catherine, who was never out of temper, never perturbed. And at Aunt Aggie... "'Really, Aunt Aggie,' Catherine said, "'it's very tiresome if all the family are going to watch one day and night "'as though one were something from the zoo. "'Tiresome is not nearly strong enough.' "'Her aunt smiled bitterly. 
"'It's only my affection for you,' she said. "'But of course you don't want that. Why should you? One day, however, you may remember that someone once cared whether you were tired or not.' Aunt Aggie's hands trembled on her lap. Catherine shook her head impatiently. "'I am very grateful for your kindness, but I'd much rather be left alone. I'm not tired, nor odd, nor anything. So please don't tell me that I am.' Aggie rose from her chair, and very slowly, with trembling fingers, drew her work together. "'I think,' she said, her voice quivering a little, "'that I'll go to bed. Next time you wish to insult me, Catherine, I'd rather you did it when we were alone.' A very slow and stately figure, she walked down the drawing-room, and disappeared. There was a moment's silence. "'Oh, dear!' cried Catherine. "'I'm so sorry!' She looked round upon them all, and saw quite clearly that they were surprised at her. Again, behind Mrs. Trenchard's eyes, there hovered that suspicion of anxiety. "'What did I do? What did I say? Aunt Aggie's so funny!' Then, as still they did not answer, she turned round upon them. "'Have I been cross and tiresome lately? Have you all noticed? Tell me.' Aunt Becky said, "'No, dear, of course not.' Minnie said, "'What does it matter what Aunt Aggie says?' Mrs. Trenchard said, "'There's another of Aggie's green threads. Under your chair, Millie, dear. I'd better go up and see whether she wants anything.' But Catherine rose, and standing for an instant with a little half-smile, half-frown, surveying them, moved then slowly away from them down the room. "'No, I'll go, mother, and apologise. I suppose I was horrid.' She left them. She went up through the dark passages slowly, meditatively. She waited for a moment outside her aunt's door, and then knocked. Heard then her aunt's voice, "'Come in!' in tones that showed she had been expecting some ambassador. Catherine stood by the door, then moved forward, put her arms about Aunt Aggie, and kissed her. "'I'm so sorry. I'm afraid that I hurt you. You know that I didn't mean to.' Upon Aunt Aggie's dried cheeks there hovered a tiny cold and glassy tear. She drew back from Catherine's embrace, then with a strange, almost feverish movement, caught Catherine's hand. "'It wasn't my dear that you hurt me. I expect I'm too sensitive. That has always been my misfortune. But I felt—' Another glassy tear now upon the other cheek. "'That you and Millie are finding me tiresome now.' "'Aunt Aggie, of course not.' I wish to be of some use. It is my continual prayer, some use to someone. And you make me feel—but of course you are young and impatient—that I'd be better out, perhaps out of the way." Catherine answered her very gravely. "'If I've ever made you feel that for a moment, Aunt Aggie, there's nothing too bad for me. But how can you say such a thing? Aren't you a little unjust?' The two tears had disappeared. "'I dare say I am, my dear. I dare say I am.' or seem so to you. Old people often do to young ones. But I'm not unjust, I think, in fancying that you yourself have changed lately. I made you angry when I said that just now, but I felt it my duty." Catherine was silent. Aunt Aggie watched her with bright, inquisitive eyes, from which tears were now very far away. "'Well, we won't say any more, dear. My fault, perhaps, is that I am too anxious to do things for others and so may seem to you young ones interfering. I don't know, I'm sure. It has always been my way. I am glad indeed when you tell me that nothing is the matter. To my old eyes it seems that ever since Mr. Mark stayed here the house has not been the same. You have not been the same. Mr. Mark? Catherine's voice was sharp, then suddenly dropped, and after an instant's silence was soft. You've got Mr. Mark on the brain, Aunt Aggie. Well, my dear, I didn't like him. I'm sure he was very bad for Henry. But then I'm old-fashioned, I suppose. Mr. Mark shocked me, I confess. Russia must be a very wild country." Then, for a space, they looked at one another. Catherine said nothing. Only her cheeks flushed, her breath coming sharply, stared into the mirror on the dressing-table. Aunt Aggie faced in this silence something alarming and uneasy. It was as though they were, both of them, listening for some sound but the house was very still. "'I think I'll go to bed, my dear. Kiss me, Catherine. Don't forget that I'm older than you, dear. I know something of the world. Yes. Good night, my dear.' They embraced. Catherine left the room, 
Her cheeks were flaming, her body seemed wrapped in dry, scorching heat. She hurried, her heart beating so loudly that it seemed to her to fill the passage with sound, into her own room. She did not switch on the electric light, but stood there in the darkness, the room very cool and half-shadowed. Some reflected outside light made a pool of grey twilight upon the floor, and just above this pool Catherine stood, quite motionless, her head raised, her hands tightly clasped together. She knew. That moment in her aunt's room had told her. She was lifted by one instant of glorious revelation, out of herself, her body, her life, and caught up into her divine heaven, could look down upon that other arid, mordant world with eyes of incredulous happiness. She loved Philip Mark. She had always loved him. She had never loved anyone before. She thought that life was enough with its duties, its friendships, its little pleasures and little sorrows. She had never lived. She was born now here in the still security of her room. The clocks were striking ten, the light on the carpet quivered. Dimly she could see her books, her bed, her furniture. Some voice, very far away, called her name, waited and then called again, called the old Catherine, who was dead now, dead and gone, buried in Aunt Aggie's room. The new Catherine had powers, demands, values, insistences, of which the old Catherine had never dreamed. Catherine, at this instant, asked herself no questions. Whether he loved her, what the family would say, how she herself would face a new world, why it was that through all these weeks she had not known that she loved him? She asked herself nothing, only waited, motionless, staring in front of her. Then suddenly her heart was so weighed down with happiness that she was utterly weary. Her knees trembled, her hands wavered as though seeking some support. She turned, fell down on her knees beside the bed, her face sank deep in her hands, and so remained, thinking of nothing, conscious of nothing, her spirit bathed in an intensity of overwhelming joy. She recovered instantly in the days that followed, her natural sweetness. She was, as all the household, with relief, discovered, the real Catherine again. She did not to herself seem to have any existence at all. The days in this early December were days of frost, red skies, smoking leaves, and hovering silver mists that clouded the chimneys, made the sun a remotely yellow ball, shot sunset and sunrise with all rainbow colours. Beautiful days. She passed through them with no consciousness of herself, her friends, not even of Philip. No thought of anything was possible. Only that breathless, burning heartbeat, the thickness of her throat, a strange heat and then sudden cold about her face, the vision of everyone near her as ghosts who moved many, many worlds away. Her daily duties were performed by someone else, some kindly, considerate, sensible person, who saw that she was disturbed and preoccupied. She watched this kind person, and wondered how it was that the people about her did not notice this. At night, for many hours, she lay there, thinking of nothing, feeling the beating of her heart, wrapped in a glorious ecstasy of content. Then, suddenly soothed as though by some anaesthetic, she would sleep, dumbly, dreamlessly, heavily. For a week this continued. Then Philip came to dinner, scarcely a dinner party, although it had solemnity. The only invited guests were Philip, Rachel Seddon, her fat uncle, Lord John Beminster, and an ancient Trenchard cousin. Lord John was fat, shining, and happy. Having survived with much complacency the death of his mother, the Duchess of Rex, and the end of the Beminster grandeur, he led a happy bachelor existence in a little house behind Shepherd's Market. He was the perfect symbol of good temper, good food, and a good conscience. Deeply attached to his niece Rachel, he had otherwise many friends, many interests, many happinesses, all of a small, bird-like, amiable character. He bubbled with relief, because he was not compelled any longer to sustain the Beminster character. He had beautiful white hair, rosy cheeks, and perfect clothes. He often dined at the Trenchards' house with Rachel. He called himself Roddy's Apology. The Trenchards liked him because he thought very highly of the Trenchards. He sat beside Catherine at dinner and chattered to her. 
Philip sat on her side of the table, and she could not see him. But when he had entered the drawing-room earlier in the evening, the sudden sight of him had torn aside as though with a fierce, almost revengeful gesture, all the mists, the unrealities, the glories that had during the last weeks surrounded her. She saw him, and instantly, as though with a fall into icy water, was plunged into her old world again. He looked at her, she thought, as he would look at a stranger. He did not care for her. He had not even thought about her. Why had she been so confident during all these strange days? Her one longing now was to avoid him. With a great effort she drove her common sense to her service, talked to him for a moment or two with her customary quiet, half-humorous placidity, and went into dinner. She heard his voice now and then. He was getting on well with Rachel. They would become great friends. Catherine was glad. Dinner was interminable. Lord John babbled and babbled and babbled. Dinner was over. The ladies went into the drawing-room. "'I like your friend, Katie,' said Rachel. "'He's interesting.' "'I'm glad you do,' said Catherine. The men joined them. Philip was conveyed by Mrs. Trenchard to the ancient Trenchard cousin, who had a bony face and an eager, unsatisfied eye. Philip devoted himself to these. Catherine sat and talked to anyone. She was so miserable that she felt that she had never known before what to be miserable was. Then, when she was wondering whether the evening would ever end, she looked up across the room. Philip, from his corner, also looked up. Their eyes met, and at that moment the fire, hitherto decorously confined behind its decent bounds, ran golden, brilliant, about the room, up to the ceiling, crackling, flaming. The people in the room faded, disappeared. There was no furniture there. The bookcases, the chairs, the tables were gone. The mirror, blazing with light, burning with some strange heat, shone down upon chaos. Only, through it all, Catherine and Philip were standing, their eyes shining, for all to see, and heaven let loose upon a dead, dusty world, poured recklessly its glories upon them. "'I was saying,' said Lord John, "'that it's these young fellows who think they can shoot and can't "'who are doing all the harm.' "'Slowly, very slowly, Catherine's soul retreated within its fortresses again. "'Slowly the fires faded. Heaven was withdrawn. "'For a moment she closed her eyes, "'then once more she regarded Lord John. "'Oh, God, I'm so happy!' something within her was saying. I shall be absurd and impossible in a moment if I can't do something with my happiness. She was saved by the ancient cousins deciding that it was late. She always ended an evening party by declaring that it was later than she could ever have supposed. She was followed by Rachel, Lord John, and Philip. When Philip and Catherine said good-bye, their hands scarcely touched, but they were burning. I will come to-morrow afternoon, he whispered. Yes, she whispered back to him. Through the history of that old Westminster house there ran the thread of many of such moments. Now it could not be surprised, nor even so greatly stirred, whispering through its passages and corridors. Here it is again, pleasant enough for the time. I wish them luck, poor dears, but I've never known its answer. This new breath, out through my rafters, up through my floors, down my chimneys, in at my windows— just the same as it used to be. Very pleasant while it lasts. Poor young things. It was only natural that the house, long practised in the affairs of men, should perceive these movements in advance of the Trenchard family. As to warning the Trenchards, that was not the house's business. It was certainly owing to no special virtue of perception that Aunt Aggie decided that she would spend the afternoon of the day following the dinner-party in the drawing-room. This decision was owing to the physical fact that she fancied that she had a slight cold, and the spiritual one that her sister Harriet had said, Would she mind being most unselfish? Would she stay in and receive callers, as she, Harriet, was compelled to attend an unfortunate committee? There was nothing that Aunt Aggie could have preferred to sitting close to the drawing-room fire, eating muffin, if alone, and being gracious were their company. However, Harriet had said that it would be unselfish, therefore unselfish it was. Catherine, it appeared, 
also intended to stay at home. "'You needn't, my dear,' said Aunt Aggie. "'I promised your mother. I'd rather looked forward to going to the Miss A. Fonders. But never mind, I promised your mother.' "'I'm sure it's better for your cold that you shouldn't go out,' said Catherine. "'I think you ought to be upstairs, in bed with a hot bottle.' "'My cold's nothing,' Aunt Aggie's voice was sharp. "'Certainly the Miss at Fonders wouldn't have hurt it. I could have gone in a cab. But I promised your mother. It's a pity. They always have music on their second Fridays. Alice plays the violin very well. And I dare say, after all, no one will come this afternoon. You need really needn't bother to stay in, Catherine.' "'I think I will to-day.' said Catherine, quietly. So aunt and niece sat, one on each side of the fire, waiting. Catherine was very quiet, and Aunt Aggie, who, like all self-centred people, was alarmed by silence, spun a little web of chatter round and round the room. It was all quite pleasant last night, I thought. I must say Lord John can make himself very agreeable, if he pleases. How do you think Rachel was looking? I wanted to ask her about Michael, who had a nasty little cold last week, but Mr. Mark quite absorbed her, talking about his Russia, I suppose. I don't suppose anyone will come this afternoon. The very last thing Claire Fonder said on Sunday was, Mind you come on Friday, we've got some special music on Friday, and I know you'll like it. But of course one must help your mother when one can. Your Aunt Betty would take one of her walks. Walking in London seemed to be such an odd thing to do. If everyone walked, what would the poor cabmen and buses do? One must think of others, especially with the cold weather coming on. Her voice paused, and then dropped. She looked sharply across at Catherine, and realised that the girl had not been listening. She was staring up into the mirror. In her eyes was the look of burning, dreamy expectation that had on that other afternoon been so alarming. At that moment Rocket opened the door, and announced Philip Mark. Catherine's eyes met Philip's for an instant, then they travelled to Aunt Aggie. That lady rose with the little tremor of half-nervous, half-gratified greeting that she always bestowed on a guest. She disliked Mr. Mark cordially, but that was no reason why the memory of an hour or two filled with close attention from a young man should not brighten tomorrow's reminiscences. She was conscious also that she was keeping guard over Catherine. Not for an instant would she leave that room until Mr. Mark had also left it. She looked at the two young people. Catherine flushed with the fire, Philip flushed with the frosty day, and regarded with satisfaction their distance one from the other. Tea was brought. Life was very civilised. The doors were all tightly closed. Philip had come with the determined resolve of asking Catherine to marry him. Last night he had not slept. With a glorious Catherine at his side he had paced his room, his soul in the stars, his body somewhere underground. All day he had waited for a decent hour to arrive. He had almost run to the house. Now he was faced by Aunt Aggie. As he smiled at her, he could have taken her little body, her bundle of clothes, her dried little soul, crunched it to nothing in his hands, and flung it into the fire. Although he gave no sign of outward dismay, he was raging with impatience. He would not look at Catherine, lest, borne upon some wave of passion stronger than he, he should have rushed across the room, caught her to his side, and so defied all the Trenchard decencies. He knew that it was wiser, at present, to preserve them. They talked about Rachel Seddon. Dinner parties, cold weather, dancing, exercises, growing stout, biscuits, the best church in London, choirs, committees, Aunt Aggie's duties, growing thin, sleeplessness, Aunt Aggie's trials, chilblains, cold weather. At this renewed appearance of the weather, Philip noticed an old calf-bound book lying upon a little table at his side. Behind his eyes there flashed the discovery of an idea. "'Pride and Prejudice,' he said. "'Oh!' cried Catherine. "'That's one of Father's precious Jane Austen's, a first edition. He keeps them all locked up in his study. Henry must have borrowed that one. They're never allowed to lie about.' Philip picked it up. From between the old leaves, brown a little now, with the black print sunk deep into their very heart, there stole a scent of old age, old leather, old tobacco, old fun, and wisdom. Philip had opened it where Mr. Collins, proposing to Elizabeth Bennet, declined to accept her refusal. "'I'm not now to learn,' replied Mr. Collins, with a formal wave of the hand, 
that it is usual with young ladies to reject the addresses of the man whom they secretly mean to accept when he first applies for their favour, and that sometimes the refusal is repeated a second or even a third time. I am therefore by no means discouraged by what you have just said, and shall hope to lead you to the altar ere long. Upon my word, sir, cried Elizabeth, your hope is rather an extraordinary one after my declaration. I do assure you that I am not one of those young ladies, if such young ladies there are, who are so daring as to risk their happiness on the chance of being asked a second time. I am perfectly serious in my refusal. You could not make me happy, and I am convinced that I am the last woman in the world who would make you so. Nay, were your friend Lady Catherine to know me, I am persuaded she would find me in every respect ill-qualified for the situation. Well, it's certain that Lady Catherine would think so, said Mr. Collins, very gravely, but I cannot imagine that her ladyship would at all disprove of you. And you may be certain that when I have the honour of seeing her again, I shall speak in the highest terms of your modesty, economy, and other amiable qualifications. Pride and prejudice, I always thought, said Aunt Aggie, with amiable approval, a very pretty little tale. It's many years since I read it. Father read it aloud to us, I remember, when we were girls. Philip turned a little from her, as though he would have the light more directly over his shoulder. He had taken a piece of paper from his pocket, and in an instant he had written in pencil, I love you. Will you marry me, Philip? This he slipped between the pages. He knew that Catherine had watched him. Very gravely he passed the book across to her. Then he turned to Aunt Aggie, and with a composure that surprised himself, paid her a little of the deference that she needed. Catherine, with hands that trembled, had opened the book. She found the piece of paper, saw the words, and then in a sort of dreaming bewilderment read to the bottom of the old printed page. Mr. Collins thus addressed her. When I do myself the honour of speaking to you next on this subject, I shall hope to receive a more favourable answer than you have now given me, though I am far from accusing you of cruelty at present, because I know it to be the established custom of your sex to reject a man on the first. She did not turn the page. For a moment she waited, her mind quite empty of any concentrated thought, her eyes seeing nothing but the shining, glittering expanse of the mirror. Very quickly, using a gold pencil that hung on to her watch-chain, she wrote below his name, Yes, Catherine. Let me see the book, my dear, said Aunt Aggie. You must know, Mr. Bark, that I care very little for novels. There is so much to do in this world, so many people that need care, so many things that want attention, that I think one is scarcely justified in spending the precious time over stories. But I owe Miss Austin is a memory, a really precious memory to me. Those little simple stories have their charm still, Mr. Mark? Yes. And thank you, my dear. She took the book from Catherine, and began very slowly to turn over the pages, bending upon Miss Austin's labours exactly the look of kindly patronage that she would have bent upon that lady herself had she been present. Catherine glanced at Philip, half rose in her chair, and then sat down again. She felt, as she waited for the dreadful moment to pass, a sudden perception of the family. Until this moment they had not occurred to her. She saw her mother, her father, her grandfather, her aunts, Henry, Milly. Let this affair be suddenly flung upon them as a result of Aunt Aggie's horrified discovery, and the tumult would be indeed terrible. The silence in the room during those moments almost forced her to cry out. Had Philip not been there, she would have rushed to her aunt, torn the book from her hands, and surrendered to the avalanche. Aunt Aggie paused. She peered forward over the page. With a little cry Catherine stood up, her knees trembling, her eyes dimmed, as though the room were filled with fog. "'I doubt very much,' said Aunt Aggie, "'whether I could read it now. It would seem strangely old-fashioned, I dare say, I'm sure, to a modern young man like yourself, Mr. Mark.' Philip took the book from her. He opened it, read Catherine's answer, laid the volume very carefully upon the table. "'I can assure you, Miss Trenchard,' he said, "'a glance is enough to assure me that Pride and Prejudice is, and always will be, my favourite novel.' Catherine moved to the table, picked up the book, and slipped the paper from the leaves into her belt. For an instant her hand touched Philip's. Aunt Aggie looked at them, and satisfied with hot tea, a fire, a perfect conscience, and a sense of her real importance in the business of the world, 
thought to herself. "'Well, this afternoon, at any rate, those two have had no chance.' She was drowsy and anxious for a little rest before dinner. But her guard, she assured herself with a pleasant little bit of conscious self-sacrifice, should not be relaxed. Eleven had boomed that night from the abbey clock, when Philip Mark took his stand opposite the old house, looking up, as all the lovers in fiction and most of the lovers in real life have done, at his mistress' window. A little red glow of light was there. The frosty night had showered its sky with stars, frozen into the blue itself in this clear air, a frozen sea. An orange moon scooped into a dazzling curve, lay like a sail that had floated from its vessel, idly above the town. The plane trees rustled softly once and again, as though, now that the noise of men had died away, they might whisper in comfort together. Sometimes a horn blew from the river, or a bell rang. Philip waited there, and worshipped with all the humility and reverence of a human soul at the threshold of love. The lights in the house went out. Now all the trenchards were lying upon their backs, their noses towards the ceilings, the ceilings that shut off that starry sky. They were very secure, fenced round by Westminster. No danger could threaten their strong fortress. Their very dreams were winged about with security. Their happy safety was penetrated by no consciousness of that watching, motionless figure. End of Book One Chapter 5Book One, Chapter Six of The Green Mirror by Hugh Walpole. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Book One, Chapter Six The Shock. George Trenchard's study expressed very pleasantly his personality. The room's walls were of a deep, warm red, and covering three sides ran high bookcases with glass fronts. Within these bookcases were beautiful new editions ugly old ones, books for the greater part relating to his favourite period, all ranged and ordered with the most delicate care. The windows of the room were tall and bright, even on dull and foggy days, the carpet soft and thick, the leather chairs large and yielding, the fireplace wide and shining. Most significant of all was his writing-table. Upon this lay everything that any writer could possibly desire, from the handsomest of gold inkstands to the minutest of elastic bands. There was also here a little bust of Sir Walter Scott. Within this room George Trenchard knew always perfect happiness. A very exceptional man indeed that he could know it so easily. He knew it by the simple expedient of shutting off entirely from his consciousness the rest of mankind. His study door once closed, he forgot his family absolutely. No one was allowed to disturb or interrupt him. It was understood that he was at work upon a volume that would ultimately make another of that series that contained already such well-known books as William Wordsworth and His Circle, Hazlitt, The Man and His Letters, and The Life of Thomas de Quincey. These had appeared a number of years ago. He had it been indeed a young man when he had written them. It was supposed that a work entitled The Lake Poets, A Critical Survey would appear next autumn. For some time now the literary schemes of the weekly journals had announced this. George Trenchard only laughed at inquiries. "'Takes a damn long time, you know,' he said. "'Tisn't any use rushing the thing.' He enjoyed, however, immensely, making notes. From half-past nine in the morning until half-past one, behind his closed doors, he considered the early nineteenth century, found it admirable. Scott seemed to him the perfect type. Took first one book, then another from his bookshelves, wrote a few lines, and before his far imagined the trenchards of that period, considered their food and their drink, their morals, their humour, and their literature. Hazlitt's essay seemed to him the perfection, not of English prose, but of a temporal and spiritual attitude. "'Hang it all,' he would conclude. "'We're a rotten lot nowadays.' He did not worry over this conclusion, but it gave him the opportunity of a superior attitude during the rest of the day when he joined the world. "'If you knew as much about the early nineteenth century as I do,' he seemed to say, "'you wouldn't be so pleased with yourselves.' He did not, however, express his superiority in any unpleasant manner. 
there was never any one more amiable. All that he wanted was that everyone should be happy, and to be that, he had long ago discovered, one must not go too deep. Keep out of close relationships and you're safe, might be considered his advice to young people. He had certainly avoided them all his life, and avoided them by laughing at them. He couldn't abide gloomy fellows, and on no account would he allow a scene. He had never lost his temper. During the months that he spent at his place in Glebeshire, he pursued a plan identically similar. He possessed an invaluable factotum, a certain James Ritchie, who took everything in a way of management off his hands. Ritchie in Glebeshire, Mrs. Trenchard and Rocket in London. Life was made very simple for him. As has been said elsewhere, Catherine, alone of his family, had in some degree penetrated his indifferent jollity. That was because she really did seem to him to have some of the early nineteenth-century characteristics. She seemed to him, he did not know her very well, tranquil, humorous, unadventurous, but determined. She reminded him of Elizabeth Bennet, and he always fancied, he regarded her, of course, from a distance, that she would make a very jolly companion. She seemed to him wiser than the others, with a little strain of satirical humour in her comment on things that pleased him greatly. "'She should have been the boy, and only the girl,' he would say. He thought Henry a terrible ass. He was really anxious that Catherine should be happy. She deserved it, he thought, because she was a little wiser than the others. He considered sometimes her future, and thought that it would be agreeable to have her always about the place, but she must not be an old maid. She was too good for that. "'She beat a good stock,' he would say. "'She must marry a decent fellow. One day.' He delighted in the gentle postponement of possibly charming climaxes. His size, geniality, and good appetite may be attributed very largely to his happy gifts of procrastination. "'Always leave until tomorrow what ought to be done to-day,' had made him the best-tempered of men. After luncheon on the day that followed Philip's tea with Aunt Aggie, George Trenchard retired to his study to finish a chapter. He intended to finish it in his head rather than upon paper, and it was even possible that a nap would postpone the conclusion. He lit his pipe, and preferred to be comfortable. It was then that Rocket informed him that Mr. Mark had called, wished to see him alone, would not keep him long, apologised, but it was important. "'Why the devil couldn't he come to lunch? What a time to appear!' But Trenchard liked Philip. Philip amused him. He was so alive, and talked such ridiculous nonsense. Of course he would see him. Then, when Trenchard saw Philip Mark standing inside the room, waiting, with a smile half nervous, half friendly, the sight of that square, sturdy young man gave him, to his own uneasy surprise, a moment of vague and unreasonable alarm. George Trenchard was not accustomed to feelings of alarm. It was his principle in life that he should deny himself such things. He connected now, however, this very momentary sensation with other little sensations that he had felt before in Philip's company. The young man was so damnably full of his experiences, so eager to compare one thing with another, so insistent upon foreign places and changes in England, and what we'd all got to do about it. Trenchard did not altogether dislike this activity. That was the devil of it. It would never do to change his life at this time of day. He stood, large, genial, and rosy, in front of his fire. "'Well, young man, what are you descending upon us at this hour for? "'Why couldn't you come to lunch?' "'I wanted to speak to you seriously about something. "'I wanted to see you alone.' "'Well, here I am. Sit down. Have a cigar.' Trenchard saw that Philip was nervous, and he liked him the better for that. "'He's a nice young fellow, nice and clean and healthy. "'Not too cocksure, either, although he's clever.' Philip, on his part, felt at this moment a desperate determination to make all the Trenchard family love him. They must. They must. His heart was bursting with charity, with fine illusions, with self-deprecation, with Trenchard exultation. He carried the flaming banner of one who loves and knows that he is loved in return. He looked round upon George Trenchard's bookcases, and thought that there could, surely, be nothing finer than writing critical books about early nineteenth-century literature. "'I love Catherine,' 
he said, sitting on the very edge of his armchair. And she loves me. We want to be married. George Trenchard stared at him. Well, I'm damned, he said at last. You've got some cheek. His first impression was one of a strange illumination around and about Catherine, as though his daughter had been standing before him in the dark, and then had suddenly been surrounded with blazing candles. Although he had, as has been said, already considered the possibility of Catherine's marriage, he had never considered the possibility of her caring for someone outside the family. That struck him, really, as amazing. That made him regard his daughter, for a moment, as someone quite new and strange. He burst into laughter. <laughs> "'It's ridiculous,' he said. "'Why, you two have scarcely seen one another!' Philip blushed but looked up into Trenchard's face with eyes that were strangely pleading for a man who could at other times be so firmly authoritative. "'I know that it must seem so to you,' he said, "'but really we have met a good deal. I knew from the very beginning. I'll make her happy,' he ended, almost defiantly, as though he were challenging some unseen enemy. "'Well, state your case,' said Trenchard. "'I, I, I love her,' he stammered a little. Then his voice cleared, and he stared straight before him at Trenchard's velvet waistcoat. "'Of course, there have been people in my life before, but I've never felt anything like this. I should like to tell you that my life is absolutely free from any entanglements of any kind. I'm thirty, and as fit as a fiddle. My share in the business and some other things come to about fifteen hundred a year. It's all very decently invested, but of course I'd show you all that. I'm not bad about managing those things.' although you mightn't think so. I want to buy a little place somewhere in England and settle down, a little place with a bit of land. I do think I can make Catherine happy. I'd devote myself to that. She cares for you? asked Trenchard. Yes, said Philip, quite simply. Well, I'm damned, said Trenchard. This was not so rude as it appeared to be. He was not thinking about Philip at all, only about Catherine. She had fallen in love. She, Catherine, the staid, humorous, comfortable companion. He had not realised until now that he had always extracted much complacent comfort from the belief that she cared for him more than for any other member of the family. He did not know that every individual member extracted from Catherine the same comfort. He looked at Philip. What did she see in the man to lead her to such wild courses? He was nice enough to look at, to listen to. But to love? It seemed to him that his quiet daughter must have been indulging in melodrama. "'Why, you know,' he cried at last, it, "'it never entered my head. Catherine's marrying anybody. She's very young. You're very young, too.' "'I don't know,' said Philip. "'I'm thirty. Lots of men have families by then.' "'No, but you're young, though, both of you,' persisted Trenchard. "'I don't think I want Catherine to marry anybody.' "'Isn't that rather selfish?' said Philip. "'Yes, I suppose it is,' said Trenchard, laughing. "'But it's natural.' "'It isn't, you see,' said Philip eagerly, "'as though I wanted to take her away to Russia "'or in any way deprive you of her. "'I know how much she is to all of you. "'She's sure to marry some day, isn't she? "'And it's much better that she should marry someone "'who's going to settle down here and live as you all do "'than someone who'd go right off with her.' "'It's all right. I shouldn't let him,' said Trenchard. He bent his eyes upon the eager lover, and again said to himself that he liked the young man. It would certainly be much pleasanter than Catherine should care about a fine, healthy young fellow, a good companion after dinner, a good listener with a pleasant sense of humour, than that she should force into the heart of the family some impossibility. Not that Catherine was likely to care about impossibilities, but you never knew. The world to-day was so full of impossibilities.' "'I think we'll send for Catherine,' he said. He rang the bell. Rocket came. Catherine was summoned. As they waited, Trenchard delivered himself of a random, half-humorous, half-conscious, half-unconscious discourse. "'You know, I like you, and I don't often like modern young men. I wouldn't mind you at all as a son-in-law, and you'd suit me as a son much better than Henry does. At least I think so.' "'But then I know you very slightly, and I may dislike you intensely later on. "'We none of us know you, you see. 
we never had anybody drop in upon us as you did. It doesn't seem to me a bit like Catherine. I don't suppose she knows you any better than the rest of us do. She may like you later on. I can't say that marriage is going to be what you think it is. You're very unsettling. He won't keep quiet and take things easily, and Catherine is sure not to like that. She's as quiet as anything. If it were Milly now, I suppose you wouldn't care to have Milly instead. She'd suit you much better. Then you know the family won't like your doing it. My wife won't like it. He paused then, standing, his legs wide apart, his hands deep in his pockets, roared with laughter. <laughs> it will disturb them all. Not that it won't be good for them, perhaps. You're not to think, though, that I've given my consent. At any rate, you're not to marry her for a long time until we see what you're like. I'm not to give her just to anyone who comes along, you know. I rather wish you'd stayed in Russia. It's, it's, it's very unsettling. The door opened. Catherine entered. She looked at Philip, smiled, then came across to her father and put her arm through his. She said nothing, but was radiant. Her father felt her hand tremble as it touched his, and that suddenly moved him, as perhaps nothing had ever moved him before. "'Do you want to marry him?' he asked. "'Yes,' she answered. "'But you hardly know him.' "'I know him very well indeed,' she said, looking at Philip's eyes. "'But I don't want you to marry anyone,' her father went on. "'We were all very nice as we were. "'What will you do if I say you're not to marry him?' "'You won't say that,' she answered, smiling at him. "'What do you want to marry him for?' he asked. "'He's just an ordinary young man.' "'You don't know him,' he repeated. "'You can't yet. You've seen so little of him. "'Then you'll upset us all here very much. "'It would be very really unpleasant for everybody. "'Do you really think it's worth it?' Catherine laughed. "'I don't think I can help it, father,' she answered. Deep in Trenchard's consciousness was the conviction, very common to men of good digestion over fifty, that had he been God he would have managed the affairs of the world very agreeably for everybody. He had not often been in the position of absolute power, but that was because he had not often taken the trouble to come out of his comfortable shelter and see what people were doing. He felt now that he could be Jove for a quarter of an hour without any discomfort to himself. A very disagreeable feeling. He was also the most kind-hearted of men. "'Seriously, Catherine,' he said, separating himself from her, drawing his legs together and frowning. "'You're over age. You can do what you like. In these days children aren't supposed to consider their parents, and I don't really see why they should. It's not much I've done for you. But you're fond of us.' We're rather hung together as a family. I like your young man, but I've only known him a week or two, and I can't answer for him. You know us, but you don't know him. Are you sure you're making a wise exchange? Here Philip broke in eagerly but humbly. It isn't that there need to be any change, she said. Catherine shall belong to you all just as much as ever she did. <laughs> Thank you, said Trenchard, laughing. I'll be proud. "'Philip cried impulsively, jumping up from his chair. "'If you'll let me marry Catherine, "'but I'll never forget that she was yours first. "'Of course I can't come into the family "'as though I'd always been one of you, "'but I'll do my best. "'I'll do my best.' "'My dear boy,' said Trenchard, "'touched by the happy atmosphere "'that he seemed, with a nod of his head, "'to fling about him. "'Don't think I'm preventing you. "'I want everyone to be pleased. "'I always have.' If you and Catherine have made up your minds about this, there isn't very much for me to say. If I thought you'd make her miserable, I'd show you the door. But I don't think you will. All I say is, we don't know you well enough yet. Nor does she. After all, does she? He paused, and then, enjoying the sense of their listening attention, thought that he would make a little speech. You're like children in a dark wood, you know. You think you've found one another, caught hold of one another, when there's a bit of a moon or something to see one another by, you may find out you've each of you caught hold of someone quite different. Then there you are, you see. That's all I can tell you about marriage. All your lives you'll be in the forest, thinking you've made a clutch at somebody, just for comfort's sake. But you never know whom you're catching. It's someone different every five minutes, even when it's the same person. Well, well, all I mean is that you mustn't marry for a year at least.' 
"'Oh, a year?' cried Philip. "'Yes, a year. Won't hear of it otherwise. "'What do you say, Catherine?' "'I think Philip and I can wait as long as that quite safely,' she answered, looking at her lover. Trenchard held out his hand to Philip. "'I congratulate you,' he said. "'If you've made Catherine love you, you're a lucky fellow. "'Dear me, yes, you are.' He put his hand on Philip's shoulder. "'You'd better be good to her,' he said, "'although there's some who'll make you pay for it.' "'Be good to her, my God,' answered Philip. "'Now you'd better clear. "'Reveal yourselves to the family. "'There, Catherine, my dear, give me a kiss. "'Don't neglect me, or I shall poison the villain. <laughs> "'There, God bless you.' He watched them depart with real affection, both for them and for himself. "'I'm not such a bad father, after all,' he thought, as he settled down into his chair. Outside the study door, in the dark corner of the little passage, Philip kissed Catherine. Her lips met his with a passion that had in it complete and utter self-surrender. They did not speak. At last, drawing herself gently away from him, she said, "'I'll tell Mother. I think it would be better not for both of us.' "'Yes,' he whispered back, as though they were conspirators. "'I don't think I'll face them all now, unless you'd like me to help you. I'll come in to-night.' With a strange, fierce, almost desperate action, she caught his arm and held him for a moment with his cheek against hers. "'Oh, Philip, my dear!' Her voice caught and broke. They kissed once again and then, very quietly, went back into the world. Meanwhile, they had been watched. Henry had watched them. He had been crossing at the farther end of the little passage, and stopping, holding himself back against the wall, and seeing, with staring eyes, the two figures. He knew instantly. They were Philip and Catherine. He saw Catherine's hands as it pressed into Philip's shoulder. He saw Philip's back set with so fierce a strength that Henry's knees trembled before the energy of it. He was disgusted. He was wildly excited. "'This is real life. I've seen something at last. I didn't know people kissed like that. But they oughtn't to do it in the passage. Anyone might see them. Catherine!' Staggered by the contemplation of an utterly new Catherine, with whom for the rest of his life he would be compelled to deal, he slipped into a room as he heard their steps. When they had gone, he came out. He knocked on his father's door. "'I'm sorry to bother you, father,' he began. "'I wanted to know whether I might borrow—' He stopped. His heart was beating so wildly that his tongue did not belong to him. "'Well, get it and cut,' his father looked at him. "'You've heard the news, I see.' "'What news?' said Henry. "'Philip and Catherine. They're engaged, they tell me. Not to marry for a year, though. I thought you'd heard it by the look of you. What a mess you're in! Why can't you brush your hair?' Look at your tie up the back of your collar. Get your book and go. I'm busy. But Henry went without his book. Catherine went up to her mother's room. She would catch her alone now for half an hour before tea-time, when many of the family would be assembled, ready for the news. With such wild happiness was she surrounded, that she saw them all in the light of that happiness. She had always shared so readily in any piece of good fortune that had ever befallen any one of them, that she did not doubt that now they too would share in this fortune, this wonderful fortune, of hers. She stopped at the little window in the passage, where she had had the first of her little personal scraps of talk with Philip. Little scraps of talk were all that they had been, and yet now, looking back upon them, how weighted they seem with heavy golden significance. The sky was amber-coloured, the abbey tower sharply black, and the low archway of Dean's yard, that she could just catch with her eye, was hooped against the sky, pushing upwards to have its share in the evening light. There was perfect quiet at the house, and beyond it, as she went to her mother's room. This room was the very earliest thing that she could remember, this or her mother's bedroom in the Glebeshire house. It was a bedroom that exactly expressed Mrs. Trenchard, large, clumsy, lit with five windows, mild and full of unarranged trifles that nevertheless arranged themselves. At the foot of the large bed, defended with dark sateen-faded curtains, was a comfortable old-fashioned sofa. Further away, in the middle of a clear space, was a table with a muddle of things upon it, 
a doll half-clothed, a writing-case, a silver inkstand, photographs of Millie, Henry, and Catherine, a little younger than they were now, a square silver clock, a pile of socks with a needle sticking sharply out of them, a little oak bookcase with Keeble's Christian Year, Charlotte Young's Pillars of the House, two volumes of Bishop Westcott's Sermons, and Mrs. Gaskell's Wives and Daughters. There was also a little brass tray with a silver thimble, tortoiseshell paper knife, a little mat made of bright-coloured beads, a reel of red silk, and a tiny pocket calendar. Beside the bed there was a small square oaken table with a fine silver crucifix and a Bible and a prayer book, and a copy of Before the Throne in dark blue leather. The pictures on the walls, they hung against a wallpaper of pink roses, faded like the bedroom curtains and the dark red carpet, but comfortably, happily faded, were prints of Ulysses deriding Polyphemus, Crossing the Brook, and Christ leaving the temple. These three pictures were the very earliest things of Catherine's remembrance. There were also several photographs of old-fashioned but sturdy ladies and gentlemen, an officer in uniform, a lady with high shoulders against a background of a grey rolling sea. There were photographs of the children at different ages. There were many cupboards, and these, although they were closed, seemed to bulge, as though they contained more clothes than was comfortable for them. There was a faint scent in the room of eau de cologne and burning candles. The little clock on the table gave an irritating, self-important whir and clatter now and then, and it had been doing that for a great many years. Mrs. Trenchard was lying upon her sofa making a little crimson jacket for the half-clothed doll. She did not move when Catherine came in, but went on with her work, her fat, rather clumsy-looking fingers moving very comfortably up and down the little piece of red cloth. "'Who is that?' she said. "'It's I, mother,' said Catherine, remaining by the door. "'Ah, oh, it's you, dear,' her mother answered. "'Just give me that doll on the table. It's for Miss Sawyer's Bazaar in the Hampstead Rooms. I said I'd dress three dolls, and I only remember this morning that they've got to go off to-morrow. I thought I'd snatch this quiet time before tea. "'Yes, it's for Miss Sawyer, poor thing.' I'm sure I shall run out of red silk, and I don't suppose there are any in the house. Did you want anything, Catherine? Catherine came forward, picked up the doll from the table, and gave it to her mother. Then she went to one of the broad high windows, and stood looking out. She could see the river, over whose face the evening, studded with golden lamps, was dropping its veil. She could see, very dimly, Westminster Bridge, with dots and little splashes of black, passing and repassing, with the mechanical indifference of some moving toy. The sight of her mother's room had suddenly told her that her task would be a supremely difficult one. She did not know why she had not realised that before. Her personal happiness was overwhelmed by her consciousness of her mother. Nothing at this moment seemed to be of importance save her relations, the one to the other. "'I'm going to hurt her,' she thought, as she turned round from the window. All her life it had been her urgent passion to save her mother from pain. "'Mother, dear,' she said, "'I've got something very important to tell you. "'Mr. Mark has asked me to marry him, and I've accepted him. "'Father says we're to wait for a year.' She moved forward, and then stopped. Mrs. Trenchard looked at her, suddenly, as a house of cards crumples up at a single touch, her face puckered, as though she were going to cry. For an instant it was like the face of a baby. It was so swift that in a flash it was gone, and only in the eyes there was still the effect of it. Her hands trembled so that she forced them down upon her lap. Then her face, except for her eyes, which were terrified, wore again exactly her look of placid, rather stupid composure. The force that she had driven into her hands had done its work, for now she could raise them again. In one hand she held the doll, and in the other the little red jacket. "'My dear Catherine,' she said, then, "'just give me that reel of silk, dear, on the table,' then. "'But it's absurd. You don't—' She seemed to struggle with her words, as though she were beating back some other personality that threatened to rise and overwhelm her. "'You don't—' she found her words. "'You don't know him.' Catherine broke in eagerly. I loved him at the very beginning, I think. I felt I knew him at once. I don't know. It's so hard to see how it began. 
"'But I can't help it, mother. "'I've known it myself for weeks now. "'Mother!' "'She knelt down beside the sofa and looked up, "'and then at something in her mother's eyes looked down again. "'Please, please, I, I know it seems strange to you now, "'but soon you'll get to know him. "'Then you'll be glad.' "'She broke off, and there followed a long silence. "'Mrs. Trenchard put the doll down very carefully, "'and then, with her hands folded on her lap, lay back on her sofa. She watched the dark evening as it gathered in beyond the windows. She heard her maids knock on the door, watched her draw the curtains and switch on the light. It was only four o'clock, but it was very cold. "'I think I'll have my shawl, dear,' said Mrs. Trenchard. "'The Indian one that your Uncle Timothy gave me. It's in the third drawer. There, to the right. Thank you. I must go down. Grandfather's coming down to tea this afternoon.' Catherine drew closer to the sofa, after she had brought the shawl. She laid her hand upon her mother's, which were very cold. "'But, mother, you've said nothing. I know that now it must seem as though I'd done it without asking you, without telling you. But I didn't know myself until yesterday afternoon. It, it came so suddenly.' "'Yesterday afternoon?' Mrs. Trenchard drew her shawl closely about her. "'But how could he, Mr. Mark, yesterday afternoon, you weren't alone with him. Aggie was there. Surely she... No, he wrote on a piece of paper and slipped it across to me. And I said, yes. We both felt we couldn't wait. I don't like him, Mrs. Trenchard said slowly. You knew that I didn't like him. A colour rose in Catherine's cheeks. No, she said. I knew that you thought some of his ideas odd. "'But you didn't know him.' "'I don't like him,' said Mrs. Trenchard again. "'I could never like him. "'He isn't a religious man. "'He has a bad effect upon Henry. "'You, Catherine, to accept him "'when you know that he doesn't go to church "'and was so rude to poor Mr. Seymour "'and thinks Russia such a fine country.' "'I can't think,' said Mrs. Trenchard, "'her hands trembling again. "'What's come over you?' Catherine got up from her knees. "'You won't think that when you know him better. It's only that he's seen more of the world than we have. He'll change, and we'll change, and perhaps it will be better for all of us. Down in Glebeshire we already have done so much the same things, and seen the same people, and even here in London.' Her mother gave a little cry, not sharp for anyone else in the world, but very sharp indeed for Mrs. Trenchard. "'Hugh! Catherine!' You, if it had been Milly. They looked at one another then in silence. They were both of them conscious of an intensity of love that they had borne towards one another through the space of a great many years, a love that nothing else had ever approached. But it was an emotion that had always been expressed in the quietest terms. Both to Catherine and her mother, demonstrations were unknown. Catherine felt now, at what promised to be perhaps the sharpest crisis that her life had yet experienced, an urgent desire to break through, to fling her arms round her mother, to beat down all barriers, to assure her that whatever emotion might come to her, nothing could touch their own perfect relationship. But the habits of years muffled everything in thick, thick wrappings. It was impossible to break through. "'Your father is pleased?' said Mrs. Trenchard. "'Yes,' answered Catherine. "'He likes Philip, but we must wait a year. "'Your father has never told me anything. "'Never.' "'She got up slowly from the sofa. "'He couldn't have told you,' Catherine said eagerly. "'He's only just known. "'I came straight to you from him.' "'Mrs. Trenchard now stood, "'looking rather lost in the middle of her room. "'The shawl had slipped half from her shoulders, "'and she seemed suddenly an old woman.' The vision of something helpless in her, as she stood there, stirred Catherine passionately. She took her mother into her arms, stroking her hair, kissing her cheeks, and whispering to her, "'Darling, darling, it doesn't make any difference to us. It, it can't. It can't. Nothing can. Nothing. Nothing.' Mrs. Trenchard kissed her daughter very quietly, remained in her embrace for a little, then drew herself away and went to her mirror. She tidied her hair, patted her dress, put some eau de cologne on her handkerchief, laid the shawl carefully away in the drawer. 
I must go down now. Father will want his tea. I'll take the doll. I shan't have another chance of finishing it. She walked to the door. Then, turning, said with an intensity that was amazing in its sudden vehemence of fire, No one shall take you from me, Catherine. No one. Let him do what he likes. No one shall take you. She did not appear an old woman then, as she faced her daughter. Meanwhile, in the drawing-room, the family had already gathered together, as though it were aware that something had occurred. Mr. Trenchard, senior, surrounded by his rugs, his especial table, his silver snuff-box, he never took snuff in the drawing-room, but liked his box to be there, a case of spectacles, and the last number of Blackwood's magazine. Great Aunt Sarah, Aunt Aggie, Aunt Betty, and Milly. Milly, watching them, was, to her own immense surprise, sorry for them. Milly, watching them, wondered at herself. What had happened to her? She had returned from Paris, eager to find herself as securely inside the family as she had always been, longing, after the wide, vague horizons of the outside world, to feel that security. She had laughed at them a little, perhaps, but she had always understood and approved of their motives. Now she found herself at every turn criticising, wondering, defending against her own intelligence, as though she had been the merest stranger. She loved them, all of them, but how strange they were, and how terrible of her that she should find them strange. They were utterly unaware of any alteration in her. She seemed to herself to be a spy in their midst. Happily, however, they were all this afternoon most comfortably unaware of any criticism from anyone in the world. They sat about the room, waiting for their tea, and saying very little. They knew one another so well that conversation was a mere emphasis of platitudes. Aunt Aggie talked, but nobody listened, unless one of the above-mentioned assurances were demanded. Her dry, sharp little voice, like the fire and the ticking of the clock, made an agreeable background. Upon this innocent gathering, so happy and tranquil, Henry burst with his news. He came with all the excited vehemence sprung from his own vision of the lovers. He could see only that. He did not realise that the others had not shared his experience. It was almost as though he had tumbled into the middle of them, so abrupt, so agitated, so incoherent was he. "'They're engaged!' he burst out. "'My dear Henry,' said Minnie, "'what's the matter? I tell you, Catherine and Mark—' They've been into father, and he says they're to wait a year, but it's all right. He says that he didn't know till they told him. Catherine's with mother now. Mark's coming in tonight. Catherine! He broke off. Words failed him, and he was suddenly conscious of his uncle's eye. What? said Aunt Aggie. They're engaged, repeated Henry. Whom? cried Aunt Aggie, ungrammatically, with a shrill horror that showed that she had already heard. Katie and Philip! Henry almost screamed in reply. What Aunt Aggie, whose eyes were staring as though she saw ghosts or a man under her bed, would have said to this, no one could say. But Aunt Sarah drove like a four-wheeled coach right across her protruding body. Aunt Sarah said, "'What are you talking about? What's the matter with Henry? Is he ill? I can't hear.' Milly went up to her. "'Catherine's engaged, Aunt Sarah, to Mr. Mark.' "'What do you say about Catherine?' She's engaged. She's what? Engaged. Who to? Mr. Mark. Huh? What? Mark. At the shouting of that name, it did indeed seem that the very walls and ceiling of that old room would collapse. To Aunt Aggie, to Milly, to Henry, to Aunt Betty, this raid upon Catherine struck more deeply than any cynical student of human nature could have credited. For the moment, Philip Mark was forgotten. Only was it apparent to them all, from Grandfather Trenchard and Great Aunt Sarah to Henry, that Catherine, their own absolute property, the assurance given to them that life would be always secure, solid, unalterable, had declared publicly, before the world, that she preferred a stranger, a complete blown-from-anywhere stranger, to the family. What would happen to them all, to their comforts, their secret preferences and habits, known, as they all individually believed, only to Catherine, to their pride, to their self-esteem. They loved one another. Yes, they loved the Trenchard family, the Trenchard position. 
but through all these things, as a skewer through beef, ran their reliance upon Catherine. It was as though someone had cried to them, "'The whole of Glebeshire is blown away, fields and houses, roads and rivers. You must go and live in Yorkshire. Glebeshire cares for you no longer.' "'There to wait a year, father says,' shouted Milly. Aunt Sarah shook her white-plumed head and snorted. "'Catherine? Engaged? To a stranger? Impossible!' Aunt Aggie was conscious at the moment of nothing except that she herself had been defeated. They had tricked her, those two. They had eluded her vigilance. They were now, in all probability, laughing at her. "'The last thing I want to do,' she said, is to blame anybody. But if I had been listened to at the beginning, Mr. Bark would never have been asked to stay. It was thoughtless of George. Now we can all see. But Milly, standing before them all, her face flushed, said, The chief thing is to consider Catherine's happiness. Mr. Mark is probably delightful. She was sure to marry somebody. How can people help falling in love with Catherine? We all love her. She loves us. I don't see what Mr. Mark can do to prevent that and he won't want to. He must be nice if Catherine loves him. But the final word was spoken by Grandfather Trenchard, who had been hitherto utterly silent. In his clear, silvery voice he said, A great deal can happen in a year. At that moment, Catherine and her mother came in. End of Book One Chapter Six Book Two, Chapter One of *The Green Mirror* by Hugh Walpole. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Book Two, *The Feather Bed*, Chapter One, Catherine in Love. Catherine Trenchard, although she had for a number of years now gone about the world with open eyes and an understanding heart, was in very many ways absurdly old-fashioned. I say absurd because many people, from amongst her own Trenchard relations, thought her prejudices, simplicities, and confidences absurd, and hoped that she would grow out of them. The two people who really knew her, her Uncle Timothy and Rachel Seddon, hoped that she never would. Her old-fashioned habits of mind led her to believe in people, in things, and in causes, and it was her misfortune that up to this year of which I am speaking she had never been disappointed. That may be because she had grown up amongst the rocks, the fields, the lanes of Glebeshire, true ground where sincerity and truth flourish yet in abundance. Moreover, it is assured that man lives up to the qualities with which he is by his friends credited, and all the Trenchard family lived up to Catherine's belief in their word of honour. She was not so simple a character that she found the world perfect, but she was in no way subtle, and because she herself acted in her faults and virtues, her impetuosities and repentances, her dislikes and affections with clear-hearted simplicity, she believed that other persons did the same. Her love for her mother was of this quite unquestioning sort. Her religion, too, was perfectly direct and unquestioning. So, then, her love for Philip. She had never before been in love, nor had she ever considered men very closely as anything but visitors or relations. The force and power of the passion that now held her was utterly removed from anything that had ever encountered her before. But she was a strong character, and her simplicity of outlook helped her. Philip seemed to her to be possessed of all the qualities of the perfect hero. His cleverness, his knowledge of the world, his humour, were only balanced by his kindness to everyone and everything, his unselfishness, his honesty of speech and eye. She had thought him once a little weak in his anxiety to be liked by all the world, but now that was forgotten. He was, during these days, a perfect character. She had not, however, lost her clear-sighted sense of humour. That humour was almost cynical sometimes in its sharp perception of people and things, and did not seem to belong to the rest of Catherine at all. It was driven more often upon herself than upon anyone else, but it was, for a character of Catherine's simplicity, strangely sharp. A fair field for the employment of it was offered to her just now in the various attitudes and dispositions of her own immediate family. But as yet she was unable to see the family at all, so blinding was Philip's radiance. That year England enjoyed one of the old romantic Christmases. 
there were sparkling, dazzling frosts. The snow lay hard and shining under skies of unchanging blue, and on Christmas Eve, when the traffic and smoke of the town had stolen the purity away, more snow fell and restored it again. It had always been the rule that the Trenchards should spend Christmas in Glebeshire, but this year typhoid fever had visited Garth only a month or two before, and London was held to be safer. Catherine had not had in her life so many entertainments that she could afford to be blasé about them, and she still thought a pantomime splendid. The only way, certainly the most magnificent play in the world, and a dance a thing of perfect rapture, if only she could be more secure about the right shapes and colours of her clothes. She had no vanity whatsoever. Indeed, a little more would have helped her judgment. She never knew whether a dress would suit her, nor why it was that one thing looked right and another thing looked wrong. Milly could have helped her, because Milly knew all about clothes, but it was always a case with Catherine of something else coming first, of having to dress at the last minute, of putting on any old thing because there was no time. Now, however, there was Philip to dress for, and she did really try. She went to Milly's dressmaker with Milly as her guide, but unfortunately Mrs. Trenchard, who had as little idea about dress as Catherine, insisted on coming too, and confused everyone by her introduction of personal motives and religious dogmas into something that should have been simply a matter of ribbons and a bows. Catherine, indeed, was too happy to care. Philip loved her in any old thing, the truth being that when he went about with her, he saw very little except his own happiness. It is certainly a fact that during these weeks neither of them saw the family at all. Rachel Seddon was the first person of the outside world to whom Catherine told the news. "'So that was the matter with you that day when you came to see me?' she cried. "'What, what day?' said Catherine. "'You'd been frightened in the park, thought someone was going to drop a bag over your head, and ran in here for safety.' "'I shall always run in here for safety,' said Catherine gravely. Rachel came in Catherine's heart in the place next to Mrs. Trenchard and Philip. Catherine had always told Rachel everything until that day of which Rachel had just spoken. There had been reticence then. There will be reticences always now. "'You will bring him very quickly to see me?' said Rachel. "'I will bring him at once,' answered Catherine. Rachel had liked Philip when she met him at the Trenchards. Now, when he came to call, she found that she did not get on with him. He seemed to be suspicious of her. He was awkward and restrained. His very youthful desire to make the person he was with like him seemed now to give way to an almost truculent surliness. "'I don't care whether you like me or not,' he seemed to say. "'Catherine's mine, and not yours, any longer.' Neither Philip nor Rachel told Catherine that they did not like one another. Roddy Seddon, Rachel's husband, on the other hand, liked Philip very much. Lying for many years on his back had given him a preference for visitors who talked readily and gaily, who could tell him about foreign countries, who did not too obviously pity him for being out of the running, poor beggar. "'You don't like the fellow?' Roddy said to his wife. "'He doesn't like me,' said Rachel. "'Rot,' said Roddy. "'You're both jealous. You both want Catherine.' "'I shan't be jealous,' answered Rachel, "'if he's good enough for her, if he makes her happy.' "'He seems to me a very decent sort of fellow,' said Roddy. Meanwhile Rachel adored Catherine's happiness. She had chafed for many years now what she considered was the Trenchard's ruthless sacrifice of Catherine to their own selfish needs. "'They're never going to let her have any life of her own,' she said. Now Catherine had a life of her own, and if only that might continue, Rachel would ask no more. Rachel had had her own agonies and disciplines in the past, and they had left their mark upon her. She loved her husband and her child, and her life was sufficiently filled with their demands upon her. But she was apprehensive of happiness. She saw the gods taking away with one hand, whilst they gave with the other. "'I knew more about the world at ten, she thought, than Catherine will ever know. If she's hurt, it will be far worse for her than it ever was for me.' Although she delighted in Catherine's happiness, she trembled at the utter absorption of it. "'We aren't meant to trust anything so much,' she thought, as Catherine trusts his love for her. Catherine, perhaps because she trusted so absolutely, did not at present ask Philip any questions. 
They talked very little. They walked, they rode on the tops of omnibuses, they went to the zoo and Madame Tussaud's and the tower, they had tea at the Carlton restaurant and lunch in Soho, they went to the winter exhibition at Burlington House and heard a famous novelist give a portentous lecture on the novel at the Times Book Club. They were taken to a solemn evening at the Poets' Club, where ladies in evening dress read their own poetry. They went to a performance given by the Stage Society, and a tea-party given by four lady novelists at the Lyceum Club. Old Lady Carlos, who liked Catherine, chaperoned her to certain smart dances, whither Philip also was invited, and upon two glorious occasions they shared a box with her at a winter season of German opera at Covent Garden. They saw the Drury Lane pantomime, and Mr. Martin Harvey, and one of Mr. Hall Caine's melodramas, and a very interesting play by Sir Arthur, then Mr. Pinero. They saw the King driving out in his carriage, and the Queen driving out in hers. It was a wild and delirious time. Catherine had always had too many duties at home to consider London very thoroughly, and Philip had been away for so long that everything in London was exciting to him. They spoke very little. They went, with their eyes wide open, their hearts beating very loudly, side by side, up and down the town, and the town smiled upon them because they were so young, so happy, and so absurdly confident. Catherine was confident because she could see no reason for being otherwise. She knew that it sometimes happened that married people did not get on well together, but it was ridiculous to suppose that that could be the case with herself and Philip. She knew that, just at present, some members of her family did not care very greatly for Philip, but that was because they did not know him. She knew that a year seemed a long time to wait, but it was a very short period compared with a whole married lifetime. How anyone so clever, so fine of soul, so wise in his knowledge of men and things, could come to love anyone so ordinary as herself, she did not know. But that had been in God's hands, and she left it there. There was a thing that began now to happen to Catherine, of which she herself was only very dimly perceptive. She began to be aware of the living, actual participation in her life of the outside, abstract world. It was simply this, that because so wonderful an event had transformed her own history, so also to everyone whom she saw she felt that something wonderful must have happened. It came to more than this. She began now to be aware of London as something alive and perceptive in the very heart of its bricks and mortar, something that knew exactly her history and was watching to see what would come of it. She had always been concerned in the fortunes of those immediately about her, in the villages of Garth, in all her Trenchard relations, but they had filled her world. Now she could not go out of the Westminster house without wondering about the two old maids in black bonnets who walked up and down Barton Street, about a tall gentleman with mutton-chop whiskers and a white bow, whom she often saw in Dean's yard, about a large woman with a tiny dog and painted eyebrows, about the young man with the bread, the young man with the milk, the very trim young man with the post, the very fat young man with the butcher's cart, the two smart nursemaids with the babies of the idle rich who were always together and deep in whispered conversation, the policeman at the right corner of the square who was friendly and human, and the policeman at the left corner who was not, the two young men in perfect attire and attaché cases who always lounged down Barton Street about six o'clock in the evening with scorn for all the world at the corners of their mouths, the old man with the brown muffler, who sold bootlaces at the corner of Barton Street, and the family with the barrel-organ who came on Friday mornings. Man once been a soldier, woman pink shawl, baby in a basket. A thick-set, grave gentleman who must be somebody's butler, because his white shirt was so stiff and his cheeks blue-black from shaving so often. A young man always in a hurry, and so untidy that, until he came close to her, Catherine thought he must be Henry. All those figures she had known for years and years, but they had been only figures They had helped to make the pattern in the carpet, shapes and splashes of colour against the grey. Now they were suddenly alive. They had, they must have, histories, secrets, triumphs, defeats of a most thrilling order. She would like to have told them of her own amazing, stupendous circumstances, and then to have invited their confidences. 
the world that had held before some fifty or sixty lives pulsated now with millions. But there was more than that before her. Whereas she had always, because she loved it, given to Garth and the country around it a conscious individual existence, London had been to her simply four walls with a fire and a window. From the fire there came heat, from the window a view, but the heat and the view were made by man for man's convenience. Had man not been, London was not. Garth had breathed and stormed, threatened and loved, before man's spirit had been created. Now, although as yet she did not recognise it, she began to be aware of London's presence, as though from some hidden corner, from long ago some stranger had watched her. Now, because the room was lit, he was revealed to her. She was not as yet at all frightened by her knowledge, but even in quiet Westminster there were doorways, street corners, trees, windows, chimneys, houses set and square and silent, that perceived her coming and going, tum-ti-tum, tap-tap-tap, tap-tap-tap, tum-ti-tum. We know all about it, Catherine Trenchard. We know what's going to happen to you, but we can't tell you. We're older and wiser, much older and much, much wiser than you are, tap-tap-tap. She was so happy that London could not at present disturb her. But when the sun was suddenly caught behind black clouds, when a whirl of rain came slashing down from nowhere at all, when a fog caught with its yellow hand London's throat and squeezed it, when gusts of dust rose from the streets in little clouds as though the horses were kicking their feet, when a wind, colder than snow, came, blowing from nowhere on a warm day, Catherine needed Philip, clung to him, begged him not to leave her. She had never in all her life clung to anyone before. But this remains that, during this week's, she found him perfect. She liked nothing better than his half-serious, half-humorous sallies at himself. "'You've got to back me up, Catherine. Keep me from flopping about, you know. Until I met you, no one had any real influence on me. Never in all my days. Now you can do anything with me. Tell me when I do anything hateful, and scold me as often as you can. Look at me with the eyes of Aunt Aggie, if you can.' She sees me without any false colouring. I am not a hero, far from it. But I can be anything, if you love me enough. Love him enough? Had anyone ever loved anyone before, as she loved him? She was not, to any ordinary observer, very greatly changed. Quietly, and with all the matter-of-fact, half-serious, half-humorous common sense, she went about her ordinary daily affairs. Young Seymour came to tea, and she laughed at him, gave him tea-cake, and asked him about the latest novel, just as she had always done. Mr. Seymour had come expecting to see Love's candle lit for the benefit of his own especial genius. He was greatly disappointed, but also, because he hated Mark, gratified. "'I don't believe she loves him a bit,' he said afterwards. "'He came in while I was there, and she didn't colour up or anything, didn't show anything, but I'm pretty observant.' She doesn't love him, and I'm jolly glad. I can't stand the man. But those who were near her knew. They felt the heat. They watched the colour of the pure, unfaltering flame. Old Trenchard, the aunts, Milly, Henry, her mother, even George Trenchard felt it. I always knew, said Milly, that when love came to Catherine it would be terrible. She wrote that in a diary that she kept. Mrs. Trenchard said nothing at all. During those weeks Catherine was, for the first time in her life, unaware of her mother. The afternoon of the Christmas Eve of that year was never afterwards forgotten by Catherine. She had been buying last desperate additions to Christmas presents, had fought in the shops and been victorious. Then, seeing through the early dusk the lights of the Abbey, she slipped in at the great door, found a seat near the back of the nave, and remembered that always at this hour, on Christmas Eve, a carol service was held. The service had not yet begun, and a hush with strange rhythms and pulsation in it, as though some phantom conductor were leading a phantom orchestra, filled the huge space. A flood of people, dim and very silent, spread from wall to wall. Far away, candles fluttered, trembled, and flung strange lights into the web of shadow that seemed to swing and stir, 
as though driven by some wind. Catherine sank into a happy, dreamy bewilderment. The heat of the building after the cold, frosty air, some old scent of candles and tombstones and ancient walls, a consciousness of utter, perfect happiness, carried her into a state that was half dream, half reality. She closed her eyes, and soon the voices from very far away rose and fell with that same phantom, remotely inhuman urgency. A boy's voice that struck like a dart shot by some heavenly archer at her heart awoke her. This was good King Wenceslas. A delicious pleasure filled her. Her eyes flooded with tears, and her heart beat triumphantly. Oh, how happy I am! And I realize it. I know that I can never be happier again than I am now. The carol ceased. After a time, too happy for speech, she went out. In Dean's yard, the snow, with blue evening shadows upon it, caught light from the sheets of stars that tossed and twinkled, stirred, and were suddenly immovable. The Christmas bells were ringing. All the lights of the houses in the yard gathered about her and protected her. What stars they were! What beauty! What silence! She stood for a moment, taking it in, then, with a little shiver of delight, turned homewards. End of Book Two, Chapter One. Book Two, Chapter Two of *The Green Mirror* by Hugh Walpole. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Book Two, Chapter Two, Mrs. Trenchard. Minnie, like many of the Trenchard ladies before her, kept a diary. She kept it now for three years and it had not during that time, like the diaries of other young ladies, died many deaths and suffered many resurrections, but had continued with the utmost regularity and discipline. This regularity finds its explanation in the fact that Minnie really was interested in other people as well as in herself, was sometimes surprised at her cleverness, and in turn suspicious of it. In fact, she knew as much about the world as most girls of eighteen who have been finished in Paris. She thought that she knew more than she did, and was perfectly determined to know a great deal more than she thought she knew. These were some entries. December the ninth, Dreary day buying presents with mother at the stores. Why she will go there I can't think, and she takes it like a week on the Riviera, or a box at the opera. She says nothing about Philip, not a word. He dined last night and was most tactful. I never saw anyone so determined to make us all devoted to him. But he's got a difficult business with Aunt Aggie and mother. I like him, and have a kind of idea that I understand him better than any of the others do. He's certainly not the god that Catherine thinks him, and he knows he isn't. He's a little uncomfortable about it, I think. He's certainly very much in love with her. Letter from Louise Pouget. She's engaged, to no one very particular. She's younger than I am, and prettier, lots. Spoke to Henry about clean handkerchiefs. He's really incredible at his age. Philip seems to influence him, though. That may do something. December the 13th. Dismal day. Out of sorts and cross. Dreadfully restless. I don't know why. It's all wrong this Christmas, not being down at Garth and Catherine so occupied. On days like these I have terrible scruples about myself. I suppose I am terribly conceited, really. And yet I don't know. There are plenty of people I admire ever so much more than myself. I suppose it's seeing Catherine so happy that makes me restless. It must be nice to have anyone as devoted as that to you. I have always been very cynical about being in love, but when one watches it, quite close, with anyone as good as Catherine. Anyway, it's been a beastly day, and Aunt Aggie went on like an old crow at dinner. I wish I knew what Mother was feeling about it all. She's so quiet. December the 17th. Had a long talk with Philip this evening. I must say I liked him. He was so modest about himself. He said that he wished he were a little more as Catherine thinks he is, and that he's going to try to be. I said, that's all right, so long as he made Catherine happy and didn't take her right away from us all. He said that he would do anything to make Mother like him. Did I think that she liked him better now? I said that I was sure that she did, but I'm not sure, really. It's impossible to know what Mother thinks. Catherine came in whilst we were talking. Afterwards, I don't know why, I felt afraid somehow. 
Kate is so sure. I know I'd never be sure of anybody, least of all anyone in love with me. But then I know so much more about men than Katy does. And I'm sure Philip knows lots more about women than Katy thinks. Katy and Mother are so alike in some ways. They're both as obstinate as anything. Such a lovely afternoon out with the Swintons. Snow in the green park, sparkling all over, and the air like after you've eaten peppermints. Lady Perrot asked me to go with them to New Year's supper at the Savoy. Hope I'll be allowed. December the 23rd. Had a walk with Katie. First walk had alone since her engagement. She was so happy that she was almost a, beastly word, frisky. Katie frisky? We're miles away from one another just now, and that's the truth. I suppose one must simply wait until this period's passed away. But supposing it never passes away, supposing she disappears altogether from all of us. At any rate, what can one say? I like Philip, and can honestly say so. But I don't think him the angel Gabriel. Not that Katie at present cares in the least what one thinks. She doesn't want to hear. She's making no plans, thinking of no possible future, imagining nothing. She never had any imagination, or at any rate never used it. Perhaps she'll get some now from Philip, who has plenty, far too much. It's his trouble, I believe, that he's always imagining something a little better than he's got. We Trenchards have none. I haven't any, really, any curiosity. Henry and I might have some, if we were all very uncomfortable. But, of course, the whole family only keeps together because it can't imagine things being different. Are things going to be different now? Rachel Seddon came to tea. Don't like her. Thinks she owns Katie, and Katie's letter. Went with the aunts to the Messiah. Very long, with nice bits. Aunt Aggie had a crick in the neck and wriggled all the time. Hope I get some money on Christmas Day, or I shall be in an awful hole. December the 26th. Two pounds from father, one from grandfather, ten shillings cousin Alice, five Aunt Grace, kettle holder Aunt Gaggy, two dozen handkerchiefs Uncle Bob, fountain pen father, new hap mother, quite hopeless, photograph your happy warrior, Aunt Betty, two books, Reuben Hallard by Westcott, Moody second hand, Rosetta's poems from Henry, lovely amethyst brooch, Katie, darling, two novels by Turgenius from Philip, lots of other things. Nice day on the whole, but not quite right, somehow. Wish Mother didn't always look so anxious when there's a dinner party. You always expect things to happen wrong, and really Rocket knows his business by this time. All of us a little forced, I think. It seemed funny not being at Garth, and Philip the first person we've ever had, not of the family. Aunt Sarah keeps forgetting who he is, or pretends to. I wish he didn't make up to Mother quite so much. That isn't the way to make her like him. I really do understand him much better than anyone else does, much better than Katie. December the 31st. Going to the Savoy party tonight. Hope it'll be fun. Never expected Mother to let me, but she's awfully sweet to me lately. She's a darling, but we're really always just a little afraid of one another. Of course, I'm not out yet, so I'll have to be quiet tonight. Mother never would have dreamt of letting me go six months back. End of the year. Made several resolutions. Not to be snappy, nor superior, nor cynical, nor selfish. That's enough for anyone to look after. Wonder what things will be like this year, and how Katie and Philip will turn out. Feel as though things will all go wrong, yet I don't know why. Bought the hat I saw a fortnight ago. Finished House of Gentlefolks. Adored it. Discussed it with Philip. Going to get all the other Turgenevs. Think Russia must be a wonderful country. Time to dress. I know I just love the party. Only Mrs. Trenchard herself could say whether or no she had enjoyed this Christmas. She displayed the same busy placidity as on other occasions. Of her fears, disappointments, surprises, she said nothing. The turkey was a success. The plum pudding burnt with a proper glow. No one was ill. She had forgotten in sending out her parcels no single Trenchard relation. Surely all was well. Her brother, Timothy, who knew her better than anyone else did, had long abandoned the penetration of her motives, aims, regrets. There had been a time when she had been almost intimate with him. Then something, he never knew what, driven her in more obstinately than ever upon herself. Something he had said. He could point almost exactly to the day and hour. She had been a stranger to him from that moment. 
Her history, however, was very simple. When she had been a very, very small child, she had decided for herself that the way to give life a real value was to fix one's affection upon someone. Perhaps there had been also the fear of life as a motive, the discovery that the best way to be protected from all kinds of perils was to be so fond of someone that nothing else mattered. With a quiet, undemonstrative, but absolutely tenacious hold, she attached herself to her nurse, who deserted her on the appearance of a younger sister, to her mother, who died, to her father, who was always so busy that loving him was like being devoted to a blotting-pad. When she was ten years of age she went to school, and clung to a succession of older girls, who, however, found, in her lack of all demonstrations, her almost cynical remarks, her inability to give any expression whatever to her emotions, something at first terrifying, and afterwards merely tiresome. When she was about eighteen she discovered that the person to whom a woman should be properly attached was her husband. She waited then, very calmly, until she was twenty, when George Trenchard appeared, proposed to her, and was accepted. She took it so utterly for granted that her devotion to him would fill sufficiently the energy of her remaining days, that it wasn't until the end of a year of married life that she discovered that, although he liked her very much, he could do quite beautifully without her, and did indeed, for three-quarters of every day, forget her altogether. No one, except herself, knew whether that discovery hurt her. She, of course, said nothing to anyone about it. She waited for the arrival of her children. Catherine, Henry, and Mildred came, and at last it seemed that Mrs. Trenchard's ship had come into port. During their early years, at any rate, they clung to her tenaciously, did not in the least mind that she had nothing to say to them. They found her sure and safe, and best of all possible things in a parent, always the same. It was when Catherine was six years old that Timothy said to her one day, "'Look here, Harriet, don't get so wrapped in the children that you'll never be able to unwrap yourself again. I've seen it happen dozens of times, and it always gives endless trouble later on. It's all very well now, but the time will come when they'll break away. It must come, and you'll suffer horribly unless you're ready for it. I'm not married myself, it's true, but I see all the more for that very reason.' This was the speech that severed Mrs. Trenchard from her brother. She never forgot, nor forgave it. She never forgave it, because she could not forget it. His words were to haunt her from the moment of their utterance until the last conscious instant of her life. She had been born entirely without imagination, but she had not been born without the wish for romance. Moreover, the Fonder tradition, which is the same as the Trenchard tradition, taught her to believe that there was something enfeebling and dangerous about imagination, and that the more one thought about things not immediately within sight, the less likely one was to do one's daily task with efficiency. Her longing for a romantic life, therefore, that is, for the justification of her own personal existence, was assisted by no private dreams nor castle-building. No Fonder or Trenchard had ever built a castle in the air, when there were good square manors and vicarages waiting to be constructed on good solid ground. She directed the whole of her passionate life towards her relations with her children, but never, even to herself, would she admit that she had any passionate life at all. Take away the children, and there was nothing left for her except her religion. Because the loss of them would be the one tragedy that would drive her to question the justice of her God, was justification of itself for her passionate determination. Now Timothy had said that she would lose them. Well, Timothy should see. With other children, with other mothers, it might be so. God himself should not take them from her. Nevertheless, as the children grew, the shadows of his words ever pursued her and hemmed her in. She watched, with close attention, other families, and saw that Timothy's warning was justified often enough, but always she was able to find for herself some reason the weakness of selfishness or carelessness of the parent. Not weak, nor selfish, nor careless could any watching powers waiting to pounce accuse her of being. When the children grew older, she discovered certain things about them. Henry often annoyed her with his untidiness and strangely unjustified egotism. He always thought about himself, and yet never did anything. She liked Henry least of all her children. Mildred was delightful, clever, the show-child, 
but for that very reason would in all probability be afterwards the most restless of them. As the two girls grew, Mrs. Trenchard told herself that perhaps Milly would have to be sacrificed, and in telling herself this she implied that if she would only, when the time came, allow Milly without a murmur to depart, the gods would be satisfied with that, and Catherine would remain. It came to this, that by the time that Catherine was twelve, she was the centre of her mother's existence. Mildred and Henry would be held as long as it was possible to hold them, but if the worst came, they should go. Catherine would always remain. It seemed indeed that she would. She loved her home, her parents, her relations, Glebeshire, the whole of the Trenchard inheritance. She placed her mother first in her life, and she was able to satisfy the love in her mother's heart without saying anything about it or drawing anyone's attention towards it. She had all the qualities that her mother admired, sincerity, trust, common sense, practical punctuality, moral as well as physical. Above all, she took things for granted without asking endless questions, as was Henry's unfortunate habit. There grew then in the lives both of Mrs. Trenchard and Catherine a passionate affection, which was never allowed by either of them to find outward expression. This became, behind the commonplace matter-of-fact of all their days, a kind of romantic conspiracy. Even when Catherine was still a child, Mrs. Trenchard knew that the hours that they spent alone together had some strange, almost incoherent quality, something that was mixed inextricably with the high lanes, the grassy lawns, the distant strip of sea beyond the fields, the rooks in the high trees, the smell of the village shop, bootlaces, licorice, tallow, cheese and cotton, the dark attic bedroom of Catherine's, the cries of village children beyond the garden wall, afternoon Sunday school upon hard benches under glazed lamps to the accompaniment of the harmonium. All the things that belonged to Garth belonged also to the love between Mrs. Trenchard and Catherine. Catherine had been first taken to the sea when she had been a very little girl. She had been shown Raphael and the pirate's cove with its cave, too small for any but very thin pirates, and the village with the cottages cut out of the rock, and the sea advancing and retreating as a lazy cat stretches and withdraws its paws upon the pebbled beach. Driving home through the twilight in the high dog-cart behind the fat and beloved family pony, Catherine had been besieged with questions. What had she thought of it all? What did she like best? Had it been wonderful? She had said nothing. She was obstinately silent. At last, persecuted beyond bearing, she looked imploringly at her mother. Her eyes had met her mother's, and as complete understanding passed between them, it seemed that they made, there and then, a compact of mutual help and protection that was never afterwards to be broken. Mrs. Trenchard had never, never been known to mention scenery, sunsets, or buildings, except for strictly practical reasons. She would say, "'Come in, children, you'll catch cold, the sun's setting,' or, "'I don't think we'll have rain today. there's not a cloud,' or, "'It's so hot there's quite a mist. I hope there'll be enough strawberries and cream for everyone.' That was her attitude, and yet she loved Glebeshire, every stone and tree, with an unfaltering and unarguing devotion. She never said, "'Glebeshire is the loveliest spot in the world,' but only, "'Oh, you've never been to Glebeshire. You don't know the Clarence Faunders, then? They're only five miles from us.' Or, "'Yes, we live in Glebeshire, little village not far from Polchester. We're very lucky in our clergyman, a Mr. Smart, one of the Smarts,' etc. Moreover, she never went, she was quite alone, said to herself, "'Oh, what a heavenly day!' or, "'How lovely the new leaves are!' or, "'Look at the primroses!' She only said to herself, "'Lucy Cartwright's Annie has got to have that ointment!' Or, "'I must tell Rebecca about the poor courtesies. She could take them the things!' Nevertheless, when she discovered that Catherine cared for Glebeshire with a love as deep as her own, how happy she was! How firmly that discovery bound them together! For them both, that journey twice a year from London to Garth, was as exciting as though they had never taken it before. The stations, whose names were like the successive wrappers that enclose a splendid pleasant, Rasselas, the little windy station where they changed from the London Express into the halting, stumbling little train that carried them towards the sea. Then Stoop, in Roselands, tiniest station of all, 
with the sea smell blowing across the dark fields, the carriage with its lights, and Jacob, the coachman, the drive through the twilight lanes, the gleaming white gates, the house itself, and old Rebecca on the doorstep. Yes, of all these things was the love between Mrs. Trenchard and her daughter made. Most wonderful of all was it that, with Catherine, Mrs. Trenchard never knew a moment's awkwardness or embarrassment. With everyone else in the world, and perhaps especially with her own family, Mrs. Trenchard was often awkward and embarrassed, although no one but herself was aware of it. Of this embarrassment Mrs. Trenchard had a horrible dread. It was to her as though she was suddenly lifted off her feet by a giant hand and held dangling. She felt that all the world must see how her skirts blew in the wind. With Catherine she was always safe. She grew most urgently to depend upon this safety. Then as the years passed she felt that she might, with justice, consider Catherine secure. Catherine seemed to have no interest in young men. Already she adopted a rather motherly attitude towards them, and perhaps because Henry was the young man immediately before her, considered them rather helpless, rather clumsy, rather unwieldy and ungainly. She was always kind, but a little satirical in her relations to the other sex. Young men were, perhaps, afraid of her. Mrs. Trenchard did not, of course, consider the possibility of Catherine's marriage. But if that ever occurred, it would be, she knew, with someone in the family, someone like themselves who would live nearby, who would worship Catherine but never interfere with her, who would give her children, to whom Mrs. Trenchard could be a delightful grandmother. This surrender the gods might demand. It would need more than such a marriage to separate, now, Catherine from her mother. Mrs. Trenchard, like all unimaginative people, relied very strongly upon little facts and well-accustomed places and familiar family relations. She did not believe that Victoria Street would walk away, or that the old woman, Mrs. Pengello, an ancient widow with a little pension, two granddaughters and a cast in her eye, at the Garth Post Office would appear one morning as a radiant young beauty, or that her brother Timothy would go on to the music halls. Her world was thus a place of security, and Catherine was one of the most secure things in it. "'Ah, Timothy, you're wrong after all,' she would sometimes, in the watches of the night, think to herself. "'Nothing can take Catherine from me now. You may be as right as you like about Milly and Henry. Catherine is enough.' She had, during these last years, been wrapped in with a strange, placid content. Milly had been at school in Paris. There was nothing inside the Trenchard fortress that spoke of the outside world. No secret spirit ever whispered to Mrs. Trenchard, "'Are you not being selfish in keeping your daughter? You will die some day, and then she will have a lonely old maid's life, when she might have been so happy. The children's lives are their own. What right have you to Catherine's life and ambitions and love?' Would you in your youth have given up your future for your parents? Why should she? There was nothing that Mrs. Trenchard desired more than Catherine's happiness. If Catherine had not loved her, she would have let her go. But now! Catherine's life was bound up with her so tightly that nothing, nothing could part them. Then there came a night of fog, a stranger bowing in the doorway, and all the old days were dead. Mrs. Trenchard was still stunned, the fog was yet about her eyes, and in her heart was a dread that had not yet found its voice, nor driven her to determine what she would do. Meanwhile, there was no one in the world who knew her. She did not know herself. Until now there had been in her life no crisis strong enough to force open that realisation. One morning, early in January, Mrs. Trenchard said to Catherine at breakfast, "'Will you come to the stores with me this afternoon, Catherine? I have to buy some hot water bottles and one or two other things. Two of them leak badly, some hot water bottles, and I'd like you to help me.' "'I'm lunching with Rachel, mother,' Catherine said, "'but I'll be back by three if there's time enough.' Three o'clock. Very well, dear. They oughtn't to leak. We've had them quite a short time. Shall I meet you there?' "'No, I'll come back. We might miss there. I'll be back by three. At ten minutes past three, in a large, rather confused hat, with a black bird and white feathers, 
Mrs. Trenchard was seated waiting in the drawing-room. The fire had had coal poured upon it by Rocket, and it was very black. The room was cold and dark, and Mrs. Trenchard, feeling like an unwelcome guest in her own house, shivered. At twenty minutes past three, Mrs. Trenchard began to be afraid that there had been an accident. Catherine was always so punctual. Milly came in. "'Dear mother, what on earth?' "'I am waiting for Catherine. She was to be back at three from Rachel Seddon's. We are, were, going to the stores. You don't think there could have been an accident?' "'Catherine, why, I saw her twenty minutes ago. I've just come back from Lady Carlo's. Katie was at Hyde Park Corner with Philip.' "'Philip!' Mrs. Trenchard got up, took off one black glove, then put it on again. She looked at the clock. "'Will you come to the stores with me, Minnie? I've got to get some hot water bottles and some other things. Two of ours leak. I'd like you to help me.' Minnie looked once at the clock, and her mother saw her. Then Minnie said, "'Of course I will. We won't be very long, will we?' "'Why, no, dear,' said Mrs. Trenchard, who would be happy to spend a week at the stores, had she the opportunity. "'Quite a little time.' They set off together. Minnie was not yet of such an age that she could disguise her thoughts. She was wondering about Catherine, and Mrs. Trenchard knew that this was so. Mrs. Trenchard always walked through the streets of London as a trainer in the company of his lions. Anything might happen, and one's life was not safe for a moment. But a calm, resolute demeanour did a great deal, and if trouble came, one could always use the whip. The whip was the Trenchard name. Today, however, she gave no thought to London. She was very gentle and kind to Milly, almost submissive and humble. This made Milly very uncomfortable. "'I'm rather foolish about the stores, I'm afraid. I know several places where you can get better hot water bottles and cheaper, but they know me at the stores now.' Once she said, "'I hope, Milly dear, I'm not keeping you from anything. We should be home by half-past four. In exchange for these two little remarks, Milly talked a great deal, and the more she talked, the more awkward she seemed. She was very unhappy about her mother, and she wished that she could comfort her, but she knew her so little, and had always been on such careless terms with her, that now she had no intuition about her. "'What is she thinking? I know Catherine has hurt her terribly. She oughtn't to wear a hat like that. It doesn't suit her a bit.' Why isn't it I who have forgotten, and Katie here instead, to console her? Only then she wouldn't want consolation. As they walked up the steps of the stores, they were stared at by a number of little dogs on chains, who all seemed to assert their triumphant claims on somebody else's special affections. The little dogs stirred Mrs. Trenchard's unhappiness, without her knowing why. All down Victoria Street she had been thinking to herself, Catherine never forgot before, never. It was only this morning, if it had even been yesterday, but this morning. Minnie doesn't understand, and she didn't want to come. Katie? She walked slowly into the building, and was at once received by that friendly, confused smell of hams and medicines, which is the store's note of welcome. Lights shone, warmth eddied in little gusts of hot air from corner to corner. There was much conversation, but all of a very decent kind. Ladies, not very grand ones and not very poor ones, but comfortable, motherly, housekeeping ladies, were everywhere to be seen. No wonder, surely, that Mrs. Trenchard loved the stores. Here was everything gathered in from the ends of the earth that was solid and sound and real. Here were no extravagances, no decadences, no flowing creations with fair outsides and no heart to them, nothing foreign nor degenerate. However foreign an article might be before it entered the stores, once inside those walls it adopted itself at once to the claims of a cathedral city, even the eastern carpets, stained though their past lives might be with memories of the harem, recognised that their future lay along the floor of a bishop's study, a major's drawing-room, or the dining-room of a country rectory. If ever Mrs. Trenchard was alarmed by memories of foreign influences, of German invasions or Armenian atrocities, she had only to come to the stores to be entirely reassured. It would be better for our unbalanced and hysterical alarmists did they visit the stores more frequently. But frequent visits have bred in Mrs. Trenchard a yet warmer intimacy. 
Although she had never put her feelings into words, she was determined now that the stores was mainly solely in the Trenchard and Fawnder interests. So pleasant and personally submissive have the young men and young women of the place been to her all these years, that she now regarded them with very nearly the personal benevolence that she bestowed upon her own Rebecca, Rocket, Jacob, and so on. She felt that only Trenchards and Fawnders could have produced an organisation whose spirit was so entirely sprung from their own views and observances. She did not defend or extol those views. There simply they were, and out of them the stores were born. She paid her call here, therefore, rather as a patroness visits a hospital in which she is interested, with no conceit or false pride, but with a maternal anxiety that everything should be well and prosperous. Everything always was well and prosperous. She was a happy patroness. That's a splendid ham, were invariably her first words, and I do like the way they arrange things here, her second. She could have wandered very happily all day from compartment to compartment, stopping continually to observe, to touch, to smile, to blow her nose, being moved very often quite emotionally, to beam happily upon the customers, and then to turn, with a little smile of intimacy, to the young men in frock-coats and shiny hair, as though she would say, "'We've got a good crowd to-day. Everyone seems comfortable. But how can they help it when everything is so beautifully done?' Her chief pride and happiness found its ultimate crown in the furniture department. Here, hung as it was somewhere up aloft, with dark, bewildering passages starting into infinity on every side of it, was the place that her soul truly loved. She could gaze all day upon those sofas and chairs, those wonderful leather couches of dark red and dark blue, so solid, so stern in their unrelenting opposition to flighty half-and-half, half, so self-supporting and self-satisfying, so assured of propriety and comfort and solid value for your money. She would sink slowly into a huge leather armchair, and from her throne smile upon the kind gentleman who washed his hands in front of her. "'And how much is this one?' "'At nine pounds eight and sixpence, ma'am.' "'Really? Nine pounds eight and sixpence. It's a splendid chair.' "'It is indeed, ma'am. We have sold more than two dozen of this same article in this last fortnight. A great demand just now.' "'And so there ought to be. More than two dozen. "'Well, I'm not surprised. An excellent chair. Uh, "'Perhaps we can send it for you, or you prefer—' "'No, thank you, not to-day. "'But I must say that it's wonderful for the money. "'That sofa over there—' "'Up here, in this world of solid furniture, "'it seemed that England was indeed a country to be proud of. "'Mrs. Prenchard would have made no mean Britannia— seated in one of the store's armchairs with a store's curtain-rod for her trident. Upon this January afternoon she found her way to the furniture department more swiftly than was usual with her. The stores seemed remote from her to-day. As she passed the hams, the chickens, the medicines and powders, the petticoats and ribbons and gloves, the books and the stationery, the cut glass and the armware, the fancy pots, the brass, the Chinese lanterns, the toys, the pianos and the gramophones, the carpets and the silver, the clocks and the pictures. She could only be dimly aware that to-day these things were not for her, that all the treasures of the earth might be laid at her feet, and she would not care for them, that all the young men and young women in England might bow and smile before her, and she would have no interest nor pleasure in them. She reached the furniture department. She sank down in the red leather armchair. She said with a little sigh, "'She's never forgotten before.' This was, considering her surroundings at the moment of its expression, the most poignant utterance of her life. Milly's chief emotion, until this moment, had been one of intense boredom. The stores seemed to her, after Paris, an impossible anachronism. She could not understand why it was not instantly burnt up and destroyed, and all its solemn absurdities cast in dirt and ashes to the winds. She followed her mother with irritation, and glances of cynical contempt were flung by her upon the innocent ladies who were buying and chatting and laughing together. Then she remembered that her mother was in trouble, and she was bowed down with self-accusation for a hard, heartless girl who thought of no one but herself. Her moods always thus followed swiftly one upon another. When in the furniture department she heard that forlorn exclamation, she wanted to take her mother's hand, but was shy and embarrassed. I expect Katie had to go with Philip. 
something she had to do, and perhaps it only kept her a moment or two, and she got back just after we'd left. We didn't wait long enough for her. She's been waiting there, I expect, all this time for us. Mrs. Trenchard's cheek flushed, and her eyes brightened. "'Why, Milly, that's most likely. We'll go back at once. That's most likely. We'll go back at once.' Uh, "'This is a very cheap article,' said the young man. "'Or if Madam would prefer a chair with—' "'No, no,' said Mrs. Trenchard, quite impatiently. "'Not to-day. Not to-day, thank you.' "'There are the hot water bottles,' said Milly. "'Oh, of course. I want some hot water bottles. Ours leak. Three of them.' "'In the rubber department, madam, first to the right, second to the left.' But Mrs. Trenchard hurried through the hot water bottles in a manner entirely foreign to her. "'Thank you. I'm sure they're very nice. They won't leak, you say? How much? Thank you. No, I prefer these, if you're sure they won't leak. Yes, my number is 2157. Thank you.' Outside, in Victoria Street, she said, "'I might have given her until quarter to four. I dare say she's been waiting all this time. But Milly, for the first time in all their days together, was angry with Catherine. She said to herself, She's going to forget us all like this now. We aren't any of us going to count for anything. Six months ago she would have died rather than hurt mother. And behind her anger with Catherine was anger with herself, because she seemed so far away from her mother, because she was at a loss as to the right thing to do, because she had said that she had seen Philip with Catherine. "'You silly idiot,' she thought to herself. "'Why couldn't you have kept your mouth shut?' Mrs. Trenchard spoke no word all the way home. Catherine was not in the house when they returned. Minnie went upstairs. Mrs. Trenchard stared at the desolate drawing-room. The fire was dead, and the room, in spite of its electric light, heavy and dark. Mrs. Trenchard looked at the reflection of her face in the mirror. With both hands she pushed her hat a little, then, with a sudden gesture, took it off, drawing out the pin slowly and staring at it again. Mrs. Trenchard glanced at the clock, and then slowly went out, holding her hat in her hand, advancing with that trailing, half-sleepy movement that was peculiarly hers. She did then what she had not done for many years. She went to her husband's study. This hour before tea, he always insisted, was absolutely his own. No one, on any pretext, was ever to disturb him. Today, cosily, with a luxurious sense that the whole world had been made for him, and made for him exactly as he liked it, he was, with a lazy pencil, half writing, half thinking, making little notes for an essay on William Hazlitt. As his wife entered, he was reading, "'How fine it is to enter some old town, walled and turreted, just at the approach of nightfall.' or to come to some straggling village with the light streaming through the surrounding gloom, and then, after inquiring for the best entertainment the place affords, to take one's ease at one's inn. These eventful moments in our lives' history are too precious, too full of solid, heartfelt happiness to be frittered and dribbled away in imperfect sympathy. I would have them all to myself, and drain them to the last drop. How thoroughly George Trenchard agreed with that! How lucky for him that he was able to defend himself from so much of that same imperfect sympathy. Not that he did not love his fellow creatures, far from it, but it was pleasant to be able to protect oneself from their too constant, their too eager ravages. Had he been born in his beloved period, then he fancied that he might, like magnificent Sir Walter, have built his castle and entertained all the world. But in this age of telephones and motor-cars, one was absolutely compelled— he turned Hazlitt's words over on his tongue with a little happy sigh of regret, and then was conscious that his wife was standing by the door. Hello, he cried, starting up. "'Is anything the matter?' It was so unusual for her to be there that he stared at her large, heavy figure as though she had been a stranger. Then he jumped up, laughing, and the dark blue Hazlitt fell onto the carpet. "'Well, my dear,' he said, "'tea time?' She came trailing across the room and stood beside him near the fire. "'No,' she said. "'Not yet. George, you look very cosy here,' she suddenly added. "'I am,' he answered. He looked down at the Hazlitt, and her eyes followed his gaze. "'What have you been doing?' "'I've been to the stores.' "'Why, of course,' he said, chafing her. "'You live there. And what have you been buying this time?' "'Hot water bottles.' "'Well, that's exciting.' "'Ours leaked, 
two of them, and we'd had them a very short time. I took Minnie with me. Very good for her. Clear some of her Parisian fancies. There was a pause then, and he bent forward as though he would pick up the book. But he pulled himself up again. Catherine's been out with Philip all the afternoon. He smiled one of his radiant, boyish smiles. She's happy, isn't she? Does one good to see her. She deserves it, too, if anyone in this world does. I like him, more and more. He's seen the world and has got a head on his shoulders. And he isn't conceited, not in the least. He's charming to her. And I think he'll make her a very good husband. That was a lucky thing for us, his coming along, because Catherine was sure to marry someone, and she might have set her heart on an awful fellow. You never know in these days. Ah, I don't think so, said Mrs. Trenchard, nervously turning her hat over in her hands. That wouldn't be like Katie at all. No, well, perhaps it wouldn't, said George cheerfully. There was another pause, and now he bent right down, picked up the book, grunting a little, then stood turning over the pages. I'm getting fat, he said. Good for all of us when we get down to Garth. George, she began, and stopped. Well, my dear? He put his hand on her shoulder, and then, as though embarrassed by the unexpected intimacy that his action produced, withdrew it. "'Don't you think you might go out to the theatre one evening? Theatre or something?' "'What, with the children? Family party? Splendid idea!' "'No, I didn't mean with the children, exactly. Just you and I alone. Dine somewhere. Have an evening together.' It was no use to pretend that he was not surprised. She saw his astonishment. Why, why, of course, if you really care about it. Mostly pantomimes just now, but I dare say we could find something. Good idea. Good idea. Now that, now that the children are beginning to marry and go off by themselves, why, I thought, you understand. Of course, of course, he said again. Any night you like. You remind me. He whistled a gay little tune and turned over the pages of the Hazlitt, reading sentences here and there. "'Tea in a minute,' he said gaily. "'Just got a line or two more to finish. "'Then I'll be with you.' She looked at him as though she would say something more. She decided, however, that she would not, and trailed away. Returning to the drawing-room, she found Catherine standing there. Catherine's cheeks were flushed, and her eyes sparkled. She was wearing a little black hat with red berries, and the black velvet ribbon round her neck had a diamond brooch in it that Philip had given her. Rocket was bending over the fire. She was laughing at him. When she saw her mother, she waved her hand. "'Mother, darling, what kind of an afternoon have you had? I've had the loveliest time. I lunched at Rachel's, and there, to my immense surprise, was Philip. I hadn't the least idea he was coming, not the slightest. We weren't to have met today at all. Just Lord John, Philip, Rachel, and I. Then we had such a walk, Philip and I. Hyde Park Corner, right through the park, Marble Arch, then through Regent's Park, all the way up Primrose Hill. Took a bus home again. Never enjoyed anything so much. You've all been out, too, because here's the fire, dead. I've been telling Rocket what I think of him, haven't I, Rocket? Where are the others? Millie? Aunt Aggie? It's tea-time. Yes, dear, it is, said Mrs. Trenchard. It was incredible. Catherine was utterly unconscious. She remembered nothing. Mrs. Trenchard looked at Rocket. "'That'll do, Rocket. That's enough. We'll have tea at once.' Rocket went out. She turned to her daughter. "'I'm glad you've enjoyed your afternoon, dear. I couldn't think what had happened to you. I waited until half-past three. "'Waited?' "'Yes, to go to the stores. You said at breakfast that you'd come with me, that you'd be back by three. I waited until half-past. It was quite all right, dear. Minnie went with me. She'd seen you, you and Philip, at Hyde Park Corner.' "'So, of course, I didn't wait any longer.' Catherine stared at her mother. The colour slowly left her face, and her hand went up to her cheeks with a gesture of dismay. "'Mother, how could I?' "'Didn't matter, dear, in the slightest. Dear me, no. We went, Billy and I, got the hot water bottles, very good and strong ones, I think, although they said they couldn't positively guarantee them. You never can tell, apparently, with a hot water bottle.' Catherine's eyes now were wide and staring with distress. "'How could I possibly have forgotten? I was talking about it at breakfast when Aunt Aggie too was talking about something, and, and I got confused, I suppose. No, I haven't any excuse at all. It was seeing Philip unexpectedly.' 
She stopped abruptly, realising that she had said the worst thing possible. "'You mustn't let Philip, dear, drive everything out of your head,' Mrs. Trenchard said, laughing. "'We have some claim on you until you are married. Then, of course.' A colour mounted again into Catherine's face. "'No, mother, you mustn't say that.' she answered in a low voice, as though she was talking to herself. "'Philip makes no difference, none at all. I'd have forgotten in any case, I'm afraid, because we talked about it at breakfast when I was thinking about Aunt Aggie. It was nothing to do with Philip. It was my fault absolutely. I'll never forgive myself.' All the joy had left her eyes. She was very grave. She knew that, slight as the whole incident was, it marked a real crisis in her relations, not only with her mother, but with the whole house. Perhaps during all these weeks she had forgotten them all, and they had noticed it and been hurt by it. She accused herself so bitterly that it seemed that nothing could be bad enough for her. She felt that in the future she could not show her mother enough attention and affection. But now, at this moment, there was nothing to be done. Minnie would have laughed, hugged her mother, and forgotten in five minutes that there had been any crime. But in this Catherine's character resembled exactly her mother's. "'Really, Katie, it didn't matter. I'm glad you liked the walk. And now it's tea-time. It always seems to be tea-time. There's so much to do.' They were then, both of them, conscious that Aunt Aggie had come in and was smiling at them. They wished intensely to fling into the pause some conversation that would be trivial and unimportant. They could think of nothing to say. "'Why, Catherine,' said Aunt Aggie, "'where have you been? Milly says she's been to the stores. You said a breakfast. I was kept.' said Catherine sharply, and left the room. "'I'll be down in five minutes, Aggie,' said Mrs. Trenchard. "'Tea-time.' Her sister watched her as she went out, carrying her hat in her hand. Halfway upstairs she saw Henry, who was half tumbling, half sliding from step to step. He was evidently hurrying, in his confused way, to do something that he had forgotten to do, or to finish some task that he should long ago have completed. "'Henry,' she said, "'I wonder whether—' "'Right, mother,' he called back to her. "'I must.' The rest of his sentence was swallowed by distance. She turned and looked after him, then walked through the long passages to her room. She entered it, closed the door, and stood by her dressing-room, staring in front of her. There was complete, intense silence here, and all the things lay about the room as though waiting for her to address them. "'George, Milly, Henry, Catherine. Milly didn't want to go. Catherine—' On her table was a list of articles, the week's washing, her own list. Handkerchiefs, twelve. Stockings, eight pairs. She looked at it without seeing it. Then, with a sudden, vindictive, passionate movement, tore it in half, and then those halves into smaller pieces, tore the smaller pieces into little shreds of paper that fluttered in the air, and then fell on to the floor at her feet. End of Book Two, Chapter Two Book Two, Chapter Three of *The Green Mirror* by Hugh Walpole. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Book Two, Chapter Three, Life and Henry. Philip was entirely happy during the first days of his engagement. So happy that he assured himself that he had never before known what happiness was. When, however, this glorious state had continued for four or five weeks he was aware that that most sensitive and unreliable of his spiritual possessions, his conscience, was being attacked. He was aware that there was something that he ought to do, something that he did not want to do. He was aware that he must tell Catherine about Anna and his life with her. Now when he had said to Mr. Trenchard that his life was free of all complications, and that there was nothing in it that need be hidden from the world, he was quite honestly convinced that that was so. His life with Anna was entirely at an end. He had done her no wrong, she owed him no grudge, he did not know that he had ever taken any especial pains in Moscow to hide his relations with her, and he did not believe that any one there thought the worse of him for that. He had come to England with that chapter closed, eager to begin another. His only thought of Anna when he had proposed to Catherine was that this was exactly what she had intended him to do, that she would be pleased if she knew. His conscience was always at rest when he thought that everyone liked him. Now he knew, quite definitely, after a month of his engagement to Catherine, 
that some of the members of the Trenchard family did not like him. No amount of his determination to like them could blind him to the truth of this unpleasant fact. Mrs. Trenchard did not like him, Aunt Aggie did not like him, probably Mr. Trenchard Sr. and Great Aunt Sarah did not like him, he could not tell because they were so silent, and he was not sure whether Henry liked him or not. Therefore, in front of this alarming array of critics, his conscience awoke. The other force that stirred his conscience was Catherine's belief in him. In Moscow no one had believed in anyone. Anyone there, proved to be faultless, would have been for that very reason unpopular. Anna herself had held the most humorous opinion of him. She liked Englishmen, respected their restraint and silence, but always laughed at their care for appearances. Although he had known that his love for Catherine had sprung partly from his sense of her difference from Anna, he nevertheless expected the qualities that had pleased him in the one to continue in the other. He discovered that Catherine trusted him utterly, that she believed with absolute confidence in every word that fell from his lips, and he knew that, if the old whole world came to her and told her that he had for several years a mistress in Moscow and he denied it to her, that she would laugh at the world. This knowledge made him extremely uncomfortable. First he tried to persuade himself that he had never had a mistress, that Anna had never existed. Then, when that miserably failed, he told himself that he could always deny it if she asked him. Then he knew that he loved her so much that he would not lie to her. This discovery pleased him. He must, he finally knew, tell her himself. He told himself that he would wait a little until she believed in him less completely. He must prepare her mind. He did not even now, however, consider that she would feel his confession very deeply. Anna would simply have laughed at his scruples. Meanwhile, he loved her so deeply and so completely that Anna's figure was a ghost, dimly recalled from some other life. He had almost forgotten her appearance. She had a little black mole on her left cheek, or was it her right? Somewhere in the beginning of February he decided that he would cultivate Henry, not because he liked Henry, but because he thought that Catherine would like it. Also, although this he did not confess to himself, because Henry was so strange and unexpected that he was half afraid of him. Of course Henry ought to be sent to one of the universities. It was absurd to keep a great hulking boy of nineteen hanging about, wasting his own time and the time of his family, suffering no discipline and learning nothing of any value. George Trenchard had told Philip that Henry was too young for Oxford, and was to have a year of seeing the world before he went up. A fine lot of seeing the world Henry was doing, slouching about the house, reading novels and sulking. Philip, in spite of his years in Russia, felt very strongly that every Englishman should be shaven clean and wear clothes from a good tailor. About men of other nationalities it did not matter, but smartness was expected from an Englishman. Henry, however, was in that unpleasant condition known as sprouting. He had a little down on one cheek, apparently none on the other. In certain nights his chin boasted a few hairs of a forlorn and desolate appearance. In other lights he would swear that there were none. His forehead often broke into pimples. These were a terrible agony to him. Why can't he do something with his hair, thought Philip, brush it and have it cut regularly? Why is it that awful dusty colour? He might at least do something to his clothes. Mrs. Trenchard ought to see to it. Mrs. Trenchard did try to see to it. She was perpetually buying new clothes for Henry. She took him to her husband's tailor and dragged him again and again to have things tried on. Henry, however, possessed the art of reducing any suit, within twenty-four hours of his first wearing it, to chaos. He was puzzled himself to know what he did. "'But, Henry, it was new last week.' "'I know. How can I help it? I haven't done anything to the beastly thing. It simply came like that.' He affected a lofty indifference to clothes, but Philip, who saw him look frequently into the looking-glass, suspected the sincerity of this. Catherine said to Philip, "'You have so much influence on Henry. "'Do talk to him about his clothes and other things. "'He won't mind it from you. "'He gets so angry if we say anything.' "'Philip was not at all sure that Henry would not mind it from him. "'When they were alone, "'Henry would listen with the greatest interest "'to the things that Philip told him. "'His eyes would soften, his mouth would smile, "'his voice would quiver with his excitement. "'Then quite suddenly his face would cloud, "'he would blush and frown, almost scowl, then abruptly, with some half-muttered word, 
fall into a sulky silence. Once he had broken into Philip's information with, "'Oh, I suppose you think I don't know anything about it, that I'm a stupid idiot. Well, if I am, what do you bother to talk to me for?' This, of course, annoyed Philip, who always liked to feel, after a conversation with anyone, that everything had gone off all right. Had it not been for Catherine, he would not have bothered with the fellow. Another thing puzzled and even alarmed Philip. Henry would often, when he thought that he was unwatched, stare at Philip in a perplexed, brooding fashion with a look in his eye that said, "'I'll find out one day, all right. You think that no one's watching you, that I'm not worth anyone's trouble. You wait and see.' Henry would look at Philip's buttons, studs, tie, handkerchief, with his same puzzled stare. It was another side of that surveillance of which Philip had been conscious ever since Tim Flaunders' visit to his rooms. "'Ah,' thought Philip, "'once I'm married they can watch as much as they like. A year's a long time, though.' He decided then to cultivate Henry, and to know the boy better. "'I'll show him that there's nothing in me to be suspicious about, that I'm worthy of marrying his sister. I'll make a friend of him.' He asked George Trenchard whether he might give Henry an evening. "'Take him out to dinner and a music-hall. I'll look after him.' Trenchard said, "'My dear fellow, if you can make Henry look something like an ordinary civilised being, we'll all be in your debt for ever. I don't envy you your, your job, but of course do what you'd like with him.' When Philip told Mrs. Trenchard, she said, "'How nice for Henry! How kind of you to bother with the boy! He goes out so little! How nice for Henry!' When Philip asked Henry himself, Henry coloured crimson, looked at his boots, muttered something about shirts, stammered, "'Thanks. Very glad. Awful bore for you,' and finally stumbled from the room. Philip thought jewels for dinner, the Empire, the Carlton, for supper. Catherine's delight, when he told her, compensated him for all the effort of the undertaking. To understand Henry's emotion at Philip's invitation would be to understand everything about Henry, and that no one had ever done. His chief sensation was one of delight and excitement. This he hid from all the world. He had waited, during more years than he could remember, for the arrival of that moment when he would be treated as a man. Lately he had said to himself, "'If they're all going to laugh at me always, I'll show them one day soon.' He had a ferocious disgust at their lack of penetration. He had, from the very first, admired Philip's appearance. Here was a man still young, with perfect clothes, perfect ability to get in and out of a room easily, perfect tranquillity and conversation. He had been offended at Philip's treatment of Seymour, but even that had been a bold, daring thing to do, and Henry was forced to admit that he had been, since that episode, himself sometimes doubtful of Seymour's ability. Then Philip, in his conversation, had shown such knowledge of the world. Henry could listen all day to his talk about Russia. To be able to travel so easily from one country to the other, without fear or hesitation, that was indeed wonderful. Afterwards had occurred one of the critical moments in Henry's career. His passionate memory of that afternoon when he had seen the embrace of Catherine and Philip changed those two into miraculous beings, apart from all the world. He hurt Philip for the audacity of it. He also admired him, envied him, speculated endlessly about it. "'Ah, oh, if somebody would love me like that,' he thought, "'I'd be just as fine. They think me a baby, not fit even to go to college. I could... I could... He did not know what it was that he could do. Perhaps Philip would help him. And yet he did not really like Philip. He thought that Philip laughed at him, despised him. His one continual fear was lest Philip should teach Catherine, Henry's adored and worshipped Catherine, also to despise him. If he were to do that, I'd kill him, he thought. He believed utterly in Catherine's loyalty. But she loves Philip so now, it's changed her. She'll never belong to us properly again. Always his first thought was, so long as he's good to her and makes her happy, nothing matters. Now it seemed that Philip was making her happy. Catherine's happiness lit with its glow the house, the family, all the world. When therefore Philip asked Henry to dine with him, the great moment of Henry's life seemed to have come, and to have come from a source honourable enough for Henry to accept it. If any I dare, Henry thought, there are so many things that I should like to ask him. The remembered passion of that kiss told Henry that there could be nothing that Philip did not know. 
he was in a ferment of excitement and expectation. To the family, he said, "'Fred, I shan't be in Tuesday evening. Sorry, but Philip and I are dining together. Expect I'll be in Wednesday, though.' It is in fact strange, but true, that Henry had never entered one of the bigger London restaurants. The Trenchards were not among those more modern parents who spend their lives in restaurants and take their infant sons in Eton jackets to supper at the Savoy after the Drury Lane pantomime. Moreover, no one ever thought of taking Henry anywhere. He had been at school until a few months ago, and when, in the holidays, he had gone to children's parties, he had always behaved badly. George Trenchard went very seldom into restaurants, and often, for days together, forgot that he had a son at all. Down in Clevedger, Henry was allowed to roam as he pleased. Even in London no restrictions were placed on his movements. So long as he went to the Abbey twice on Sunday, he could do what he liked. A friend of Seymour's had put him up as a member of a club in a little street off St. James. The entrance was only a guinea, and anyone could be a member. Henry had, three months ago, received a book of club rules, a list of members, and a printed letter informing him that he was now elected, must pay five guineas entrance and a guinea subscription. He had extorted the money from his father, and for twenty-four hours was the proudest and happiest human being in London. He had never, alas, dared to venture inside the building. Seymour's friend had forgotten him. The club had remained strangely ignorant of his existence. On three occasions he had started out, and on three occasions his fears had been too strong for him. Once he had arrived at the very club door, but a stout gentleman, emerging and staring at him haughtily, had driven the blood from his heart. He had hurried home, feeling that he had been personally insulted. He found on his return that some vehicle had splashed mud onto his cheek. There, you see what happens. He was not far from tears. He had, behind his unhappy experiences, the resolved certainty that he was marked apart by destiny for some extraordinary future. His very misfortunes seemed to prove this. He had bought for himself a second-hand copy of that romance to which I have made earlier allusion. It exercised at this time an extraordinary influence upon him, and in the hero's fight against an overwhelming fate he saw his own history, even when the circumstance was as trivial as his search for a stud under the washing-stand. So young was he, so crude, so sentimental, impulsive, suspicious, self-confident, and lacking in self-confidence, loyal, ambitious, modest, and conceited, that it was not strange that Philip did not understand him. On the evening of his dinner with Philip he dressed with the utmost care. There were three dress shirts in his drawer, and it was of course fate that decided that there should be something the matter with all of them. One of them had been worn once already, one was frayed at the cuffs, one had a cracked and gaping stud hole. He paired the frayed cuffs with his scissors, and hoped for the best. He then produced the only valuable article in his possession, a pearl stud given to him by his uncle Bob on his last birthday. He was greatly afraid of this stud, because the head of it screwed into the body of it, and he was never sure whether he had screwed it sufficiently. Suppose it were to leap into the soup? Suppose it were to fall off, and he did not see it, and lose it? Such catastrophes were only too probable where he was concerned. He screwed it in so vigorously tonight that he made a grey mark round the stud hole. He dabbed this with a sponge, and the grey mark was greyer. His father had told him that he must never wear a made-up evening tie, but he had not told him how to tie one that was not made up, and Henry had been too timid to inquire. Tonight, by a sudden twist of genius, he produced something that really seemed satisfactory. One end was longer than the other, but his father approved of a little disorder. When the tie was too neat, it was almost made up. Henry's dress-clothes, lying there upon the bed, seemed a little faded. The trousers glistered in the electric light, and the tails of the coat were sadly crumpled. But when they were on his body, Henry gazed at them with pleasure. One trouser-leg seemed oddly longer than the other, and his shirt-cuff had disappeared altogether. But the grey mark round the stud was scarcely visible, and his collar was beautifully clean. His face was red and shining, his hair was plastered down with water. It was a pity that there were three red pimples on his forehead, but there had been four yesterday. His ears, too, were dreadfully red, but that was from excitement. He had an opera hat and a black greatcoat with a velvet collar, 
so that he felt very smart indeed as he slipped out of the house. He was glad that he had escaped the family, although he fancied that Aunt Aggie watched him from the top of the stairs. He would have liked to have seen Catherine for a moment, and had he spoken his heart out, he would have assured her that, for her sake, he would do his best to love Philip. It was for her sake, after all, that he had dressed so carefully, for her sake that he wanted to be a fine figure in the world. If he had seen her, all that he would have said would have been, "'Sir Aunt Catherine, dining with Philip, you know. See you in the morning.' He rode on an omnibus from Whitehall to Piccadilly Circus, and walked then to Jules. The clocks were striking half-past seven, the appointed hour, as he entered. A stout man, like an emperor, insisted on disrobing him of his greatcoat, and he felt suddenly naked. He peeped into the room, which was very empty, and all the waiters, like figures in Madame Tussaud's, stared at him together. He was sure that his tie had mounted above his collar. He put up his hand, found that it was so, and thought that the Emperor was laughing at him. He bent down to tie his shoe, and then, just as a large party entered the restaurant, there was a little pop, and the head of his pearl stud was gone. He was on his knees in a second. A "'Big pardon, sir,' said the Emperor. "'Allow me.' "'No,' said Henry, whose face was purple, whose heart was beating like a hammer, and through whose chasm in his shirt a little wind was blowing against his vest. "'It's my stud. I can... I beg... Um, uh, no, it isn't.' He was conscious of tiring forms above him, of a lady's black silk stockings, of someone saying, "'Why, damn it!' of a sudden vision of the pearl, and a large masculine boot thundering towards it. From his position on the floor he cried in agony, "'Oh, do look out! You're stepping on it! I, I say, please!' He heard a sharp little cry, and just as he seized it, Philip's voice, "'Why, Henry!' He staggered up from his knees, which were white with dust. His purple face, his disordered hair, a piece of pink vest that protruded from his shirt, made an unusual picture. Someone began to laugh. "'I say,' said Philip quickly, "'come in here.' He led the way into the lavatory. "'Now what's the matter?' Henry stared at him. "'Why couldn't the silly fool see?' "'It's my stud. The, the head came off. Might have happened to anyone.' "'That's all right,' said Philip cheerfully. "'Got it now?' "'That's good. Look here, I'll screw it in for you.' "'The other piece,' said Henry, who was near tears. "'It, it slipped down inside.' "'I'm afraid you'll have to take your trousers off,' said Philip gravely. "'Just let them down. It's all right. There's no one here who matters.' Henry undressed. A smart man with hair like a looking-glass came in, stared, and went out again. Two attendants watched sympathetically. After some time the stud was arranged, and Henry was dressed again. "'You'd better just let me tie your tie,' said Philip. "'It's so difficult in here. One can't see to do it oneself.' Henry said nothing. He brushed his hair again, suffered himself to be dusted and patted by the attendant, and followed Philip into the restaurant. He was so miserable that suicide was the only alternative to a disgraced and dishonoured life. He was sure that everyone in the restaurant was laughing at him. The grave waiter who brought him his soup, the fat round button of a waiter who brought the champagne in a bucket of ice, the party opposite, two men and two women, beasts. All these were laughing at him. His forehead was burning, his heart deadly cold. He glared at Philip, gulped down his food without knowing at all what it was that he was eating, said yes and no, never looked at Philip, but stared fiercely round him as though he were looking for someone. Philip persisted, very bravely, in a succession of bright and interesting anecdotes. But at last he flagged. He was afraid that he had a terrible evening before him. Never again. "'He's thinking,' said Henry to himself, "'that I'm impossible. He's wondering what on earth he asked me for. Why did he if he didn't want to? Conceited ass. That about the stud might have happened to anyone. He'll tell Catherine.' "'Coffee?' said Philip. "'No, thank you,' said Henry. "'All right, we'll have it later. We'd better be getting on to the show. Ready?' They moved away. They were in a cab. They were caught into the heart of some kaleidoscope. Lights flashed, men shouted, someone cried in a high treble. Lights flashed again, and they were sitting in the stalls at the Empire Music Hall. Henry hailed the darkness with relief. He felt as though his body were bruised all over, and when he looked up and saw a stout man upside down on a tightrope, 
he thought to himself, "'Well, he can't see me, anyhow. He doesn't know that the top of my stud came off.' There followed then a number of incredible people. It must be remembered that he had never been to a music hall before. There was a man with two black eyes and a red nose, who sang a song about the wives he had had, seven verses, one wife to every verse. There was a stout lady who sang about Porter, and there were two small children who danced the tango. Finally, a gentleman in evening dress and a large white buttonhole who recited poems, while his friends in the background arranged themselves in illustrative groups. In this strange world, Henry's soul gradually found peace. It was a world, after all, in which it was not absurd to grope on one's knees for the top of one's stud. It was the natural and clever thing to do. When the lady who sang about the porter kissed her hand to the audience, Henry, clapping enthusiastically, felt a throb of sympathy. "'I'm so glad she's been a success to-night,' he thought to himself, as though she had been his cousin or his aunt. "'She'll feel pleased.' He wanted by this time everyone to be happy. When at the last the fat man in evening clothes recited his tale of The Good Old British Flag, and was surrounded instantly by a fluttering cloud of Union Jacks, Henry was very near to tears. "'I'll make them send me to Oxford,' he said to himself, "'and once I'll work like anything.' The lights went up. Ten minutes interval. While the band played tunes out of Rigoletta, and behind the curtain they prepared for that immensely popular ballet, The Pirate. "'Let's uh, walk about a bit, shall we?' said Philip. Henry, humbly, with a timid smile, agreed. He tumbled over a lady as he passed out of his row, but he did not mind now. His eyes were shining and his head was up. He followed Philip, admiring his broad shoulders, the back of his head, his sturdy carriage and defiant movement of his body. He glared haughtily at young men lolling over the bar, and the young men glared back haughtily at him. He followed Philip upstairs, and they turned into the promenade. Henry did not know that it was the promenade. With his head in the air he stepped forward and plunged instantly into something that flung powder down his throat, a strange and acrid scent up his nose. His fingers scraped against silk. "'There, clumsy!' said a voice. A lady, wearing a large hat, and, as it appeared to Henry, tissue of gold, smiled at him. "'Doesn't matter!' she said, putting some fat fingers on his hand for a moment. "'It doesn't, dear, really. Hot, isn't it?' He was utterly at a loss, scarlet in the face, his eyes staring wildly. Philip had come to his rescue. "'Hot it is,' said Philip. "'What about a drink, dear?' said the lady. "'Not just now,' said Philip, smiling at her, as though he'd known her all his life. "'Jolly good scrum up here, isn't it?' "'Everyone banging about so,' said the lady. "'What about a drink now?' Not waiting. Sorry, said Philip. Got an engagement. Very important. The lady, however, had suddenly recognised an old friend. Why, Charlie, Henry heard her say. Whoever. They sat down on a sofa near the bar and watched the group. Henry was thinking. He spoke to her as though he had known her all his life. He was suddenly aware that he and his father and mother and aunts, yes, and Catherine too, were babies compared with Philip. Why, they don't know anything about him. Catherine doesn't know anything, really. He watched the women who passed him. He watched their confidential whispers with gentlemen who all seemed to have red faces and bulging necks. He watched two old men with their hats cocked to one side. They had faces like dusty strawberries, and they wore white gloves and carried silver-topped canes. They didn't speak, and nothing moved in their faces except their eyes. He watched a woman who was angry, and a man who was apologetic. He watched a girl in a simple black dress who stood with grave, waiting eyes. She suddenly smiled a welcome to someone, but the smile was hard, practised, artificial, as though she had fastened it on like a mask. Philip belonged to these people. He knew their ways, their talk, their etiquette, their tragedies and comedies. Henry stared at him, at his gaze, rather uninterested and tired. Philip at that moment was thinking of Catherine, of the bore that her young brother was. He was remembering the last time that she had kissed him, of her warm cheek against his, of a little laugh that she had given, a laugh of sheer happiness, of trusting, confident delight. Henry sat there, frightened, thrilled, shocked, 
proud, indignant, and terribly inquisitive. I'm beginning to know about life. Already I know more than they do at home. Two boys, who must have been younger than he, passed him. They were smart, shining, scornful. They had the derisive and curious gaze of old men, and also the self-assertive swagger of very young ones. Henry, as he looked at them, knew that he was a babe in arms compared with them. But it seemed to him to-night that all his family were still in the cradle. Why, even father, he thought, if you brought him here, I don't believe he'd know what to say or do. They went downstairs, then found their seats, and the curtain rose on the ballet. The ballet was concerned with pirates and Venice in the good old days. The first scene was an island in the Adriatic, there were any number of pirates and ladies who loved them, and the sun slowly set, and the dancers on the golden sand sank exhausted at the feet of their lovers, and the moon rose and the stars came out in a purple sky. Then the pirate chief, an enormous Byronic figure, with hair jet black and tremendous eyebrows, explained through his hands that there was a lady in Venice whom he loved, whom he must seize and convey to his island. Would his brave fellows follow him in his raid? His brave fellows would. One last dance and one last drink, then death and glory. The curtain came down upon figures whirling madly beneath the moon. There followed then the doge's palace, a feast with much gold plate, aged senators with white beards who watched the dancing with critical gaze. Finally, a lovely lady who danced mysteriously beneath many veils. She was, it appeared, a princess, sought in marriage by the doge, her heart, however, lost utterly to a noble stranger whom she had once seen but never forgotten. The doge, mad with love for her, orders her to be seized. She is carried off, wildly protesting, and the golden scene is filled with white dancers, then with fantastic masked figures, at last with dancers in black, who float like shadows through the mazes of the music. The third scene is the piazza. The country people have a holiday, drinking and dancing. Then enters a magnificent procession, the doge leading his reluctant bride. Suddenly shouts are heard, it is the pirates. A furious fight follows, the pirates headed by their chief, who wears a black mask, are of course victorious. The princess is carried, screaming, to the pirates' ship. Treasure is looted, pretty village maidens are captured. The pirates sail away. Last scene is the island again. The ladies are expecting their heroes. The vessel is sighted, the pirates land. There are dances of triumph. The spoil, golden goblets, rich tapestries, gleaming jewels, are piled high. Finally, the captive lady princess, who weeps bitterly, is led by the chieftain, still masked, into the middle of the stage. She, upon her knees, begs for pity. He is stern, a fine, melancholy figure. At last he removes the mask. Behold, it is the noble stranger! With what rapture does she fall into his arms? With what dances are the triumphant pirates made happy? Upon what feasting does the sun again set? The moon rises, and the stars appear. Finally, when the night sky is sheeted with dazzling lights, and the moon is orange-red, the pirates and their ladies creep away. Only the chieftain and his princess, locked in one another's arms, are left. Someone in the distance pipes a little tune. The curtain descends. Impossible to describe the effect that this had upon Henry. The nearest approach to its splendour in all his life before had been the procession of nations at the end of the Drury Lane pantomime, and although he had found that very beautiful, he had nevertheless been disturbed by a certain sense of incongruity. Aladdin and his princess, having little to do with Canada and Australia, represented, as those fine countries were, by two stout ladies of the Lane Chorus. I think that this pirate ballet may be said to be the third crisis in this critical development of Henry, the first being the novel about the forest, the second his vision of Catherine and Philip. It will perhaps be remembered that at Jules' restaurant Henry had drunk champagne, and because of his misery and confusion there had had no consciousness of flavour, quantity or consequences. It was certainly the champagne that lent the pirate an added colour and splendour. As the boy followed Philip into Leicester Square, he felt that any achievement would be now possible to him, any summit was to be climbed by him. 
the lights of Leicester Square circled him with fire. At the flame's heart were dark trees, soft and mysterious against the night sky. Beneath these trees, guarded by the flame, the pirate and the princess slept. It seemed to him that now he understood all the world, that he could be astonished and shocked by nothing, that every man, be he never so degraded, was his brother. He was unaware that his tie was again above his collar and his shoelace unfastened. He strode along, thinking to himself, How glorious! How splendid! How glorious! Philip, too, although the Empire Ballet had once been commonplace enough, although, moreover, he had come so little a time ago from the country where the ballet was in all the world supreme, had been plunged by the pirate into a most sentimental attitude of mind. He was to-night terribly in love with Catherine, and when the lights had been turned down and the easy, trifling music had floated out to him, caught him, soothed and whispered to him, he had held Catherine in his arms, her cheek touching his, her heart beating with his, his hand against her hair. Her confidence in him, that at other times frightened him, to-night thrilled him with a delicious pleasure. His old distrust of himself yielded to-night to a fine, determined assurance. "'I will be all that she thinks I am. She shall see how I love her. They shall all see.' "'I think we'll go down into the grill-room,' said Philip, when they arrived at the Carlton. "'We can talk better there.' It was all the same to Henry, who was busy feasting with the pirate upon the Adriatic island with the princess dancing for them on the golden sand. They found a quiet little table in that corner, which is one of the pleasantest places in London. So retired from the world, are you, and yet so easy is it to see all that goes on amongst your friends, enemies, and neighbours. Oysters? Must have oysters, Henry. Then grilled bones? Then we'll see. Whisky and soda? Split soda, waiter, please. Henry had never eaten oysters before and he would have drunk his whisky with them had Philip not stopped him. "'Never drink whisky with oysters. you die. He would, really.' Henry did not like oysters very much, but he would have suffered the worst kind of torture rather than say so. The bones came, and the whisky with them. Henry drank his first glass very quickly, in order to show that he was quite used to it. He thought, as he looked across the table, that Philip was the finest fellow in the world. No one had ever been so kind to him as Philip. How could he have ever disliked Philip? Philip was going to marry Catherine, and was the only man in all the world who was worthy of her. Henry felt a burning desire to confide in Philip, to tell him all his most secret thoughts, his ambitions, his troubles. He drank his second glass of whisky, and began a long, rather stumbling narration. You know, I shall never be able to tell you how grateful I am to you for giving me such a ripping evening. All this time I, I've i been very rude sometimes, I expect. You must have thought me a dreadful ass, and I've wanted so much to show you that I'm not. That's all right, said Philip, who was thinking of Catherine. No, it isn't all right, said Henry, striking the table with his fist. I must tell you, now that you've been so kind to me. You see, I'm shy, really. I wouldn't like most people to know that, but I am. I'm shy because I'm so for unfortunate about little things. You must have noticed long ago how unlucky I am. Nothing ever goes right with me at home. I'm always untidy, and my clothes go to pieces, and, and I break things. People seem to think I want to— His voice was fierce for a moment. That's all right, said Philip again. Have some more bone. Yes, thank you, said Henry, staring darkly in front of him. I don't know why I'm so unfortunate, because I know I could do things if I were given a chance— but no one will ever let me try. What do they keep me at home for when I want to be at Oxford? Why don't they settle what I'm going to be? It's quite time for them to make up their mind. It's a shame, a shame. So it is. So it is, said Philip. But it will be all right if you wait a bit. I'm always told I've got to wait, said Henry fiercely. What about other fellows? No one tells them to wait. I'm nineteen, and there are plenty of men of nineteen I know who are doing all kinds of things. I can't even dress properly. Soot and fluff always comes and settle on my clothes rather than on anyone else's. I've often noticed it. Then people laugh at me for nothing. They don't laugh at other men. You oughtn't to care, said Philip. I try not to, but you can't help it if it happens often. What do you want to be? said Philip. What would you like to do? 
I don't mind anything, said Henry, if only I did it properly. I'd rather be a waiter who didn't make a fool of himself than what I am. I'd like to be of use. I'd like to make people proud of me. I'd like Catherine... At that name, he suddenly stopped and was silent. Well, said Philip, what about Catherine? Have some more whisky. Uh, wait, a coffee. I want to do something, said Henry, to make Catherine proud of me. And it must be horrible for her to have a brother whom everyone laughs at. It's partly because of her that I'm so shy. But she understands me as none of the others do. She knows I've got something in me. She believes in me. She's the only one. I can talk to her. She understands when I say that I want to do something in the world. She doesn't laugh. And I'd die for her. Here, now, if it was necessary. And I'll tell you one thing. I didn't like you at first. When you got engaged to Catherine, I hated it, until I saw that she'd probably have to be engaged to someone, and it might as well be you. Thank you, said Philip, laughing. I saw how happy you made her. It's hard on all of us who've known her so long, but we don't mind that, if you do make her happy. So, said Philip, it's only by the family's permission that I can keep her. Oh, you know what I mean, said Henry. Of course she's her own mistress. She can do what she likes. But she is fond of us, and I don't think, if it came to it, that she'd ever do anything to hurt us. If it came to what? said Philip. But Henry shook his head. Oh, I'm only talking. I meant that we're fonder of one another as a family than people outside can realise. We don't seem to be if you can watch us, but if it came to pulling us apart, to, to taking Catherine away, for instance, it, it wouldn't be easy. Uh, another soda, waiter, said Philip. But I don't want to take Catherine away. I don't want there to be any difference to anyone. There must be a difference, said Henry, shaking his head and looking very solemn. If it had been Milly, it mightn't have mattered so much, because she's been away a lot as it is. But with Catherine, you see, we've always thought that whatever misfortune happened, Catherine would be there. And now we can't think that any longer. But that, said Philip, who drunk quite a number of whiskies by this time, was very selfish of you. You couldn't expect her never to marry. We never thought about it, said Henry. He spoke now rather confusedly and at random. We aren't the sort of people who look ahead. I suppose we haven't got much imagination as a family. None of the Trenchards have. That's why we're fond of one another and can't imagine ever not being. Philip leant forward. Look here, Henry. I want us to be friends, real friends. I love Catherine so much that I would do anything for her. If she's happy, you won't grudge her to me, will you? I felt a little that you, some of you, don't trust me, that you don't understand me. But I'm just what I seem. I'm not worthy of Catherine. I can't think why she cares for me. But as she does, it's better, isn't it, that she should be happy? If you'd all help me, if you'd all be friends with me... He had for some minutes been conscious that there was something odd about Henry. He'd been intent on his own thoughts but behind them something had claimed his attention. Henry was now waving a hand in the air, vaguely. He was looking at his half-empty glass with an intent and puzzled eye. Philip broke off in the middle of his sentence, arrested suddenly by this strangeness of Henry's eye, which was now fixed and staring, now red and wandering. He gazed at Henry, a swift, terrible suspicion striking him. Henry, with a face desperately solemn, gazed back at him. The boy then tried to speak, failed, and very slowly a large, fat tear trembled down his cheek. "'I'm trying, I'm trying,' he began. "'I'll be your friend always. I'll get up, stand, explain. I'll make a speech,' he suddenly added. "'Good Lord!' Philip realised with a dismay, pricked with astonishment. "'The fellow's drunk!' It had happened so swiftly that it was as though Henry were acting a part. Five minutes earlier, Henry had apparently been perfectly sober. He had drunk three whiskies and sodas. Philip had never imagined this catastrophe, and now his emotions were a confused mixture of alarm, annoyance, impatience, and disgust at his own imperception. Whatever Henry had been five minutes ago, there was no sort of question about him now. "'Someone's taken off my boots,' he confided very confidentially to Philip. "'Who did?' The one clear thought in Philip's brain was that he must get Henry home quietly and with as little noise as possible. 
Only a few people now remained in the grill-room. He summoned the waiter, paid the bill. Henry watched him. "'You must tell them about my boots,' he said. "'It's absurd.' "'It's all right,' said Philip. "'They've put them on again now. It's time for us to be moving.' He was relieved to see that Henry rose at once, and, holding for a moment on to the table, steadied himself. His face, very solemn and sad, with its large mournful eyes, and a lock of hair tumbling forward over his forehead, was both ridiculous and pathetic. Philip took his arm. "'Come on,' he said. "'Time to go home.' Henry followed very meekly, allowed them to put on his coat, was led upstairs and into a taxi. Then he suddenly put his head between his hands and began to sob. He would say nothing, but only sobbed hopelessly. "'It's all right,' said Philip, as though he were speaking to a child of five. "'There's nothing to cry about. You'll be home in a moment.' He was desperately annoyed at the misfortune. Why could he not have seen that Henry was drinking too much? But Henry had drunk so little. Then he'd had champagne at dinner. He wasn't used to it. Philip cursed his own stupidity. Now, if they made a noise on the way to Henry's room, there might follow fatal consequences, if anyone should see them. Henry's sobs had ceased. He seemed to be asleep. Philip shook his arm. "'Look here. We must take care not to wake anyone.' Here we are. Quietly now. And where's your key? Wash key, said Henry. Philip had a horrible suspicion that Henry had forgotten his key. He searched. Ah, there it was in the waistcoat pocket. Henry put his arms round Philip's neck. They've turned the road upside down, he whispered confidentially. They mustn't lose each other. They entered the dark hall, Philip with one arm round Henry's waist. Henry sat on the lowest step of the stairs. "'I'll stay here to-night,' he said. "'It's safer,' and was instantly asleep. Philip lifted him, then, with Henry's boots tapping the stairs at each step, they moved upwards. Henry was heavy, and at the top Philip had to pause for breath. Suddenly the boy slipped from his arms and fell with a crash. The whole house re-echoed. Philip's heart stopped beating, and his only thought was, "'Now I'm done. They'll all be here in a moment.' They'll drive me away. Catherine will never speak to me again. A silence followed, abysmally deep, only broken by some strange snore that came from the heart of the house, as though it were the house that was snoring, and the ticking of two clocks that in their race against one another whirred and chuckled. Philip picked Henry up again and proceeded. He found the room, pushed open the door, closed it and switched on the light. He then undressed Henry, folding the clothes carefully, put upon him his pyjamas, laid him in bed, and tucked him up. Henry, his eyes closed as though by death, snored heavily. Philip turned the light out, crept into the passage, listened, stole downstairs, let himself into the square, where he stood for a moment in the cold night air, the only living thing in a sleeping world, then hastened away. Thank heaven, he thought, we've escaped. He had not escaped. Aunt Aggie, a fantastic figure in a long blue dressing-gown, roused by Henry's fall, had watched from her bedroom door the whole affair. She waited until she had heard the hall door close, then stole down and locked it, stole up again, and disappeared silently into her room. When Henry woke in the morning, his headache was very different from any headache that he had ever endured before. His first thought was that he could never possibly get up, but would lie there all day. His second that, whatever he did, he must rouse suspicion in no one. His third that he really had been terribly drunk last night, and remembered nothing after his second whisky at the Carlton. His fourth that someone must have put him to bed last night, because his clothes were folded carefully, whereas it was his own custom always to fling them about the room. At this moment Rocket, who always took upon himself the rousing of Henry, entered with hot water. "'Time to get up, sir,' he said. Breakfast bell in twenty minutes. Bath, quite ready. Henry watched. He'll suspect something when he sees those clothes, he thought. But Rocket, apparently, suspected nothing. Henry got up, had his bath, and slowly dressed. His headache was quite horrible, being a cold headache with a heavy weight of pain on his skull and a taste in his mouth of mustard and bad eggs. He felt that he could not possibly disguise from the world that he was unwell. Looking in the glass, 
he saw that his complexion was yellow and muddy, but then it was never at any time very splendid. He looked cross and sulky, but then that would not surprise anyone. He went downstairs and passed successfully through the ordeal. Fortunately, Aunt Aggie was in bed. Only Milly, laughing, said to him, "'You don't look as though evenings with Philip suited you, Henry.' How he hated Milly when she teased him. "'Well, I'm sure,' said Mrs. Trenchard placidly. "'There must be thunder about. Thunder about. I always feel it in my back. George, dear, do put that paper down. Your tea's quite cold.' Well, said George Trenchard, looking up from the morning post and beaming upon everyone, what did Philip do with you last night, Henry? Show you the town, eh? We had a very pleasant evening, thank you, father, said Henry. We went to the Empire. You came in very quietly, I didn't hear you. Did you hear him, Harriet? No, said Mrs. Trenchard. I do hope you locked the front door, Henry. Oh, yes, mother, that was all right, he said hurriedly. Well, dear, I'm very glad you had a pleasant evening. It was kind of Philip, very kind of Philip. Yes, that's Aunt Aggie's tray, Katie, dear. I should put a little more marmalade, and that bit of toast. The other's rather dry. Yes, the other's rather dry. Poor Aggie says she's had a disturbed night, slept very badly. I shouldn't wonder whether it's the thunder. I always know by my back. Thank you, Katie. He has a letter from Rose Fawn to George, and she says... etc., etc. After breakfast... Henry escaped into the drawing-room. He sank into his favourite chair by the fire, which was burning with a cold and glassy splendour that showed that it had just been lit. The room was foggy, dim and chill, exactly suited to Henry, who, with his thin legs stretched out in front of him, and his headache oppressing him with a reiterated emphasis as though it were some other person insisting on his attention, stared before him and tried to think. He wanted to think everything out, but could consider nothing clearly. It was disgusting of him to have been drunk, but it was Philip's fault. That was his main conclusion. Looking back, everything seemed to be Philip's fault, even the disaster to himself. There was in Henry a strange, puritanical, old maidish strain, which, under the persuasion of the headache, was allowed full freedom. Philip's intimacy with those women, Philip's attitude to drink, to ballets, even to shirt studs, an attitude of indifference bred of long custom, seemed to Henry this morning sinister and most suspicious. Philip had probably been laughing at him all the evening, thought him a fool for getting drunk so easily. Terrible idea, this. Would tell other people about his youth and inexperience. Thoughts like these floated through Henry's aching head, but he could not really catch them. Everything escaped him. He could only stare into the old mirror with its reflection of green carpet and green wallpaper, and fancy that he was caught, held prisoner by it, condemned to remain inside it for ever, with an aching head and an irritated conscience. He was ill, he was unhappy, and yet through it all ran the thought, You are a man now, you have received your freedom, you'll never be a boy again. He was aroused from his thoughts by the sudden vision of Catherine, who was, he found, sitting on the elbow of his armchair with her hand on his shoulder. Oh, he said, letting her take his hand, didn't hear you come in. I didn't know you were in here, she answered. You were hidden by the chair. I was looking for you, though. Why? said Henry suspiciously. Oh, nothing except that I wanted to hear about last night. Did you enjoy it? Very much. Was Philip nice? Very nice. What did you do? Oh, we dined at Jules, went to the Empire, had supper at the Carlton, and came home. He looked at Catherine's eyes felt that he was a surly brute, and added, "'The banner was called The Pirate. I thought it was fine, but it was the first one I'd seen. I don't think Philip cared much for it, but then he's seen so many in Moscow, where they go on all night and are perfectly splendid.' Catherine's hand pressed his shoulder a little, and he, in response, drew closer to her. "'I'm glad Philip was nice to you,' she said, gazing into the fire. "'I want you two to be great friends.' There sprang then a new note into her voice, as though she were resolved to say something that had been in her mind a long time. "'Henry, tell me, quite honestly, I want to know. Have I been a pig lately? A pig about everybody? Since I've been engaged, have I neglected you all, and been different to you all, and hurt you all?' "'No,' said Henry slowly. "'Of course you haven't. 
"'But it has been different a little. It, it couldn't help being.' "'What has?' "'Well, of course, we don't mean so much to you now. How can we? I suppose what Philip said last night is true, that we've been all rather selfish about you, and now we're suffering for it.' "'Did Philip say that?' "'Yes, or something like it.' "'It isn't true. It simply shows that he doesn't understand what we all are to one another. I suppose we're different.' I've been feeling since I've been engaged that we must be different. Philip is so continually surprised at the things we do. Henry frowned. He needn't be. There's nothing very wonderful in our all being fond of you. She got up from the chair and began to walk up and down the room. Henry's eyes followed her. I don't know what it is, she said suddenly, but during these last weeks it's as though you were all hiding something from me, even you and Milly. Of course I know that Aunt Aggie hates Philip. She never can hide her feelings. But, Mother— Catherine broke out. Oh, it's all so silly. Why can't we all be natural? It's unfair to Philip. He's ready for anything. He wants to be one of us. And you, all of you. It isn't quite fair, said Henry slowly, to blame only us. We've all been very nice to Philip, I think. I know Aunt Betty and Milly and Father like him very much. And you, said Catherine, I don't think I'd like anyone who was going to take you away. But he isn't going to take me away. That's why you're all so wrong. He's just going to be one more of the family. Henry said nothing. Catherine then cried passionately, Ah, oh, you don't know him. You simply don't know him. She stopped, her eyes shining, her whole body stirred by her happiness. She came over and stood close to him. Henry, whatever happens, whatever happens, nothing can take me away from you and mother and the rest. Not from Garth. If you're sure of that, you needn't be afraid of Philip. Henry looked up at her. Suppose, Catherine, just suppose that he insisted on your going, leaving us all, leaving Garth, going right away somewhere. What would you do? Catherine smiled with perfect confidence. He wouldn't insist on anything that would make me so unhappy, or anyone unhappy. All he wants is that everyone should like everyone else, and that no one should be hurt. I'm not sure, said Henry, whether it isn't that sort who hurt people most in the end. He took her hand in his. He can do anything he likes, Catherine, anything, and I'll adore him madly, so long as he doesn't hurt you. If he does that... Aunt Aggie, standing in the doorway with the look of one who must live up to having had breakfast in bed, interrupted them. "'Ah, Catherine, there you are. The last thing I want is to give trouble to anyone, but I passed so poor a night that I feel quite unequal to marking those pillowcases that I offered yesterday to do for your mother. I was so anxious yesterday afternoon to help her, as indeed I always am, but of course I couldn't foretell that my night would be so disturbed. I wonder whether you—' "'Why, of course, Aunt Aggie,' said Catherine." Henry's morning reflections resolved themselves finally into the decision that to continue his emancipation he would definitely, before the day closed, penetrate into the heart of his club. He found, when he arrived there, that he was so deeply occupied with thoughts of Catherine, Philip, and himself, that he knew no fear. He boldly passed the old man in the hall, who exactly resembled a goat, climbed the stairs with the air of one who had been doing it all his life, and discovered a room with a fire, a table with papers, some bookcases with ancient books, and Seymour. That gentleman was standing before the fire, a smile of beaming self-satisfaction upon his red, fat face. He greeted Henry with that altruistic welcome that was peculiarly his own, a manner that implied that God had sent him especially into the world to show other men how to be jolly, optimistic, kind-hearted, and healthy. "'Why, you ever expected to see you here?' he cried. You're yellow about the gills, my son. Have a whisky and soda. Uh, no, thank you, said Henry, with an internal shudder. I thought I'd just look in. Why, of course, said Seymour. How jolly to see you. They drew their chairs in front of the fire and talked. At least Seymour talked. He told Henry what a lucky fellow he, Seymour, was, how jolly the world was, how splendid the weather was. He let slip by accident the facts that three publishers were fighting for his next book, that America had gone mad about his last one, although I always said, you know, that to be popular in America was a sure sign that one was no good. 
and that he'd overheard some woman at a party saying that he was the most interesting young man of the day. He told these tales with an air as though he would imply, "'How absurd these people are! How ridiculous!' Then suddenly he paused. It seemed that he had remembered something. "'By the way, Trenchard, I knew there was something. There's a fellow in this club. Just been lunching with him. I don't expect he's gone. I want you to meet him. I was thinking about you at luncheon. He's just come from Moscow, where he's been two years.' "'Moscow?' said Henry. "'Yes, I'll go and find him. He may have left if I don't go now.' Seymour hurried away to return an instant later, with a very much dressed young man in a purple suit and a high, shrill voice. He gave Henry a languid finger, said that he wouldn't mind a drink, and sat down in front of the fire. Seymour began a fresh monologue. The young man, Morrison was his name, drank his whisky with a delicate foreign attitude which Henry greatly admired, said at last that he must be going. It was only then that Henry plucked up courage. "'I say, Seymour tells me you've just come from Moscow.' "'Yes, damn rotten town,' said Morrison. Two years of it nearly killed me.' "'Do you happen to know,' said Henry, "'a man there called Mark?' "'What, Phil Mark? I think I did. Everyone knew Phil Mark. Hot stuff, my word.' "'I beg your pardon,' said Henry. Mr. Morrison looked at Henry with curiosity, stared into his glass, found that it was empty, rose and brushed his trousers. Went the pace. Had a mistress there for years. Girl out of the ballet. Everyone knew about it. Had a kid, but the kid died. And a seated sort of fellow. No one liked him. No, I didn't. It can't have been the same man, said Henry slowly. No, dare say not, said Morrison languidly. Name of Philip, though. Short, square fellow. Bit fat. Black hair. He was in Maddox and Customs. Made a bit of money, they said. He chucked the girl and came to England. "'Here somewhere now, I believe.' He looked at Henry and Seymour, found them silent, disliked the stare in Henry's eyes, saw a speck of dust on his waistcoat, was very serious about this, found the silence unpleasant, and broke away. "'Well, so long, you fellows. Must be toddling.' He wandered out, his bent shoulders expressing great contempt for his company. Seymour had watched his young friend's face. He was, for once, at a loss. He had known what would occur. He had produced Morrison for no other purpose. He had hated Mark since that day at the Trenchard's house, with all the unresting hatred of one whose whole peace of mind depends on the admiration of others. Morrison had told him stories about Mark. He did not himself wish to inform Henry, because his own acquaintance with the family and knowledge of Miss Trenchard's engagement made it difficult. But he had no objection at all to Morrison's agency. He was frightened now at Henry's white face and staring eyes. "'Did you know this?' Henry said. "'Upon my word, Trenchard, no idea. Morrison was talking the other day about Englishmen in Moscow, and mentioned Mark, I think, but I, I never connected him. If I'd thought he was coming out with it like that, of course I'd have stopped him, but he didn't know.' "'He's lying. Don't know why he should. He's no idea your sister was engaged. It's a bit rotten, isn't it? I'm awfully sorry.' Henry stared at him. "'I believe you did know. I believe you meant him to tell me. That's what you brought him for. You hate Mark, anyway.' Henry laughed, then broke off, stared about him as though he did not know where he was, and rushed from the room. He did not know through what streets he passed. He saw no people, heard no noise, was conscious neither of light nor darkness. He knew that it was true. Mark was a blackguard. "'Catherine! Catherine!' As he crossed the bridge in St. James's Park, he tumbled against a man and knocked off his hat. He did not stop to apologise. What was he to do? What was he to do? Why had it been he who had heard this? In the dark hall of the house he saw Catherine. She spoke to him. He tore past her, tumbling upstairs, running down the passage as though someone pursued him. His bedroom door banged behind him. End of Book Two Chapter Three Book Two, Chapter Four of *The Green Mirror* by Hugh Walpole. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Book Two, Chapter Four: Garth in Roselands. Philip, on the day following his evening with Henry, left London to spend three weeks with some relations who lived near Manchester. 
This was the first parting from him that Catherine had suffered since the beginning of their engagement, and when she had said good-bye to him at the station, she seemed to return through empty streets, through a town without colour or movement, and the house, when she entered it, echoed through its desolate rooms and passages to her steps. She resolved at once, however, that now was the time to show the family that she was the same Catherine as she had ever been. As she waited for a little in her bedroom, finally dismissing Philip's presence and summoning the others, she laughed to think how simply now she would brush away the little distrusts and suspicions that seemed during these last weeks to have grown about her. "'They shall know Phil,' she thought to herself. "'They can't help loving him when they see him as he really is. Anyway, no more keeping anything back.' It seemed to her at that moment a very simple thing to impart her happiness to all of them. She had no fear that she would fail. Then almost at once the most delightful thing occurred. Two or three days after Philip's departure, Mrs. Trenchard, alone with Catherine in the dining-room before breakfast, said, "'I've written to Philip, my dear, to ask him to go down with us to Garth.' Catherine's eyes shone with pleasure. "'Mother, how delightful of you! I was hoping that perhaps you might ask him later. But isn't it tiresome to have him so soon?' "'No, my dear, no, not tiresome at all. I hope he'll be able to come.' "'Of course he'll be able to come,' laughed Catherine. "'Yes, well, I've written to ask him. We go down on the 5th of March. Your father thinks that's the best day. Griffiths writes that that business of the fences and column meadow should be looked into. Yes. No, Alice, not the harm. Tell Grace to boil two more eggs. Not enough. I'm glad you're pleased, Catherine.' Catherine looked up, and her eyes meeting her mother's, the confidence that had been clouded ever since that fatal affair with the hot water bottles seemed to leap into life between them. Mrs. Trenchard put out her hand. Catherine moved forward. But at that moment Aunt Aggie and Aunt Betty entered. Breakfast began. I believe, thought Catherine, Aunt Aggie waits outside the door and chooses her moment. She's always interrupting. The fact that there was now some restraint between her mother and herself was only emphasised the more by the feeling of both of them that an opportunity had been missed. And why, Catherine wondered afterwards, had her mother asked Philip? If he had been invited to come to them after Easter, but now to go down with them as one of the family, was this not exactly what Catherine had been desiring? And yet she was uncomfortable. She felt sometimes now that her mother, who had once been her other self, in whose every thought, distress, anxiety she had shared, was almost a stranger. It's just as though there were ghosts in the house, she thought. As she went to bed, she was, for the first time in her life, lonely. She longed for Philip. Then suddenly, for no reason that she could name, began to cry, and, so crying, fell asleep. She was much younger than every one thought her. Throughout the three weeks that followed, she felt as though she were beating the air. Rachel Seddon had taken her husband abroad. There was no one to whom she could speak. She wrote to Philip every day, and discovered how useless letters were. She tried to approach Milly, but found that she had not the courage to risk Milly's frankness. Her sister's attitude to her was, "'Dear Katie, let's be happy and jolly together without talking about it. It's much better.' There had been a time, well, not so very long ago, when they told one another everything. Henry was the strangest of all. He removed himself from the whole family, and would speak to no one. He went apparently for long, solitary walks. Even his father noticed his depression, and decided that something must really be done with the boy. We might send him abroad for six months, learn some French or German. But, of course, nothing was done. Aunt Betty was the only entirely satisfactory member of the family. She frankly revelled in the romance of the whole affair. She was delighted that Catherine had fallen in love with such a fine, manly fellow as Philip. Her attention was always centred upon Catherine, to the exclusion of the others. Therefore she noticed no restraint nor awkwardness. She was intensely happy, and went humming about the house in a way that annoyed desperately her sister Aggie. She even wrote a little letter to Philip, beginning, "'My dear boy,' saying that she thought that he'd like to know from one of the family that Catherine was in perfect health and looked beautiful. She received a letter from Philip that surprised and delighted her by its warmth of feeling. This letter was the cause of a little battle with Aggie. They were alone together in Betty's room when she said, half to herself, 
"'Such a delightful letter from the dear boy.' "'What dear boy?' said Aunt Aggie sharply. Aunt Betty started, as she always did when anyone spoke to her sharply, sucked her fingers, and then, the colour mounting into her cheeks, said, "'Philip, he's written to me from Manchester.' "'I do think, Betty,' Aggie answered, "'that instead of writing letters to young men who don't want them, "'you might try to take a little of the burden of this house off my shoulders. "'Now that Catherine has lost all her common sense, "'I am supposed to, to do everything. "'I don't complain. "'They wish me to help as much as I can, "'but I'm far from strong, and a little help from you.' "'Then Aunt Betty, with the effect of standing on her toes, "'her voice quite shrill with excitement, "'spoke to her sister as she had never in all her life "'spoken to anyone before.' "'It's too bad, Aggie. I used to think that you were fond of Catherine, that you wished her happiness. Now, ever since her engagement, you've done nothing but complain about her. Sometimes I think he really wants to see her unhappy. We ought to be glad, you and I, that she's found someone who will make her happy. It's all your selfishness, Aggie, just because you don't like Philip for some fancied reason. It's unfair and wicked. At any rate, to me, you shan't speak against Catherine and Philip.' I love Catherine, even though you don't. Now it happened that, as I have said elsewhere, Aggie Trenchard loved her niece very deeply. It was a love, however, that depended for its life on an adequate return. That young man has turned Catherine against me. Ever since he first came into the house, I knew it. Now, at her sister's accusation, her face grew grey and her hands trembled. Thank you, Betty. I don't think we'll discuss the matter. Because you're blind and know nothing of what goes on under your nose is no reason that other people's sight should be blinded too. Can't you see for yourself the change in Catherine? If you loved her a little more sensibly than you do, instead of romancing about the affair, you'd look into the future. I tell you that the moment Philip Mark entered this house was the most unfortunate moment in Catherine's life. Nothing but unhappiness will come of it. If you knew what I know... Aunt Betty was, in spite of herself, struck by the feeling in her sister's voice. "'What do you mean?' she asked. "'I mean nothing. I am right, that's all. You're a silly soft fool, Elizabeth, and so you always were. But Harriet, asking him to go down to Garth with us, when she hates him as I know she does, I don't know what it means. Do you suppose that I don't love Catherine any longer? I love her so much that I'd like to strangle Mr. Philip Mark in his sleep.' She flung from the room, banging the door behind her. Philip arrived on the evening before the departure into the country. He came well pleased with all the world, because his Manchester relations had liked him, and he had liked his Manchester relations. Viewed from that happy distance, the Trenchards had been bathed in golden light. He reviewed his recent agitations and forebodings with laughter. <laughs> Our family, he told his relations, are a bit old-fashioned. They've got their prejudices, and I don't think they like the idea at first of her being engaged. She's so valuable. But they're getting used to it. He arrived in London in the highest spirits, greeted Rocket as though he had been his lifelong friend, and, going straight up to his room to dress for dinner, thought to himself that he really did feel at home in the old house. He looked at his fire, at the cosy shape of the room, heard a purring, contented clock ticking away, thought for a moment of Moscow with its puddles, its mud, its dark, uneven streets, its country roads, its weeks of rain. No, I've found my place, he thought. This is home. And yet, during dinner, his uneasiness, like a forgotten ghost, crept back to him. Henry had a headache and had gone to bed. He's not been very well lately, said Aunt Aggie to Philip. That evening with you upset him, I believe. Over-excited him, perhaps. I'm glad you like Manchester. He could not deny that dinner was a little stiff. He was suddenly aware over his pudding that he was afraid of Mrs. Trenchard, and that his fear of her that had been vague and nebulous before his absence was now sharp and defined. He looked at her, and saw that her eyes were anything but placid and contented, like the rest of her. "'More pudding, Philip?' she asked him, and his heart beat as though he had received a challenge. Afterwards, in the drawing-room, he thought to himself, "'Tis this beastly old house, it's so stuffy!' forgetting that two hours earlier it had seemed to welcome him home. "'We'll be all right when he went down to the country,' he thought. Finally he said good-night to Catherine in the dark little passage. As though he were giving himself some desperate reassurance, he caught her to him and held her tightly in his arms. 
Katie, darling, have you missed me? Miss you? I thought the days were never going to pass. Katie, I want to be married here, now, to-night, at once. I hate this waiting. I, I hate it. It's impossible. Catherine laughed, looking up into his eyes. I like you to be impatient. I'm so happy. I don't think anything can ever be happier. Besides, you know, and her eyes sparkled, you may change. You may want to break it off. And then think how glad you'll be that we waited. He held her then so fiercely that she cried out. Don't say that, even as a joke. How dare you, even as a joke. I love you, I love you, I love you. He kissed her mouth again and again. Then suddenly, with a little movement of tenderness, stroked her hair very softly, whispering to her, I love you, I love you, I love you. Oh, how I love you. That night she was so happy that she lay for many hours staring at the black ceiling, a smile on her lips. He also was awake until the early morning. The departure to the station was a terrific affair. There were Mr. Trenchard Sr., Great Aunt Sarah, risen from a bed of sickness, yellow and pinched in her face, very yellow and pinched in the temper, and deafer than deaf. Aunt Aggie, Aunt Betty, George Trenchard, Mrs. Trenchard, Millie, very pretty, Henry, very sulky, Catherine, Philip, Rocket, and Aunt Sarah's maid. The other maids had left by an earlier train. Twelve persons. The train to be caught was the eleven o'clock from Paddington, and two carriages had been reserved. The first business was to settle old Mr. Trenchard and Aunt Sarah. They were placed like images in the best corners, Mr. Trenchard saying something in his silvery voice, "'It's very kind of you, Harriet,' or "'Thank you, Betty, my dear,' and once to Milly, "'I like to see ye laughing, my dear. Very pretty, very pretty.' Aunt Sarah frowned and wrinkled her nose, but was in her high black bonnet a very fine figure. Her maid, Clarence, was plain, elderly, and masculine in appearance, having a moustache and a stiff linen collar and very little hair visible under her black straw hat. She, however, knew just how great Aunt Sarah liked to be. The others in that compartment were Aunt Aggie, George Trenchard, he sat next to his father and told him jokes out of the papers, and Mrs. Trenchard. In the other carriage, Catherine and Philip had the corners by the window. Aunt Betty sat next to Philip, Millie and Henry had the farther corners. When the train started, Catherine's heart gave a jump, as it always did when she set off for Garth. We're really off. We'll really be in Garth by the evening. We'll really wake up there tomorrow morning. Philip had not seen Henry since his return from Manchester, so he tried to talk to him. Henry, however, was engaged upon a very large edition of War and Peace, and although he answered Philip's inquiries very politely, he was obviously determined to speak to no one. Milly had Henry Galleon's Roads to read, but she did not study it very deeply. Aunt Betty had a novel called The Rosary and her knitting. Now and then she would break into little scraps of talk as, But if I move the bed across lengthways, that would leave room for the bookcase. Or, I do think people must be clever to make up conversations in books. Or, There's Reading. The lovers, therefore, were left to one another. Catherine had upon her lap the novel that had so greatly excited Henry. He had insisted upon her reading it, but now it lay idly there, unopened. That little smile that had hovered about her lips last night was still there today. Often her eyes were closed, and she might have seemed to be asleep were it not that the little smile was alive. Her eyes would open, they would meet Philip's eyes, they would be drawn, the two of them, closer and closer and closer. They talked together, their voices scarcely above a whisper. The day was one of those that are given sometimes, in a fit of forgetfulness by the gods, at the beginning of March. It was a very soft, misty day, with the sun warm and golden but veiled. Trees on the dim blue horizon were faintly pink, and streams that flashed for an instant before the windows were pigeon colour. Everywhere the earth seemed to be breaking, flowers pushing through the soil, rivers released from their winter bondage, laughing in their new freedom. The earth, chuckling, whispering, humming with the glorious excitement of its preparation, as though it had never had a spring in all its life before, as though it did not know that there would yet be savage winds, wild storms of rain, many cold and bitter days. Blue mist, running water, trees with their bursting buds, 
a haze of sun and rain in the air, a great and happy peace. Catherine and Philip, although they saw no one but one another, were aware of the day. It was as though it had been arranged especially for them. The rise and fall of their voices had a sleepy rhythm, as though they were keeping time with the hum of the train. "'I'm so glad,' said Catherine, "'that your first view of Glebeshire will be on a day like this.' "'I'm a little afraid,' he answered. "'What will you say if I don't like it?' She seemed really for an instant to be afraid. "'But of course, of course you will.' "'Everyone doesn't. "'Someone told me the other day "'that either it was desolate enough to depress you for a lifetime, "'or stuffy like a hothouse, "'and that the towns were the ugliest in the United Kingdom.' "'Catherine sighed and then smiled. "'I expect they think Manchester the loveliest place on earth,' she said. "'Then, looking at him very intently, she asked him, "'Do you regret Russia, the size and the space and the strangeness?' I dare say you do. Do you know, Phil, I'm rather jealous of Russia, of all the things you did before I knew you. I wonder whether I'd have liked you if I'd met you then, whether you'd have liked me. I expect you were very different. Tell me about it. I'm always asking you about Moscow, and you're so mysterious. Yes, I believe I'm jealous. Philip looked away from her, out of the window, at the fields with their neat hedges, the gentle hills faintly purple. Villages tucked into nests of trees, cows grazing, horses mildly alert at the passing train. For a moment he was conscious of irritation at the tidy cosiness of it all. Then he spoke dreamily, as though he were talking in his sleep. No, that's all behind me. I shall never go back there again. I don't think of it often, but sometimes I fancy I'm there. Science will bring it back, and I dream sometimes. One gets so used to it that it's hard now to say what one did feel about it. I had a little flat in a part of the town called the Arbat. Out of my window I could see a church with sky-blue domes covered with silver stars. There was a shop with food, sausages, and all kinds of dried fish, and great barrels of red caviar and mountains of cheese. The church had a cherry-coloured wall with a glittering icon at the gate and a little lamp burning in front of it. There were always some cabs at the end of my street, with the cabmen in their fat, bunched-up clothes, sleeping very often, their heads hanging from the shafts. Lines of carts from the country would pass down the street with great hoops of coloured wood over the horses' necks, and wild-looking peasants in charge of them. They didn't seem wild to me then. They were quite ordinary. Always just before six, the bells at the church would ring, one slow, deep note, and a little funny, noisy jangle as well, one beautiful and unearthly, the other like a talkative woman, all human. In the autumn there'd be weeks of rain, and the mud would rise and rise, and the carts and cabs go splashing through great streams of water. When the snow came there'd be fine days, and the town on fire all sparkling and quivering, and every ugly thing in the place would be beautiful. There'd be many days, too, when the sky would fall lower and lower, and the town be like grey blotting paper, and the most beautiful things hideous. Opposite my window there was a half-built house that had been there for three years, and no one had troubled to finish it. There was a beggar at the corner, a fine old man with no legs. He must have made a fortune, because everyone who passed gave him something. It would be fine on a snowy night when the night watchman built great fires of logs to keep them warm. On a starry night I could see the domes of St. Saviour's Cathedral like little golden clouds. Very beautiful. "'And what was the inside of your flat like?' asked Catherine. She had been leaning a little forward, her hands clasped together, deeply interested. "'Oh, very small. I made it as English as I could. It had central heating, and in the winter, with the double windows, it got very stuffy. I had English pictures and English books, but it was never very comfortable. I don't know why. Nothing in Russia's comfortable. I had a funny old servant called Sonia. She was fond of me, but she drank. She was always having relations to stay with her. I would find funny-looking men in the kitchen in the morning. She had no idea of time, and would cook well or badly as she pleased. She liked to tell fairy stories. She stole, and she drank, and she lied. But I kept her because I couldn't bother to change her. He stopped, then began again, 
but now more dreamily than before, as though he had been carried far away from the train, from England, from Catherine. Yes, that was it. One couldn't be bothered. One couldn't be bothered about anything, and one didn't need to bother because no one else bothered either. Perhaps that's just why I loved it, as I see now that I did love it. No one cared for anything but what was in the air, dreams, superstitions, stories. The country itself was like that, too, so vague, so vast and boundless, so careless and heedless, so unpractical, so good for dreams, so bad for work, so unfinished, letting so many things go to pieces, so beautiful and so ugly, so depressing and so cheerful, so full of music and of ugly sounds, so bad to live in, so good to dream in. I was happy there, and I didn't know it. I was happy, and didn't know it." His voice had sunk to a whisper, so that Catherine could not catch his words. She touched the sleeve of his coat. "'Come back, Phil. Come back,' she said, laughing. "'You are lost.' He started, then smiled at her. "'It's all right, but it's odd. There are so many things that didn't seem to me to be curious and beautiful then, that are so now. Then, looking at Catherine very intently, as though he were calling her back to him, he said, "'But don't talk to me about Russia. It's bad for me. I don't want to think of it. I've left it for ever. And when you ask me questions, it revives it, as though it still had some power. You say that you're afraid of it. Why?' he ended laughing. "'I believe I'm afraid of it, too. I don't want to think of it. It's England now, and Glebeshire, and you.' "'And you,' he whispered. They were interrupted then by an attendant, who told them that it was time for the first luncheon. Afterwards, when the shadows were lengthening across the fields, and the misty sun rode low above the far hills, they sat silently dreaming of their great happiness. It was an afternoon that was to remain for both of them, throughout their lives, in spite of all after-events, a most perfect memory. There are moments in the histories of all of us when we are carried into heights that by the splendour of their view the fine vigour of their air, the rapture of their achievement, offer to us a sufficient reassurance against the ironic powers. We find in them a justification of our hopes, our confidences, our inspirations, our faith. So, for these few hours at least, Catherine and Philip found their justification. This was a moment that two others also in that carriage were never afterwards to forget. Milly, under the warm afternoon sun, had fallen asleep. She woke to a sudden, half-real, half-fantastic realisation of Philip. She was awake, of course, and yet Philip was not quite human to her. Or was it that he was more human than he had ever been before? She watched him, with her young, eager, inquisitive gaze, over the cover of her book. She watched him steadily for a long time. She had always liked the clean, bullet-shaped head, his black eyes, his sturdiness and set square shoulders, his colour and his strength. She had always liked him, but to-day in this sudden glimpse he seemed to be revealed to her as someone whom she was seeing for the first time. Milly, in all the freshness of her anticipated attack upon the world, had at this period very little patience for bunglers, for sentimentalists, for nervous and hesitating souls. Now, strangely, she saw in Philip's eyes some hinted weakness, and yet she did not despise him. "'I believe,' she thought, "'he's afraid of us.' That discovery came as though it had been whispered to her by someone who knew. Her old conviction that she knew him better than did the others showed now no signs of faltering. "'I believe I could help him as they none of them can,' she thought. "'No, not even Catherine.' She had in spite of her determined, practical common sense, the most romantic idea of love. And now, as she thought of the two of them wrapped up there before her eyes in one another, she felt irritated by her own isolation. "'I wonder whether Catherine understands him really,' she thought. "'Catherine's so simple, and takes everything for granted. It's enough for her that she's in love. I don't believe it's enough for him.' She had always, in her very early days, felt some protecting motherly element in her love for Catherine. 
That protection seems now to spread to Philip as well. Oh, I do hope they're going to be happy, she thought, and so, taking them both with her under her wing, dozed off to sleep again. The other was, of course, Henry. No one could ever call Henry a gay youth. I don't think that anyone ever did. And although with every year that he grows he is stronger, more cheerful, and less clumsy and misanthropic, he will never be really gay. He will always be far too conscious of the troubles that may tumble onto his head, of the tragedies of his friends and the evils of his country. And yet, in spite of his temperament, he had, deep down in his soul, a sense of humour, an appreciation of his own comic appearance, a ready applause for the optimists, although to this he would never, never confess. "'He's a surly brute,' I heard someone say of him once. "'But it is possible, I do not say probable, that he will be a great man one of these days, and then every one will admire his fine reserve, the taciturnity of a great man.' In one of his sudden moments of confidence he confessed to me that this particular journey down to Glebeshire was the beginning of the worst time in his life. Not, of course, quite the beginning. Philip's appearance on that foggy night of his grandfather's birthday was that. And he is even now not so old, but that there may be plenty of bad times in store for him. But he will know now how to meet them. This was his first test of responsibility. He had always told himself that what he really wanted was to show, in some heroic fashion, his love for Catherine. Let him be tested, he cried, by fire, stake, torture, and the block, and he would show them. Well, the test had come. As he sat opposite her in the railway carriage, he faced it. He might go up to Philip and say to him, Look here, is it true? Did you have a mistress in Moscow for three years, and have a son by her? But what then? If Philip laughed and said, Why, of course, everyone knows it. That's all over now. What is it to you? He would answer, It's this to me. I'm not going to have a rotten swelp of a fellow marrying my sister and making her miserable. Then Philip might say, My dear child, how young you are. All men do these things. I've finished with that part of my life. But anyway, don't interfere between me and Catherine. You'll only make her miserable, and you'll do no good. Ah, that was just it. He would make her miserable. He could not look at her happiness and contemplate his own destruction of it. And yet if Philip were to marry her, and afterwards neglect her, and leave her as he had left this other woman, would not Henry then reproach himself most bitterly for ever and ever? But perhaps, after all, the story of that wretched man at the club was untrue. It had been, perhaps, grossly exaggerated. Henry had a crude but finely coloured fancy concerning the morals of the man of the world. Had not Seymour dismissed such things with a jolly laugh, and, "'My dear fellow, it's no business of ours. We're all very much alike, if we only knew.' Had he not a secret envy of this same man of the world, who carried off his sins so lightly with so graceful an air? But now it was no case of an abstract sinner. It was a case of the happiness or unhappiness of the person whom Henry loved best in life. A subtler temptation attacked him. He knew, he could not possibly doubt, that if his parents were told, Philip would have to go. One word from him to his mother, and the family were rid of this fellow who had come out of nowhere to disturb their peace. The thing was so infernally easy. As he sat there reading, apparently, his novel, his eyes were on Catherine's face. She was leaning back, her eyes closed, smiling at her thoughts. What would Catherine do? Would she leave them all and go with him? Would she hate him, Henry, for ever afterwards? Yes, that she would probably do. Ah, he was a weak, feeble, indeterminate creature. He could make up his mind about nothing. That evening he had had with Philip, it had been glorious and disgusting, thrilling and sordid. He was rather glad that he had been drunk. He was also ashamed. He was intensely relieved that none of the family had seen him, and yet he saw himself shouting to them, "'I was drunk the other night, and I talked to rotten women, and I didn't care what happened to me. I'm a boy no longer.' He hated Philip, and yet, perhaps, Philip was leading him to freedom. 
that fellow in the novel about the sea and the forests. Henry could see him challenging his foes, walking quietly across the square towards his friend, who was waiting to slay him. He would have admired Philip. Henry saw himself as that fine, solitary figure waiting for his opportunity. How grand he could be had he a chance! But life was so lofty, so unromantic, so conventional. Instead of meeting death like a hero, he must protect Catherine, and he did not know how to do it. As the sun was sinking in a thick golden web that glittered behind the dark purple woods, woods that seemed now to stand like watchers with their fingers upon their lips, the train crossed the boundary river. The crossing had been, ever since he could remember, a very great moment to Henry. Today the recognition of it dragged him away from Philip and Catherine, from everything but Glebeshire. He looked across at Catherine instinctively. She, sitting now upright, gazing out of the window, turned as though she had known, and smiled at him. They were in Glebeshire. There was the first valley, mysterious, now like a dark purple cup. There the white winding road that went over the hill on to Rasselas, Liscane, Clinton and Trukes. There was the first break in the hills, where you always peered forward expecting to catch a shimmer of the sea. Here that cluster of white cottages that, when he had been small, had seemed to be tumbling down the hill, very dangerous to live in. At last the pause at Carlion, the last stop before Rasselas. It was quite dark now. The light had suddenly been drawn from the sky, and the earth was filled with new sounds, new scents, new mysteries. The train stopped for a minute before Rasselas, and suddenly all about it, through the open window, there crowded whispers, stealthy movements, the secret confidences of some hidden stream, the murmured greetings of the trees. The train lay there, as though it had wanted them all to know how lovely the evening was. On the road that skirted the train, a man with a lantern greeted a cart. "'Well, good night to ye,' a voice said, clear and sharp, like an invitation. Henry's heart began to beat furiously. Glebeshire had welcomed them. With a jerk the train stumbled forward again, and they were in Rasselas. The little station, which was of some importance because it was a junction for Pellint, and therefore also for Raphael, lay very quietly at the bottom of the wooded hill. A porter went down the train, swinging a lantern and crying, "'Change for Berlin! Change for Berlin!' A stream flowed nearby and the scent of a garden flooded the station. There would be already snowdrops and primroses and crocuses. The whole party of them were bundled out onto the platform. A great pile of luggage loomed in the distance. Heads from the carriage windows watched them. Then a pause, a cry, and the train was off, leaving them all high and dry, with wind blowing round their hair and clothes and ankles like a friendly and inquisitive dog. There was sea in the wind. "'Smell the sea!' cried Milly. "'I must have left it in the restaurant car,' said Aunt Aggie. "'Too provoking. I particularly want you to read that article, Harriet. "'I think you might have noticed, Milly. "'You were sitting next to me.' "'There's Jacob!' Henry, suddenly happy and excited and free from all burdens, cried. "'Hello, Jacob. How are you? How's everyone? How's Rebecca?' Jacob, with a face like a red moon, smiled, touched his hat, stormed at a young man in buttons. "'Do ye bustle a bit, John? Didn't I tell ye the box with the black handles?' Oh, "'Very comfortable, Mr. Henry, sir, thank ye, as I hopes you find yourself. Been a bit of sickness around down along in the village, but not to hurt.' Could they all get in? Of course they could. The luggage was all on the luggage cart, and Rock and Clarence with it. A silver moon, just rising now above the station roofs, peeping at her, laughed at her serious dignity. "'No, we'll go on the box, Philip and I,' said Catherine. "'Of course I shan't be cold. "'No, really, we'd rather, wouldn't we, Philip? "'Plenty of room, Jacob.' They were off, up the little hill, down over the little bridge, and through the little village. Catherine, sitting between Philip and Jacob, pressing her cheek against Philip's rough tweed coat, her hand lying in his under the rug, seemed to slip dreaming, fulfilling some earlier vision, through space. She wondered sometimes, in the earlier days, whether there could be any greater happiness in life than that ever-thrilling, ever-satisfying return to Garth. She knew now that there was a greater happiness. 
A white world of crackling, burning stars roofed them in. An owl flew by them through the grey dusk. The air smelt of spring flowers and fresh, damp soil. The stream that had been with them since their entrance into Glebeshire still accompanied them, running with its friendly welcome at their side. Beyond the deep black hedges, cows and horses and sheep moved stealthily. It seemed that they might not disturb the wonderful silence of the night. "'Are you warm enough?' he asked her. He caught her hand more tightly and kissed her cheek, very softly and gently. She trembled with happiness and pressed more closely against his coat. "'Can you smell the sea yet? You will when we get to the top of Rasselas Hill. This is the high road to Pelint. It runs parallel with the railway until we get to the crossroads. Pelint Cross, you know. You'll smell the sea there. You can see it on a clear day. To the left of you view there is Pelint Moor. It runs for miles and miles right along by the Drymouth Road. Look through the break in the hedge. Do you see that light across the field? That's John Pollen's cottage.' John was murdered just about a hundred years ago. He was an old miser, and some men robbed him, but they never found his head. They say he wanders about still looking for it. Oh, if this could go on for ever! Philip, are you happy? Happy? Ah, she could feel his body quiver. Yes, and now we're coming down to the well. There's a little wood just at the bottom of the hill. We always call it the well because it's so dark and green. It's the most famous wood for primroses in all Glebeshire. They'll be coming now. We'll walk here. I cried once because I thought I was lost here. They forgot me and went home. Then I was comforted by the postman who found me and carried me home. Jacob, do you remember? Ah, oh, Miss Cathy, don't you think that I forget all about E? Not likely. And your mother in a fine taking, poor soul, too. We're coming to Polint Cross now, sir. As famous as any spot of ground in the whole of Glebeshire, sir. Hup them, hup, hup, way, ho, oh, oh, ho, hup them. They pulled to the top, leaving the wood in the dip behind them. The wind met them, flinging its salt and freshness in their faces with a rough, wild greeting. Philip could hear suddenly the humming of the telegraph wires, as though they had sprung from their imprisonment in the valley and were chanting their victory. To his left, vague and formless under the starlight, stretched Pellint Moor, waiting there, scornfully confident in its age and strength and power for daylight. The salt wind flung its arms around them and dragged them forward. Philip, listening, could hear, very stealthily, with the rhythm of armed men marching, the beating of the sea. "'Now we're near, now we're very near. It'll be Garth Cross in a minute. There it is. Now we turn off fur down to the almshouses. We don't really come into the village.' There are the almshouses, and the common. Now round the corner. There it is. There's the gate. The gate. Oh, Philip, are you happy? She was crying a very little. Her eyes were blurred as they turned up the long drive, past all the rhododendron bushes, past the lawn with the great giant oak at the farther end of it, round the curve to the hall door, with Rebecca standing under the porch to welcome them. Philip was down, and had helped her to the ground. She stood a little away from them all as they laughed and chattered about the door. She wiped her eyes with her gloved hand to stop the tears. Philip was conscious of standing in a long, dark hall with stairs at the end of it, and a large oak chest with a glass case that contained a stuffed bird, taking up much of the space. That, he always afterwards remembered, was his first impression of the house, that it was absurd to put so large a chest just there where everyone would knock against it. A misty babble of talk surrounded him. He was conscious of a tall old woman wearing a high, stiffly starched white cap. She had a fine colour, very dark red cheeks, hair a deep black, and flashing eyes. She must be between sixty and seventy, but her body was straight and vigorous. This was, he supposed, Rebecca. He saw in the background old Mr. Trenchard being helped up the stairs by Rocket. He heard Aunt Betty in a happy twitter. "'Ah, oh, now, this is nice, this is nice, how nice this is!' He heard Mrs. Trenchard's slow, sleepy voice. "'No, the train was punctual, Rebecca, quite punctual. We had luncheon on the train. Yes, we were quite punctual.' Someone said, "'I'll show Philip his room.' And George Trenchard, laughing, cried to him, "'Come on, Philip, this way, this way.' 
Trenchard, like a boy, bounded up the stairs in front of him. They were old, black, winding and creaking stairs that sighed as he mounted them. Trenchard cried, "'To the right now. Uh, mind your head!' They turned through a little passage, so low that Philip must bend double, and so dark that he could see nothing before him. He put out his hand, touched Trenchard's broad back, and was surprised at his sense of relief. Now they walked along another passage, very narrow, white walls with coloured sporting prints hanging on them. "'Ah, here's the blue room. Here you are. Come, you'll like it. Got a decent view. Brought you hot water. Ah, yes, there it is. When you've washed, come down just as you are. Don't bother to change. It's only supper to-night, you know. Right you are. His room was charming, with cherry-coloured wallpaper on walls that seemed a thousand years old. He flung his windows open, and there was the moon, thin, sharp, quivering with light in the sky, and he could hear the stream that had accompanied him ever since his entry into Glebeshire, still singing to him. The night air was so sweet, the trees that sighed and trembled and sighed again, so intimate. There was an intimacy here that he had never felt in any country before. There was an intimacy, and also for him at any rate, some strange loneliness. He closed the window. He found his way down into the hall, and there saw Catherine. "'Quick!' she cried. "'Quick! I hope that you come down before the others. We've got ten minutes.' She was almost dancing with excitement. She, his staid, reserved Catherine. She was pulling him by the arm, out through the door, under the porch, into the garden. She ran across the lawn, and he, more slowly, followed her. He caught her, and held her close to him. "'You love it, Philip, don't you? You must. Of course, you've hardly seen anything to-night. Tomorrow we must both get up early before anyone else and come down. But look back now. Isn't the house simply—isn't it? Don't you feel the happiness and cosiness and friendliness? Oh, you, you must, you must!' "'When I've got you, I don't want anything.' "'Everything is lovely. "'But you're happy now to be here, aren't you?' "'Very happy. "'And you, you won't be disappointed, will you? "'You must promise me that you won't be disappointed.' "'I promise you. "'And there's so much to show you. "'Oh, it's so wonderful to have all the old places that I've loved so long, "'to have them all to show you, to share them all with you. "'Oh, wonderful, wonderful!' "'Yes, I'll share them all with you. "'But, but Catherine, darling, no, turn round, come closer.' There, like that. I don't want to share you with them. I don't want to share you with anything or anyone. You don't. You can't. Of course you can't. I'm all yours. But then this is part of me, so it's all yours too. And you couldn't live away from it? You couldn't imagine having to be right away from it if I had to live somewhere else? But why should you? You won't have to live somewhere else. And let's not imagine anything things are so lovely, so perfect as they are. I don't like imagining things. I, I can't when this is all so real. Katie, Katie, no, 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 come closer, much closer. I don't care if I do hurt you. I want to. I want you, you, you. It's what I said last night. Let's marry soon, not this awful year. I feel, I don't know, I, I imagine too much. I suppose... I feel as though you'd escaped me, as though they'd all come between you and taken you away. If only you were mine, I'd never care again. We'd stay anywhere, do anything you like, but this is so hard to wait like this, to see you caring so much for other people who don't perhaps care for me. I want you. I want you, all of you. And I've only got half. Half? She laughed triumphantly. You have all of me, all of me, for ever. Philip, how funny you are! Why, you don't trust me! I wait for ever, if necessary, and never doubt for an instant that anything could come between. I trust you as I trust this place." A voice broke in upon them. Someone called, "'Catherine! Catherine!' Slowly she drew away from him. "'That's mother. I must go.' He caught her hand. Stay a little longer. They can wait. "'No, it's mother. She wants me. Come on, Phil, darling. Supper time. We'll creep out again afterwards. She crossed the lawn, expecting Philip to follow her. But he stayed there under the oak tree. He heard the voices laughing and calling in the lighted house. He was suddenly desperately lonely. He was frightened. 
he crossed hurriedly the lawn, and as he walked he knew that what he wanted was that someone, someone who really knew him, should come and comfort him. Before he entered the hall he stopped and looked back into the dark garden. Was there someone beneath the oak, someone who watched him with an ironical, indulgent smile? No, there was no one there. But he knew who it was that could comfort him. With a swift, sharp accusation of disloyalty, he confessed to himself that it was Anna for whom, during that instant, he had looked. End of Book Two, Chapter Four Book Two, Chapter Five of The Green Mirror by Hugh Walpole. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Book Two, Chapter Five The Feast. Some entries in Milly's diary. March the twelfth. Wind and rain like anything. Been in most of the day patching up the screen in my bedroom with new pictures. Got them as much like the old ones as possible. Went for an hour's tussle with the wind out to the cross, and it was fine. Wish I could have gone over to Raphael. The sea must have been fine today, coming in over the peak. Father drove Philip over to Polchester in the morning. Felt bored and out of temper in the evening. March 13th. Katie and Philip had their first tiff this morning, at least first I've seen. He wanted her to go off with him for the day. She got to stop and help Mother with the merriments from Polneaton coming to tea. Mother said it didn't matter, but I could see that she was awfully pleased when Kay stayed. But if I'd been Kay, I'd have gone. What does a family matter when one's in love? And she is in love more than anyone I've ever seen. But I think she's disappointed with Phil for not caring more about Garth, although she never owns it. I'm sorry for him. He wanders about not knowing what to do with himself and everyone's too busy to think of him. I try, but he doesn't want me. He wants Catherine, and thinks he ought to have her all the time. Aunt Aggie makes things worse in every way she can. March 15th. Cross all day. Garth isn't quite so nice this time, somehow. Is it because of Paris? I don't think so. He used to make one care all the more. I think Philip upsets one. When you see someone criticising something you've always loved, it makes you hot defending it, but also, although you never own it, it makes you see weak spots. Then he stirs my imagination as no one ever has done before. I believe he always sees the place he's not in much more vividly than the place he is. If I were Katie, I'd marry him tomorrow and make sure of him. Not that he isn't in love with her. He is, more every day. But he doesn't want to divide her with us, and she doesn't understand it, and we won't have it. So there you are. March 16th. Henry's very queer today. I wish they'd send him to Oxford to do something with him. It's so hard on him to let him hang around doing nothing. It's so bad for him, too. I think he hates Philip, but is fascinated by him. He took me into the garden after lunch today, as though he were going to tell me something very important. He was so very mysterious, and said I could advise him, and he was dreadfully worried. Then he suddenly stopped, said it was nothing, and wasn't it a fine day? I know I shall kill Henry one day. He thinks he's so important and has got a great destiny, whereas he can't even keep his face clean. So I told him, and then I wanted to hug him and comfort him. I'm really awfully fond of him, but I do wish he was nice and smart like other men. March 17th. Had a long walk with Philip this afternoon. Really, I do like him most tremendously, partly, I think, because he always treats me as though I'd come out years ago and knew all about everything. He talked all the time about Catherine, which was natural enough, I suppose. He said, what he told me in London, that he was frightened by her idea of him, and wished she thought him more than he was. He said he hated a long engagement, that he wished it were over. Then he said he was a poor sort of fellow for anyone so fine as Catherine. And I said that I didn't think it did to be too humble about oneself, and that I always made myself out as grand as I could in my mind. He said that it was Russia made one like that, that after you'd been in Russia a little, you doubted everyone and everything, most of all yourself. I said that I thought that rather flabby. But I do like him. I don't think Katie ought to insist so much on his liking Garth. She'll frighten him off it altogether if she does that. March the 19th. Rachel Seddon arrived. Mother asked her down. She doesn't generally come at this time, and she's only just back from abroad. 
but I think she wanted to see how the engagement's getting on. Of course she doesn't like Philip. You can see that in a moment. And of course he knows it. But he wants to make her like him. I wish he didn't care so much whether people like him or no. Henry quite his old self to-night, and we danced. I tried to teach him a cakewalk, in my room, and smashed a lamp of Aunt Aggie's. I'd quite forgotten her ceiling was my floor. The house is awfully old and shaky. Letter from Rose Latouche. Paris does seem funny to think of here. Part of a letter that was never posted. I haven't written to you all these weeks, because I was determined not to write to Russia until I was settled and happy and married for life. Then, also, you yourself have not written. Have you all over there forgotten me? Russians never do write letters, do they? I don't suppose I ought to be disappointed. You warned me. If I've forgotten all of you there, but I haven't. I thought for a time that I had, but I haven't. Then a bell rings, and all the servants troop in and kneel down in a row with their heels up, and George Trenchard reads a bit out of the New Testament, and, very fast, a prayer about thy humble servants, and he has his eye on the weather out of the window all the time. Afterwards there is the post, also eggs, bacon, marmalade, brown bread and white, and the family arriving one by one with, "'Sorry, I'm late!' Fancy a Russian saying, "'Sorry, I'm late!' So the day's begun. Afterwards everyone has their own especial job. I don't know what my special job is supposed to be. George has his writing, and the whole place, fences, weeds, horses, dogs, anything you like. He fancies himself Walter Scott at Abbotsford, and is as happy as the day is long. Mrs. Trenchard has the village in the inside of the house, with Catherine, her lieutenant. There is no living soul from the infant of a week to the old man of ninety-seven, John Wesley Moyle, he sees visions, who does not have his or her life exactly and precisely arranged. Mrs. Trenchard has a quiet hypnotic power that fills me with terror, because I know that I soon shall be ranged with all the others. She's kindness itself, I'm sure, and no cloud passing across the sun's face makes less sound. And yet she has always her way. Oh, poor old man, I'm frightened of her, as I've never been of any one before. When I see her here I want to run. I had a horrible dream last night. The terror of it is with me still. I thought that I said good-night to everyone and went up to my bedroom. To my surprise I found Mrs. Trenchard there, and instead of my usual bed was an enormous feather-bed, an enormous one, stretching from wall to wall. "'You will sleep on that to-night,' said Mrs. Trenchard, pointing to it. In some way I knew that if I once lay down upon it I should never get up again. I said, "'No, I would not lie down.' "'I think you'd better,' she said in her slow way. "'I think you'd better.' "'No,' I cried, "'I defy you.' Instantly the feather-bed, like a cloud, rose, filled the room, was above me, under me, around me. It pressed in upon me. I tore at it, and the feathers floated in a great stifling fog against my eyes, up my nose, in my mouth. I screamed for mercy. I fought, I fell, I was suffocating. Death was driving down upon me. I woke. <laughs> There's nonsense for you. And yet not such nonsense, neither. On a stuffy day here, when everything steams, and the trees and grass and hedges close up about the house like an army, when Mrs. Trenchard, with Catherine, is arranging meals and lives, birth and death, when, trying to escape down one of the lanes, they rise so high above one's head that it's like being drowned in a green bath, I tell you, the feather bed is not so far away. Suffocation seems no idle dream. The fact of the matter is that there's nothing here for me to do. It didn't matter having nothing to do in Russia, although, as a matter of fact, I always had plenty, because no one else had anything to do that couldn't be stopped at any moment for the sake of a friend, or a drink, or a bit of vague thinking. I suppose it's the order, the neatness, the punctuality, and at the same time the solid, matter-of-fact assumption that things must be exactly what they look, which they never are, that fusses me. But really, of course, I came down here to make love to Catherine, and I only get a bit of her. She cherishes the faith that I want the family as badly as I want her, and that the family want me as badly as she does. She's got a thousand little duties here that I'd never reckoned on, and they're like midges on a summer's evening. I would throw myself into their life if they would let me, but there doesn't seem any real place for me. It's fighting with shadows. George Trenchard takes me for drives. Millie, 
Catherine's sister, takes me for walks. Katie herself is, I do believe, with me whenever she can be. I ought to be satisfied. But only last night great-aunt Sarah, who is in her dotage, or pretends to be, said in the drawing-room to Milly in a loud whisper, "'Who is that young man, my dear, sitting over there? I seem to know his face.' "'That sort of thing doesn't exactly make you feel at home.' With all this, I feel the whole time that they are criticising me and waiting for me to make some big blunder. Then they say to Catherine, You see, my dear. Oh, of course I am not an ass to make a fuss. Any sensible fellow would just wait his year, marry Catherine, and say good-bye to the lot. But I shan't be able to say good-bye to the lot. That's the whole business. Partly because I'm weak, partly because Catherine adores them, partly because that is, I believe, Mrs. T.'s plan to absorb me, to swallow me, to have me ever afterwards, somewhere about the place, a colourless imitation of the rest of them. So they'll keep Katie, and I'm not important enough to matter. That's her plan. Is she stronger than I? Perhaps after all I shall snatch Catherine from them and escape with her, and then have her homesick for ever after. Why am I always imagining something that isn't here? Russia poisoned my blood. Sweet poison but poison all the same. You'll understand this letter, but if George Trenchard, or indeed any ordinary sensible Englishman, were to read it, what an ass he'd think me. If he thought more about the girl he were going to marry than about himself, he wouldn't have all this worry. But isn't it just that? If in nine months from now I swallowed whole by Mrs. T. marry Katie, will that be much fun for her? I shall be a sort of shadow or ghost." I can see myself running Mrs. Trenchard's errands, hurrying down to be in time for breakfast, although she never scolds anyone, sometimes waking, seeing myself, loathing, despising myself. Ah! Anna would understand. Anna, even when she laughed, understood. Anna! I don't think I should send this. I am determined to drive you all from me, until in a year's time I can think of you safely again. I described Moscow to Catherine in the train— and speaking of it has reminded me. Catherine could not remember that there had ever been a year since her eighth birthday when she had missed the feast at Raphael. The feast was held always on the 24th of March, unless that day were a Sunday. It had been held, old Dr. Pybus, the antiquarian of Palint, said, ever since Phoenician days. To Catherine the event was the crowning day of the spring. After the 24th there would be, of course, many cold, blustering days. Nevertheless, the spring, with primroses, violets, anemones thick in the four valleys that ran down to Raphael, the sky blue with white clouds like bubbles, the stream running crystal clear over the red soil, the spring was here, and the feast was its crowning. For the fishermen and their families, the feast meant a huge tea in the schools, great bonfires on the peak, the fish market, a drink at the pilchards, and above all, for the younger men and women, love and engagements. It was on the feast day that the young men of Raphael asked the young women whether they would walk out, and the young women said yes or no, according to their pleasure. On a fine night, with the bonfires blazing to the sky, and showers of golden sparks like fireflies over the quiet sea, there was no happier village in the world than Raphael. In its little square harbour, the stars and the fires and the amphitheatre-shaped village looked down, and the ghosts of the Phoenicians peered over the brow of the hill, sighed for the old times that they once knew, and crept at last, shivering, back into their graves. This was to be the greatest feast that Catherine had ever known, because Philip was, of course, to be with her. It was to be for them both the crowning of their love by the place, the soil, the good Liebscher earth. To Catherine it seemed that if anything untoward happened on this day, it would be as though Glebeshire itself rejected them. She would confess to no one how solemn it seemed to her. Uncle Tim was in charge of the party. Timothy Fawnda had not for many, many years missed a feast. Thither he went, his outward appearance cynical and careless as ever, but obeying inwardly more sacred instincts than he would acknowledge. He would be in charge of Catherine, Milly, Philip, Rachel. Henry did not care to go. The 24th of March was wonderful weather. Uncle Tim, coming over from his house up the road to luncheon, said that he had never seen a finer day. He said this to his sister Harriet, standing before the window of her little room, 
looking down upon the lawn that reflected the sunny shadows like a glass, looking down upon the clumps of daffodils that nodded their heads to him from the thick grass by the garden wall. Harriet was very fond of her brother. She had an intimate relationship with him that had never been expressed in words by either of them. She was a little afraid of him. She was sitting now, writing notes. She did not pause as she talked to him, and sometimes she rubbed the side of her nose with her fingers in a puzzled way. She wrote a large, sprawling hand, and often spelt her words wrongly. This conversation was before luncheon. "'Well, Harriet,' Tim said, "'how are you?' She looked up for a moment at his big, loose, untidy body, his shaggy beard, his ruffled hair. "'Why do you never brush your hair, Tim? Such a bad example for Henry. And you're standing in the light. Thank you. Oh, I'm very well. Why didn't you come in last night, as you said you would? Yes, I'm quite well, thank you.' "'I went walking,' said Timothy. "'I do brush my hair, only I'm not going to put grease on it for anybody. "'How do you like the young man?' Mrs. Trenchard nodded her head several times, as though she were adding up a sum. "'He likes it here, I think, although of course it must be quiet for him. "'And if Tuesday isn't convenient, suggest another day next week. "'So you don't like him even so much as you expected to?' "'No.' she answered quite abruptly, spreading her large hand flat out upon the table, as though by her sudden pounce she had caught a fly. "'He's weaker than I had fancied, and vainer, more insignificant altogether. Uh, Miss Proppert, the close Polchester.' "'He's weak, yes,' said Tim, staring down upon his sister. "'But he isn't insignificant. He's weak, because his imagination paints for him so clearly the dreadful state of things it would be if affairs went wrong.' He wants them terribly to make them right, but he hasn't the character to do much himself, and he knows it. A man who knows he's weak isn't insignificant. Mrs. Trenchard made no reply. "'Well, what are you going to do about it?' at last said Tim. "'Oh, he'll marry Catherine, of course. And then?' "'And then they'll live here. Dear Canon, I wonder whether—' "'And then? And then why? Then it will be just as it is now.' "'Oh, I see.' Timothy turned his back upon her, staring down upon all the green that came up like a river to the walls of the house. His eyes were grave, his back square, his hands locked tight. He heard the scratching of his sister's pen, otherwise there was deep silence about them. He wheeled round. "'Harriet, look here. I've never—no, I think never—asked you a favour. She turned in her chair and faced him, looking up to him with her wide, rather sleepy, kindly eyes, now a little humorous, even a little cynical. "'No, Tim, never,' she said. "'Well, I'm going to ask you one now.' "'Yes?' Her eyes never flickered nor stirred from his. "'It's this. I like the young man. Like him, for God knows what reason. I think I might myself once have seen the world as he does. I know I believe that it could be such a splendid world with such a little effort— if only every one were nice to every one. I understand, young Philip. I believe that there is a crisis in his life and in Catherine's. There are three possible endings to the engagement. He can marry her, carry her off, and live his own life. He can marry her, not carry her off, and live your life. The engagement can break down, and he disappear back to where he came from. You love Catherine. You are determined not to lose her. Therefore you intend to make the first impossible." You see that Catherine is so deeply attached to him that it will break her heart if he goes. Never the last is not to be. There remains only the second. To that you devote all your energies. You are quite selfish about it. You see only yourself and Catherine in the matter. You see that he is weak and afraid of you. You will break him in, then turn him into the paddock here to graze for the rest of his life. It would serve you right if Catherine were to run away with him. She won't do that said Mrs. Trenchard quietly. "'Who knows? I wish she would, but she's faithful, faithful, faithful down to the soles of her shoes. Bless her!' Mrs. Trenchard smiled. "'Dear Tim, you are fond of her, I know. There's the luncheon bell. Wait a minute,' he stood over her now. "'Just listen. I believe you're wrong about Catherine Harriet. She's old-fashioned and slow compared with the modern girl. We're an old-fashioned family altogether, I suppose.' the first time she's been in love in her life, and as I said just now, she's faithful as death. But she'll be faithful to him as well as to you. Let him have his fling. 
Let him marry her and carry her off. Go where he likes. Develop himself. Be a man she can be proud of. It's the crisis of his life, and of hers too. Perhaps of yours. You won't lose her by letting her go off with him. She'll stick to you all the more firmly if she knows that you've trusted him. But to keep him here, to break his spirit, to govern him through his fear of losing her. I tell you, Harriet, he'll regret it all your life. He'll either run away and break Katie's heart, or he'll stay and turn it into a characterless, spiritless young country bumpkin, like thousands of other young fellows in this county. It isn't even as though he had the money to be a first-class squire. Just enough to grow fat. Well, he's rather fat now. And rotten on. Worse than dear George, who at least has his books. And he isn't a stupid fool, neither. He'll always know he might have been something decent. If I thought I had any influence over him, I'd tell him to kidnap Katie tomorrow, carry her up north, and keep her there. Mrs. Trenchard had listened to him with great attention. Her eyes had never left his face, nor had her body moved. She rose now, very slowly from her chair, gathered her notes together carefully, walked to the door, turned to him, saying, "'How you do despise us all, Tim!' then left the room. After luncheon they started off. Philip, sitting next to Catherine in the wagonette, was very silent during the drive. He was silent because he was determined that it was on this afternoon that he would tell Catherine about Anna. Without turning directly round to her, he could see her profile, her dark hair a little loose and untidy, her cheek flushed with pleasure, her eyes smiling. No, she's not pretty, he thought, but she's better than that. I can't see what she's like. It's as though she were something so close to me and so precious that I could never see it, only feel that it was there. And yet, although I feel that she's unattainable too, she's something I can never hold completely, because I shall always be a little frightened of her. He made this discovery that he was frightened quite suddenly, sitting there on that lovely afternoon. He saw the shadows from the clouds swooping like black birds down over the valley beneath him. Far beyond him he saw a thread of yellow running beside the water of the stream that was now blue in the sunshine and now dark under the hill. There were hosts of primroses down there, and the hedges that now closed the carriage were sheeted with gold. When the hedges broke, the meadows beyond them flowed through the mist like green clouds to the hazy sea. The world throbbed with a rhythm that he could hear quite clearly behind the clap-clap of the horse's hoofs. Hum, 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 hum. The air was warm, with a little breath of cold in it. The dark soil of the ditches glistened, as though very lately it had been frozen. Riding there through this beautiful day, he was frightened. He was aware that he did not know what Catherine would do when he told her. During his years in Russia he had grown accustomed to a world, inevitably, recklessly, voluble. Russians spoke on any and every occasion exactly what was in their mind. They thought nothing of consequences, whether to themselves or any other. Their interest in the ideas that they were pursuing, the character that they were discussing, the situation that they were unravelling, was always so intense, so eager, so vital, that they would talk for days or weeks, if necessary, and lose all sense of time, private feelings, restraint, and even veracity. Philip had become used to this. Had Catherine been a member of a Russian family, he would— two days after his engagement, have had everything out with them all. He would have known exactly where he stood. With the Trenchards, he did not know anything at all. From the moment of his engagement he had been blindfolded, and now he felt as though in a monstrous game of blind man's buff he was pushed against, knocked on the elbows, laughed at, bumped against furniture, always in black, grim darkness. Since he had come down to Garth, he had lost even Catherine— he felt that she was disappointed in some way, that she had never been quite happy since their journey together in the train. Well, he would put everything straight this afternoon. He would tell her about Moscow, Anna, all his life, tell her that he could not, after their marriage, live at Garth, that it would stifle him, make him worthless and useless, that she must show him that she definitely cared for him more than for her family. He felt as though, with a great sweeping stroke of his arm, all the cobwebs would be brushed away, and he would be free. He rehearsed to himself some of the things that he would say. "'You must see, dear, that the family doesn't like me. They're jealous of me. Much better that we go away for a year or two, right away, 
and allow them to get used to the idea. Then we can come back. But what would she say about Anna? Did she know anything about men, their lives and affairs? Would her fine picture of him be dimmed? He hoped a little that it would. He wanted simply to love her, that she should understand him, and that he should understand her. And then they two together, the world, Garth, the trenchards, blown to the wind, should— "'That's Treadon Cove, that dip beyond the wood,' said Catherine. "'We used to go there.' Yes, he was frightened. He felt as though this afternoon would be the crisis of his life. There had been already a great many crises in his life. He was impatient. He wanted to begin now, in the wagonette. He could imagine suddenly turning to her, saying, "'Katie, darling, I wanted to tell you.' He was conscious that Lady Seddon was watching him. "'Jolly day, isn't it?' he said. He thought to himself, "'She hates me as the others do.' They had come to the crossroads. Jacob put on the drag, and they began very slowly to creep down a precipitous hill. The fantastic element in the affair that Philip had been expecting, as a kind of reply to his own sense of his personal adventure, seemed to begin with this hill. It resembled no ordinary hill. It plunged down with a sudden curve that seemed to defy the wheels of any carriage. On their right the bank broke sheer away far down to one of the Raphael Four Valleys, vivid green now with tufted trees. There was no fence nor wall, and one slip of the wheels would have hurled the carriage over. At a turn of the road, a cluster of white cottages, forming one figure together, as though they had been a great stone flung from the hilltop by some giant, showed in the valley's cup. At his sense of that remoteness, of that lifting wildness of the rising hills, at the beauty of the green and grey and silver and white, he could not restrain a cry. Catherine laughed. "'That's Blotch End,' she said. "'One turn, and we're at the bottom.' The carriage wheeled round, crossed a brown bridge, and had started down the road to Raphael. On one side of the road was a stream that, hurrying down from the valley, hastened past them to the sea. On the other side of them a wooded hill with trees like sentinels against the sky. Then the village street began, ugly at first, as are the streets of so many Glebeshire villages, the straight uniform houses with their grey slate roofs, now and then hideous coloured glass over the doorways, and, ugliest of all, the Methodist chapel with 1870 in white stone over the door. But even with such a street as this, Raphael could be something. The valley stream, hidden sometimes by houses, revealed itself suddenly in chuckling, leaping vistas. Before the houses there were little gardens, thick now with daffodils and primroses and hyacinths. Through the deep mouth of the forge fires flamed, and a sudden curve of the street brought a bridge, a view of the harbour, and a vision of little houses rising tier on tier against the rock, as though desperately they were climbing to avoid some flood. This contrast of the wild place itself, with the ugly patches of civilization that had presented themselves first, was like the voice of the place chuckling at its visitors' surprise. First the row of villas, the tailor's shop with a patterned picture in the window, the sweet shop, the armmongers, now this sudden huddle of twisted buildings wildly climbing to the very sky, a high rugged peak guarding the little bay, two streams tossing themselves madly over the harbour ridges, the boats of the fleet rocking as though dancing to some mysterious measure, a flurry of gulls, grey and white, flashing, wheeling like waves and foam against the sky, the screaming of the birds, the distant thud of the sea. This was Raphael. They left the carriage and turned to go back to the schools, where the tea had already begun. Catherine slipped her arm into Philip's. He knew that she was waiting for him to speak about the place, and he knew too that she was not expecting his praise as confidently as she would have expected it three weeks ago. A little of her great trust in him was shadowed by her surprise that he had not surrendered to Glebeshire more completely. Now he could tell her that it was to the Trenchards and not to Glebeshire that he had refused to surrender. She could not tell, of course, that all his attention now was fixed on his determination to tell her everything as soon as he was alone. Walking with him up the road was that secret figure who attends us all, the fine, cherished personality whom we know ourselves to be. To Philip, more than many others, was the preservation of that secret personality essential. He was, this afternoon, 
determined to live up to the full height of it. In the schools, at two long tables, the whole village was feeding. The room was steaming with heat. Huge urns at the ends of the tables were pouring out tea with a fierce, scornful indifference, as though they would show them what they could do but despise their company. The fishermen, farmers, their wives and families, shining with soap, perspiration and excitement, sat, packed so tightly together that eating seemed an impossibility. There were plates of bread and butter, saffron buns, seed cake piled up and running over. There were the ladies of the village who said, "'Now, Mr. Trefusis, do try another,' or, "'Mary's rather tired, I think, Mrs. Maxwell. Shall I lift her down?' or, "'Well, Mr. Pasco, out and about again, I see,' or, "'How's the new cottage, Henry? Better than the old one, I expect.' From the other side of the world came, "'Well, thank you, ma'am. Not so bad, thank ye. Up to Lawson's farm they had it proper wild, so they tell me.' "'Yes, true enough. All over spots her arms was, poor worm.' "'Didn't worry me, thank ye, business. Morning or evening all the same to we.' "'Ah, yeah, poor Mr. Isards. He did suffer terrible, poor dear.' Philip perceived, with a sense of irritated isolation, how instantly and how easily the other members of his party were swallowed up by the ceremony. He himself was introduced to a prim young woman in a blue hat, who flung remarks to him over a tea-tray, and seemed to regard his well-cut clothes with contempt. The fishermen did not look happy in their stiff Sunday clothes, but he liked their faces. They reminded him more of Russian peasants than any people whom he had seen since his landing in England. No, he must not think about that. Russia was banished for ever. Uncle Timothy, Milly, even Lady Seddon were warmly welcomed, but Catherine was adored. He understood perhaps for the first time what that place must mean to her. They called her Miss Cathy. They shouted to her across the room. They cracked jokes with her. An old man with a long white beard like a prophet stood up and put his hand on her shoulder as he talked to her. Once she broke away from them and came to him. "'Philip, I want you to come and be introduced to a great friend of mine,' she said. He followed her, feeling that all eyes watched him with criticism and even with hostility. A large, immensely broad man in a navy blue suit, with a red, laughing face, hair cut very close to his head, and eyes of the honestest, stood up as they came across. He looked at Catherine with the devotion and confidence of a faithful dog. "'This is Mr. Richard Curtis,' Catherine said. He used to pick up shells for me when I was three. He has a boat here with his brother. He's always in good spirits, aren't you, Dick, even when you scald your arm with boiling water? This was an allusion to some confidence between them, and as our eyes met, Philip felt a pang of ridiculous jealousy. The man's face was flaming, and his eyes were more devoted than ever. He held out a large, horny hand to Philip. "'Excuse me, sir,' he said. "'I'm proud to shake hands with a man what Miss Catherine is going to marry.' We thought once on a time, perhaps as she'd always be here, along with we, but what we want most is for her to be happy, and that we knows now she will be. I hope you'll be often down, along, sir, in time to come, that is, sir, if you're not going to take her right away from us. Why, of course not, Dick, said Catherine. When we're married, we're going to live quite close. You've only got to find us a house. Philip knew that he should say something pleasant. He could think of nothing. He muttered a few words, and then turned away, confused, irritated, embarrassed. What had happened to him? He was always so pleasant with everyone, especially with strangers. Now, at every turn, he seemed compelled by someone stronger than he to show his worst side. Oh, "'If I can only get Catherine out of all this,' he thought passionately, "'even for a little time, then I'll come back another man. To have her to myself. Everything's coming between us. Everything's coming between us.' At last he had his desire. They had left the others. She led him out past the row of white cottages to a rock on the side of the hill, high over the sea, with the harbour below them. The village curved like a moon in the hill's hollow behind the harbour, and a little cluster of trees at the hilltops striking the blue night sky. Opposite them was the peak rock, black and jagged, lying out into the water like a dragon couchant. They could see the platter above the peak where the bonfire was to be. They could see the fish market, silver-grey in the evening light, and the harbour like a green square handkerchief with the boats painted upon it. The houses, like an amphitheatre of spectators, 
watched and waited, the lights turning from pale yellow to flame as the evening colours faded. Crying, singing, laughing voices came up to their rock, but they were utterly, finally remote. She leaned her head against his shoulder, and they sat there in silence. At last, half dreamily, gazing forward into the sea that, stirred by no wind, heaved ever and again, with some sigh, some tremor born of its own happiness, she talked. "'You can see the bonfire and the figures moving around it. Soon the moon will be right above the peak. Isn't everything quiet? I never knew last year how different this one would be from any that I had ever known before.' She turned half towards him, caught his hand, and held it. "'Phil, you must be very patient with me. I felt so much that you were part of me that I have expected you to see things always as I do. Of course, that was ridiculous of me. You can't love this place quite as I do. It must take time. You aren't angry with me, are you?' <laughs> "'Angry?' he laughed. "'Because the closer I get to you, the longer we're engaged—' the less, in some ways, I seem to know you. I never realised until you came how shut up as a family we've been, how wrapped up in ourselves. That must be hard for you to understand. There it goes, he broke in suddenly. The bonfire leapt into fire. Instantly the village glowed with flame, a golden pool burnt beneath the peak. The houses that had been blue-grey in the dust now reflected a rosy glow, and whirling, dancing sparks flew up to join the stars. Little black figures were dancing round the blaze. Down on the fish market, other figures were moving, and the faint echo of a fiddle and a horn was carried across the water. Something said to Philip, "'Tell her, now!' He plunged with the same tightening of the heart that he would have known had he sprung from their rock into the pools of the sea below them. He put his arm more tightly around her, and there was a desperate clutch in the pressure of his fingers, as though he were afraid lest she should vanish and he be left with sky, land and sea flaming and leaping beneath the fire's blaze. "'Katie, I have something I must tell you,' he said. He felt her body move under his arm, but she only said very quietly, "'Yes, Phil?' Then in the little fragment of silence that followed she said, very cosily and securely, "'So long as it isn't to tell me that you don't love me any more,' I don't mind what it is. No, it isn't that. It's something I should have told you, I suppose, long ago. I would have told you, and it was all so over and done with for me that I couldn't imagine it's mattering to anyone. I told your father that there was no complication in my life, and that's true. There is none. There's nothing I have, nor think, nor do, that isn't yours. She said very quietly, You were in love with someone before you knew me? He was surprised and immensely reassured by the quietness and tranquillity of her voice. "'That's it, that's it,' he said eagerly, his heart bounding with relief and happiness. "'Look here, Katie, I must tell you everything, everything, so there can't be anything between us any more that you don't know. You see, when I went to Russia first, I was very young, very young for my age, too. Russia isn't much of a place when you don't know the language and the weather's bad, and I'd gone expecting too much.' I had heard so much about Russia's hospitality and kindness, but I was with English people at first, and most of them were tired to death of Russia, and only saw its worst side and didn't paint it very cheerfully. Then the Russians I did meet had to struggle along in bad French or English. It's all rot about Russians being great linguists. And if a Russian isn't spontaneous, he isn't anything at all. Then when I did go to their houses, their meals simply killed me. They make one eat such a lot, and drink such a lot, and sit up all night. I simply couldn't stand it. So at first I was awfully lonely and unhappy. Awfully unhappy. She sighed in sympathy and pressed closer to him. I'm not the sort of man, Philip went on, to stand being lonely. It's bad for me. Some men like it. It simply kills me. But after about six months or more I knew a little Russian, and I got to know one or two Russians individually. There's one thing I can tell you, that until you know a Russian personally, so that he feels that he's got some kind of personal part in you, you simply don't know him at all. It's so easy to generalise about Russians. Wait until you've made a friend. I've made a friend, several friends. I began to be happier. Catherine pressed his hand. 
The bonfire was towering steadily now in a great golden pillar of smoke and flame to heaven. The music of the fiddle and the horn, as though they were its voice, trembled dimly in the air. All the stars were shining, and a full moon, brittle like glass, flung a broad silver road of light across the black peak and the sea. There was no breeze, but the scent of the flowers from the gardens on the rocks mingled with the strong briny odour of the sea pinks that covered the ground at their feet. The spring came all in a moment like a new scene at the play. I was introduced to some theatre people who had a house in the country near Moscow. You've no idea of the slackness and ease of a Russian country house. People just come and go. The doors are all open, meals are always going on. There's always a samovar, and sweets in little glass dishes, and cold fish and meat and little hot pies. In the evening there was dancing, and afterwards the men would just sleep about anywhere. I met a girl there, the first Russian woman who had attracted me. Her name was Anna Mihalovna, and she was a dancer in the Moscow Ballet. He paused, but Catherine said nothing, nor did she move. She attracted me because she had never known an Englishman before, and I was exactly what she had always thought an Englishman would be. That pleased me then. I wanted, I even felt it my duty, to be the typical Englishman. It wasn't that she admired the typical Englishman altogether. She laughed at me a great deal. She laughed at my having everything so cut and dried, at my dogmatising so easily, at my disliking Russian unpunctuality and lack of method. She thought me rather ridiculous, I fancy, but she felt motherly to me, and that what most Russian women feel to most men. I was just beginning to love Russia then. I was beginning to dream of its wonderful secrets, secrets that no one ever discovers, secrets the pursuit of which make life one long, restless search. Anna fascinated me. She let me do always as I pleased. She seemed to me freedom itself. I fell madly in love with her. Catherine's hand gave then a sudden leap in his. He felt the ends of her fingers pressing against his palm. Some of his confidence had left him, some of his confidence not only in himself, but in his assurance of the remoteness of his story and the actors in it. He felt as though some hand were dragging him back into scenes that he had abandoned, situations that had been dead. The fire and the sea were veiled, and his eyes, against their will, were fastened upon other visions. That year was a very wonderful one for me. We took a flat together, and life seemed to be realised quite completely for me. This, I thought, was what I had always desired, and I grew slack and fat and lazy. Outside my business, I always worked at that decently. Early in the next year we had a boy. Anna took him with the same happy indifference that she had taken me. She loved him, I know, but she was outside us all, speculating about impossibilities then suddenly coming to earth and startling one with her reality. I loved her, and I loved Moscow, although sometimes, too, I hated it. But we used also to have the most awful quarrels. I was angry with her, I remember, because I thought that she would never take me seriously, and she would laugh at me for wanting her to. I felt that Russia was doing me no good. Our boy died, quite suddenly, of pneumonia, and then I begged her to marry me, and come and live in England. How she laughed at the idea. She didn't want to be married to anyone, but she thought that perhaps England would be better for me. She did not seem to mind at all if I went. That piqued me, and I stayed on, trying to make myself essential to her. I did not care for her then so much as for my idea of myself, that she would break her heart if I went. But she knew that. How oh, she would laugh as she looked at me. She refused to take me seriously. Russia was doing me harm. I got slack, sleepy, indifferent. I longed for England. The chance came. Anna said that she was glad for me to go, and laughed as she said it. I took my chance. I've told you everything, he suddenly ended. He waited. The tune across the water went, la-la-la, la-la-la-la-la-la. Many, many little black figures were turning on the fish market, the blaze of the bonfire was low, and its reflection in the sea smoking red. When he had finished, Catherine had very gently drawn her hand away from his, then, suddenly, with a little fierce gesture, pushed it back again. "'What was your boy's name?' she asked, very quietly. "'Paul.' "'Poor little boy. Did you care for him very much?' "'Yes, 
terribly. It must have been dreadful, his dying. He felt then a sudden dismay and fear. Perhaps after all she was going to dismiss him. He fancied that she was retreating from him. He felt already that she was farther away from him than she had ever been. And with a desperate urgency, his voice trembling, his hand pressing her arm, he said, "'Katie, Katie, you're disgusted with me. I, I can feel it. But you must go on loving me. You must. You, you must. I don't care for anything but that. All men have had affairs with women. It's all dead with me, as though it had been another man. There's no one in the world but you. I—I—' I, His hand shook. His eyes, if she could have seen them, were strained with terror. She turned to him, put her arms round his neck, drew his head towards hers, kissed him on his eyes, his mouth, his cheeks. "'Phil, Phil,' she whispered, "'how little you understand. My dear, my dear.' Then, raising her eyes away from him, and staring again in front of her, she said, "'But I want to know, Phil. I must know. What would she like?' "'Like?' he repeated, puzzled. "'Yes, her appearance, her clothes, her hair, everything. I want to be able to see her, with my own eyes, as though she were here.' He stared at her for a moment. Then, very slowly, almost reluctantly, he began his description. End of Book Two, Chapter Five